Uh, let's go on the record then and file 22-5165-FH. Uh, we're back. It's uh, September 13th. Uh, I believe all we have are to begin closing arguments. Uh, I assume the parties were able to stay and work out all of the exhibit issues and we're ready to go on all of that. All right. Okay. Uh, anything that we need to talk about before bringing uh, the jury in and beginning closing arguments? No, sir. Mr. Sire? No, thank you. Mr. Barnett? Okay. All right. I'm going to take a break between the prosecutor and I. Uh, I uh, what I would say to that is it would depend on the length of each closing argument, but I would assume so. It's a two minute break. I just need to unpack a couple of things. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. We certainly can. I don't know where it's set. I'll figure it out. Everyone can be seated. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all had a nice evening. Uh, if you'll recall, we're at the stage uh, in the case where we will uh, begin with closing arguments. Uh, and if you'll recall, uh, before opening statements, I indicated to you that uh, the arguments of the attorneys are not evidence, uh, and the same is true of closing arguments. Uh, the purpose uh, of a closing argument is obviously to afford each side an opportunity to summarize what their theory of the case is and present that to you. Um, in a moment, we'll uh, call upon Mr. Ralston. Uh, the people bear the burden, as you've heard us say in the case, so they go first. Uh, at that point, or after that, uh, each defense attorney will obviously get an opportunity, and then Mr. Ralston will have a second opportunity. I think I explained this a little bit yesterday. Uh, it's what we call rebuttal, uh, so he'll have an opportunity to respond to the closing arguments from the defense attorney, uh, and then we'll turn it over to you all uh, after instructions for deliberations. Okay, so that's generally how we're going to proceed. Um, we'll keep the same kind of timetable that we've been using in terms of breaks, so if we need to take a break in between the closing arguments, we'll do that, uh, and then we'll just kind of play it by ear and see how it goes from there. Okay, Mr. Ross. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, your sacrifice continues, and it's been extraordinary, no doubt about it. Uh, you know, uh, as I talked about a little bit in Gordier and during the opening, you know, the idea that uh, you just land here isn't lost on us. And, you know, on behalf of the entire prosecution team, we're deeply grateful, you know. Um, I talked about a little bit, uh, I think, an opening about, uh, and also in Gordier, the idea that whatever your decision would be, that I think you'd walk away from this, you know, with a couple different feelings. One, you know, satisfied, you know, you took part in the process. And number two, a little bit, you know, enrichment in terms of uh, understanding what we got here in our country and how good it really is, okay? So, uh, you know, let's get into it. Um, you know, as I talked about in the beginning, uh, terrorist attacks don't just happen. I mean, the, the, you just think about the idea of an attack. I mean, obviously an attack has to have some planning behind it, okay? It just doesn't happen by mistake. It's not a random event. And, you know, after the events that are terroristic in nature, you know, there's always the question of, you know, gosh, what happened? You know, how did this happen? You know, and they go back and you, they see the bits and pieces and the, the signs that, you know, were there uh, that were missed. And uh, yeah, that's kind of what we've done the last uh, three weeks here, 15 days in trial, is 
hey, you know, what is it that led up to this? And, you know, what did each defendant have you know, in terms of uh, their involvement in it? And, you know, in Michigan, you know, we have laws that you know, make this a criminal act, as it should be. You know, if you're going to help somebody knowing that they plan a terrorist attack, you know, that's wrong. I mean, that's a wrong, you know, it's a criminal conduct. And that's something that, you know, when you think about it, makes sense. One of the things I'd ask you to do is keep in mind that no one here is charged with committing a terrorist attack or, you know, uh, communicating a threat of terrorism or that kind of thing. And it's easy, it can be easy to find those things kind of blended together. That's not what they're charged with. You know, these three defendants are charged with uh, helping a terrorist and while doing so, possessing a uh, firearm, okay? So let's go, go through the rules of the road a little bit and talk about uh, what Judge uh, Hamlin's gonna instruct you on. And it's the presumption of innocence and it maintains itself right now. Defendants are still presumed innocent. If you think about that, that really makes sense. I mean, you know, you wouldn't wanna make an important decision in life until you had all the information that's available. Okay, and we've strived, uh, you know, you have taken in a lot of information, okay? And we've strived to get it down to a concise package to not waste your time, but to still educate you fully on, you know, the nature of the case, okay? So that presumption of innocence maintains itself until 12 of you will go back to the jury room for judgment day, okay? And, you know, that makes sense. I mean, when you think about it, because now you've got all the information, you've got the law, which is kind of like your playbook, if you think about it, kind of your instruction manual. And then, you know, you take the facts that you heard that came from the witness stand and any exhibits. And you, then you get to the point where, you know, now you can make a decision, okay? And uh, the burden of proof, it's on the prosecution. That's fair. I mean, you make an allegation, you point the accusatory finger at somebody, you gotta be willing to back up what you say. Uh, now, we kind of get down to like, what has to be proven, you know, and it's the elements of the two crimes charged. And because that's what the allegation is, nothing more, nothing less, okay? So the elements, and we talked about this a lot in both for Deer and also in opening, it's the elements of the two crimes charged that have to be proven. Again, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, and motive, you know, motive is uh, not an element, but it's certainly something that you can consider. And in almost every crime, motive can, is very insightful in terms of you know, when you begin to understand the why something happened, now you can begin to understand the intent of the individuals. So, uh, you know, and, you know, and talking about reasonable doubt again for a minute here, it's proof beyond a reasonable doubt, nothing more, nothing less. We all agreed that you pulled us to that standard, you wouldn't let it be, whittle it down any, and you wouldn't let anybody inflate it, okay? Because you're inflating it would be unfair to victims of crime, okay? So, uh, talking a little bit more, Evidence comes from the witnesses and any exhibits submitted during trial. And I have an important point to make here. It's been suggested through cross-examination that some of the witnesses, uh, of some of the witnesses, that if the recording devices uh, didn't pick up, if the microphones didn't pick up what the witnesses testified to, then the event didn't happen. And what this suggests, this, it's wrong for two reasons to make that suggestion. It's number one, that's one way of trying to inflate the burden of proof, okay? And number two, it asks you to ignore a really important instruction that Judge Hamlin's going to give to you. And that instruction is that the evidence includes only the sworn testimony of the witnesses, exhibits that are admitted during the course of the trial, and anything else that Judge Hamlin asks you to consider as evidence, okay? So, you know, when, when the, argue, if the argument is made to you that, oh, well, you know, that wasn't picked up on the recording, so it didn't happen, that's wrong. When you see Mark and you see Tim and CHS Dan, uh, you know, testified about events they saw or things they heard, that is evidence in its purest form. I mean, evidence comes from the witness stand through the spoken word. Yeah, we have a lot of recordings. And no, recordings don't pick up everything, okay? So the statements that were made by the defendants that were testified to, I mean, that's evidence for you to consider, okay? Make no mistake about it. Uh, 
And, you know, you saw um, another example of this, an opening statement on behalf of Bill Null, uh, when you were asked to listen for the answer, I don't know. And uh, this is another suggestion that subtly increases the burden of proof. It, it, it attempts to subtly increase the burden of proof that if not, and, and what it suggests is, is that if the witness doesn't understand or doesn't know the answer to every question that an attorney for the defendant might dream up, that in some way that raises reasonable doubt. And that is not the case. I mean, Judge Hamlin is going to instruct you very clearly that, you know, not every fact and circumstance has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. What has to be proven is, you know, are the elements of the crime charge. So uh, Judge Hamlin's gonna to talk to you about uh, direct and circumstantial evidence. And it's just that, you know, direct evidence is evidence that, you know, hey, I saw something happen, I heard a statement made. Circumstantial evidence is just uh, what it sounds like is, you know, if a man or a woman comes in the door, covered in, uh, you know, raindrops on their uh, coat and they're carrying an umbrella, even if there wasn't a window in the, in the room, probably pretty good circumstantial evidence of uh, that it's raining outside. Now, we use this every day in our lives. You know, we see circumstances, we evaluate them, and then we draw conclusions from them, okay? And that's how we manage our lives and move forward. So this is something that we do every day. Um, factors to consider in judging a witness's credibility is his age, maturity, personal interest in the case. And does the testimony agree with other evidence in the case? And Judge Hamlin will tell you that if the evidence does agree with the other evidence in the case, you can find that evidence more believable, okay? Let's kind of get into, you know, the core of the crime here. One of the uh, instructions Judge Hamlin is going to give you as to providing material support for a terroristic act is that, you know, in, is a terroristic act by definition is a violent felony. You know, one like murder or assault with intent to commit murder. In other words, I try to kill you, but I fail. You know, I, I shoot at you, but I miss. You know, or I, you know, do something that would otherwise cause your death. And, uh, you know, this is exactly, you know, the kind of crime that Fox and Croft were talking about. That's what they wanted to do. I mean, they wanted to commit a violent felony. And all the defendants here hated our government. This gets back to motive. And all the defendants here hated police officers. They thought police officers were the enemy and they were willing to go to war with them. Let's go through uh, the elements of the two crimes charged uh, against the defendants. They're a little bit different because Mr. Molitor's actions are a little bit different than the Null brothers. Okay, so let's talk about Mr. Molitor for a minute here. Um, number one, did he provide material support to Adam Fox and Barry Croft? And the judge is going to instruct you that material support means any one of the following. Personnel. And he's going to tell you that personnel means if you provide yourself, that is also a form of personnel. Uh, surveillance, if you, conduct, if you provide yourself and you help and conduct surveillance, that's a form of material support. Uh, physical assets, things like the RF detector that uh, Mr. Molitor provided fits squarely within that. Expert services or expert assistance, uh, things like his medical assistance, you know, and, uh, you know, things that he brought to the table in terms of being a medic for the group. And finally, intangible property. An example of that intangible property is like a video. And the video that he took on Timberlake Drive on August 29th when they're driving down the uh, past the governor's uh, house there. Now, you know, if you give somebody a hundred bucks, and you don't say anything and you don't know what their plan is, you haven't committed a crime. But if the person says, hey, you know what, I'm gonna go out and commit a terrorist gag, I could really use your help, and you give them $100, now you know what they intend to do with it. Okay, so really it's two things here that have to be proven. It's one, that you provided material support, and when you did so, you knew uh, that Fox or Croft would use it in whole or even in part, okay? Uh, for an act of terrorism. And the blank there that you see, uh, fill it in with any one of these five possibilities. And they're all ors, okay? It's not ands. So, in, you know, one of the things I draw your attention to is words have meaning. Words have meaning and words are important. 
And this is the law of the state of Michigan, okay? And uh, when you think about when Mr. Molitor uh, did what he did for Adam Fox, you know, was, was, he, was it used by Fox in whole or even in part to plan, to prepare, I'm gonna skip carry out for a minute here, to facilitate his plan of attack against the governor on Birch Lake, um, or to even avoid apprehension, okay? I mean, that daytime surveillance when they're out there and they're driving around, you know, I mean, Eric Molitor was helping out for sure. And you think about the words that you see there um, in the second element, think about how broad they are, you know, and their, uh, their, their, their words matter. And it's not necessary that Eric Molitor or the Null brothers came to Adam Fox and Barry Croft with this completed plan. It's not necessary that they handle even a good plan, okay? <laughs> Uh, the idea is, is that if you help, again, just in whole or even in part, the individual, when you provide that material support, you've satisfied that element, okay? So it's a very, when you think about those words, I mean, you know, that that helped Adam Fox to plan and prepare when Eric Molitor rode along for the uh, daytime surveillance and made suggestions and refinements to Adam Fox's plan. Was he helping him to plan? Was he helping him to prepare? And uh, the answer to that question is absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about the Null brothers. You know, they differ from Mr. Molitor a little bit, and uh, actually quite significantly. Uh, they provided assistance in a more meaningful way. And simply put, I mean, they were a two-man wrecking ball team, okay? They differed from Mr. Molitor in that, you know, they were the muscle. Okay, I mean, these were the guys that were going to be the operators. These are the guys that were going to be on the business end of a rifle during the attack. You know, Molitor was, uh, in, you know, he was more the medic. He was more the, I want to go along and be along. And, you know, maybe I'm not going to be the guy who's actually on the business end of a gun. But he was definitely in on the plan. Now, the Nulls, they were going to be the operators. You know, they were going to be the guys that, you know, Henrik Impel had told us during his testimony, these are the kind of guys that keep me up at night, okay? I mean, these are the real deal. I mean, they were going to be the guys who were going to go with Fox and Croft, and they were going to assault the governor's cabin on Birch Lake. I mean, just simply put, they were going to bring terrorism here to Antrim County. Okay? They had no problem with that. I mean, you know, they're dangerous men. Make no mistake about it. And, uh, the, and the thing that I think is probably worthwhile for you to consider, you know, when you think about the first element here, is uh, did they provide material support to Adam Fox or Barry Croft? And the, the two things they did was, one, uh, material support uh, in the form of providing themselves as personnel, as a muscle, and also in providing themselves in, during surveillance, okay? Um, the, um, you know, the value that they brought to Adam Fox and Barry Croft was significant, okay? I mean, when you think about it from Fox's perspective, okay, I mean, he's looking at the Null brothers there in Cambria, and he's looking at, I mean, he's looking at Bill Null down in Dublin, and then he's looking at Bill Null and Mike Null in Luther, and he's seeing a couple operators, and he's that's high value to Adam Fox. Okay, when you think about what Null, the Null brothers did and who they are and how they're armed and how they're kitted up, if you're Adam Fox and you want to bring the attack to the governor's cabin on Birch Lake, guys like Bill Null. And Mike Null have high value to you, okay? If you're Adam Fox or you're Barry Croft, okay? So, again, when you think about the second uh, element, and there's only two elements to the crime, okay? I mean, for material support, we only have to prove two things beyond a reasonable doubt. And we hope that we've made this decision a little easier for you. And I think, and I'll talk about it a little bit more later, when you think about Eric Mahler's testimony and you think about 
uh, Bill Knoll's testimony. What's interesting about the trial process is, you know, you start off on day one, nobody can agree about the time of day. Yet we get to this stage and actually what happened is pretty clear. And all that has to be done at this point really is to ask yourselves, what does it mean? Okay. So, you know, when uh, they're out there uh, on, when they're training in Cambria, when they're out there, uh, when they're in training in Luther, when they're uh, on nighttime surveillance, you know, yeah, the uh, Null brothers both provided um, themselves as uh, personnel, and they also conducted surveillance, satisfying the first element. You know, and uh, again, I'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, the idea that um, they were just along for the ride and they didn't know what they were doing smacks in the face of common sense. We don't do a lot by mistake in life. Uh, we certainly don't take multi-hour car rides not knowing what we're going to do. The idea that was offered to you that I didn't know what we were doing, and I'll talk a little bit more about Mr. Null's testimony in a little bit, but at the idea, at the end of the day, rather, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't comport with our life experiences. You should reject that notion. He and his brother Mike knew exactly what they were doing that night. So uh, does this help Fox during that nighttime surveillance to plan his attack? Of course it does. Does it help him to prepare? And again, I ask you to think about how broad these words are and their meaning. Uh, the Knoll brothers were absolutely going to be operators. Uh, they were going to help to carry out the attack. Certainly what they did uh, during the nighttime surveillance facilitated Mr. Uh, Fox's and Mr. Croft's attack plan. And yeah, um, by being there on surveillance that night, they were absolutely helping uh, Mr. Fox and Mr. Croft avoid uh, uh, you know, apprehension or detection. Felony firearm, it has two elements too. It's very simple. The defendants possessed a firearm and at the time that they committed the felony and providing material support. Um, uh, that's pretty plain. Uh, you know, the Null brothers were almost certainly armed during nighttime surveillance. Uh, they're not the kind of men they're going to go on that kind of a uh, mission uh, and leave their guns behind while helping Fox and Croft conduct surveillance. Uh, they were using firearms at Luther, where they trained with Fox and Croft with uh, firearms, and that further supported Fox and Croft's plan for terrorism. Okay. We, uh, we walked you through the why during the course of the trial. And we talked about the core identity of the defendants. And uh, it took a little bit of time, but I think that was uh, worthwhile in the sense that it provides you insight with who they are and which gives you insight as to their motives. Uh, it was pretty clear the protests weren't working. And uh, you, know, you saw a lot of evidence about their pivot. And their pivot was, uh, we're gonna move from you know, doing rallies and protests to no, we're gonna go operational and we're going to go operational here in Antrim County is what the final plan was. Um, we kind of, you know, we saw that, uh, you know, the uh, United for a Common Cause, and, uh, you know, they used rallies and protests to recruit and to also uh, meet other people, like-minded boo-boo boys. Um, you saw how the defendants used their skills and training, and they created a team. And finally, uh, the evidence showed you how the defendants mobilized with uh, Adam Fox and Barry Croft for an attack here in Antrim County, okay? Let's talk a little bit about Croft and Fox. Go me too. Y'all ain't doing nothing about that, bro. Fuck that shit, man. I don't give a fuck if you tear this whole motherfucking nation down. It's a bunch of cowards anyway. And even though we a real bit, that's the fucking need. I can't wait for the war to come this way. Get me so motherfuckers and leave it right there. We can get this thing right amongst that which is left. The Lord, the survivors, the real Americans. That's what's going to press on anyway. You saw a motherfucking coward sinking your motherfucking face in the sand. You ain't going to live. I shouldn't even live and guard your opinions. You just a dead body waiting to happen. You know what I mean? So let me ask what everyone's going to do, because they took away our livelihoods, they took away our day-to-day -day lives, while they sacrificed nothing, they were along as usual, because, you know, we live beneath them at all. Who's ready to go take some politicians and put them on trial? You know, um, 
like I said, it took a little time during the trial, but you know, the ideology of the two uh, gentlemen there uh, is hopefully insightful for you in terms of understanding the motives of these three men. And, you know, um, I, Barry Croft fired up Adam Fox and Adam Fox took it from there. And he didn't need much to get going. You know, the, you know understanding the genesis helps us understand the overall crime. And, um, you know, that was, all, that was all Fox needed. I mean, Fox was, you know, a terrorist, you know, he was a terrorist act waiting to happen. And this whole time, he's establishing, you know, his, uh, uh, you know, relationship with the Nulls in June of 2020, and also with uh, Eric Molitor. And, you know, the defense is going to have you believe that there's this one singular instance when everybody's read right into the plan, and that's the light bulb moment. But... That's really not how things work in real life. And, you know, what actually, you know, Barry Croft is the spark, if you will, to Adam Fox. And, you know, that flame spread from him to, in Dublin, to Cambria, and then later to Luther, and then finally here, you know, uh, to Antrim County. So let's talk about Eric Molitor a little bit um, and, uh, you know, the evidence that shows his guilt. You know, I go back to, you know, like we talked about in Gordier, you know, the company you keep, okay, shows a little bit about who you are as an individual. And, um, uh, you know, Eric Molitor, uh, here is a picture, and this is Exhibit 189. And, you know, it's not the all end-all, be-all, but, you know, there's Eric Molitor uh, at Luther um, with Barry Croft, all kitted up, ready to go. And, you know, it tells you a little bit about, you know, where he was at at that point in time. And what I mean by where he was at, I'm talking about, you know, what's Eric Molitor doing? What's his intent? You know, is he there by mistake? And I'd suggest, no, he's not. He's there because he's made a choice. I mean, that's what we do in life. We make choices. And these three men behind me all made choices that put them where they are today and actually brought us all together as a group, okay? And the choices were that they were going to try to help a terrorist, you know, Adam Fox and uh, Barry Croft. Um, you know, the, uh, the testimony of Mr. Mahler, I want to touch on this for a minute, to you was kind of similar to Bill Null. And it was, hey, I got in a car, I didn't really know what I was doing, and all of a sudden I was in the middle of something, and I couldn't get out of it. And again, I, I'd suggest two things to you. Number one, that flies in the face of common sense. And also, it, it's evidence of their guilt. You know, when people get up on the witness stand and create lies like that that don't make sense, you as a jury can use that as circumstantial evidence of their guilt. I mean, the reason they're getting up there and they're telling you the story they did is because they're guilty. Okay, uh, think about some basic human psychology for a minute. Um, you know, what we have here is uh, the New Founding Fathers meeting, June 6, 2020, down in Dublin. Okay, and the psychology that I'm talking about is, and you don't have to have a psychology degree to, to appreciate this. I mean, we all know it just through our life experiences. And that is, you know, we are better as a group when we're trying to achieve something than we are as an individual, okay? I mean, it, this has been since the beginning of time, it has been this way. And, you know, the same rule applies to terrorists. They're more powerful as a group because they support each other's uh, belief systems, they, uh, they normalize the idea or the concept of terrorism with each other. And they make it feel like it's a normal, good thing to do. And when you really think about when the rubber really hits the road is during an attack, when they attack as a group, and that was the plan. That was Fox's and Croft's plan. And these men were going to help them right here in Antrim County. They were going to bring the terrorism to Antrim County. I mean, I can't say it any plainer than that. And they were going to act as a group, okay? So, you know, when you think about that, um, uh, the first event that brought the three threat streams together is obviously Barry Cross, New Founding Father meeting down in Dublin. Bill Null attended, uh, and as did Mr. Fox. And this is the first time they're together, and uh, you see him there. And this is, you know, the beginning of the threat streams merging. We talked about it in opening, and I think you saw it during the course of the trial. And it was a, this meeting, you know, uh, Mr. Null tried to dissuade you from believing what the meeting was really about, but it was pretty clear that this meeting, and you think about Henrik Impel's uh, testimony, was about multiple indiv individuals, about 20-plus individuals, coming together at the Drury Inn down in Dublin, Ohio, 
and they were from different states. You know, you heard the, the roll call, and there's, you know, Virginia and Indiana and Illinois and Michigan and Wisconsin. And what they were talking about doing was, let's get a plan together to attack our governors all at the same time so we can kick off a civil war. Okay, I mean, that's what they wanted to do. That was the purpose of the meeting of the new founding fathers. I mean, you heard Barry Croft's uh, ideas about, you know, the Civil War and how to kick it off. You know, he wanted, along with Adam Fox, and it eventually flowed to these gentlemen behind me, you know, uh, uh, they wanted a Civil War. You know, they called it the Boogaloo, okay? And, you know, I, I can't help but come back to the, the old saw, the company one keeps is insightful about a person. And here we are in Dublin, and Bill Knoll was there, and so was Adam Fox. Uh, you know, um, before Dublin even happens, you know, uh, uh, Fox tells Mr. Mahler about it. Well, I don't fucking do anything, man, so consider yourself part of it now. Now we'll just grow our shit. Um, I got a meeting on Saturday out of state with some guys, so once after that meeting, I'll come back to it. We might be doing some real fucking cowboy shit here in the near future. And then uh, from Exhibit 21, you know, you saw uh, Eric Mahler, uh, the exchange between Fox and Mahler. Um, yeah, headed to Ohio. Appreciate you covering me. What he's talking about there is uh, Eric Mahler covered a shift at Pinkerton's at Menards. And big things happening when I get back. Okay. He hasn't even been to Dublin. He hasn't even heard, you know, what uh, Barry Cross' full plan is about attacking multiple state governors at the same time. But he's already telling Eric Mahler big things happening when, he, when I get back. And what he's talking about is he's, he's already planning an attack here in Michigan, okay? And he hasn't even been to Dublin yet. And this is the company Mr. Mahler's keeping. And then what's Mr. Mahler's response? I can't wait. I'm proud to be able to help, man. This is bigger than me. This is honorable, something we have lost as a society. Can't wait to tell my kid. I can't wait till my kids can understand this. I mean, that's Mr. Molitor's perspective, you know, June 6th of 2020, two months before he does the daytime surveillance. And, you know, uh, you know, if you look at Exhibit 6, and Exhibit 6 is the communications chart, or what we call the comms chart between Mr. Molitor and Mr. Uh, Fox, you know, we had about 30 different contacts there that we were able to document through the evidence, okay? And I asked Mr. Molitor the very obvious question, Hey, I mean, did we get them all? You know, is that all you guys communicated? He said, oh, no, not at all. I mean, of course, there's other phone calls. There are things that, you know, we didn't have coverage on, we weren't aware of. No, they were uh, definitely communicating, you know, often. And Mr. Molitor, you know, was very excited about it. Uh, here's a sampling of what uh, Molitor knew in early June of 2020. From Mr. Fox, our starting stuff will be, opera will be operation, in and out. When you think about what the plan was in terms of, you know, attacking and assaulting the governor and her security detail of Michigan State Troopers, uh, you know, on Birch Lake, that's exactly, you know, that fits hand in glove with what he is describing to Mr. Molitor in early June. Um, Fox goes on to say, shit's going to get heavy quick, bro. Get ready. I mean, he's talking about the boogaloo. Uh, Mr. Molitor responds, I will die for them in my country. Even if I'm not prepared, I will fight. Um, one, one week later from what you just saw, Molitor's asking about, uh, you know, more details on the attack plan. You know, uh, I'm trying to get people to join. I mean, why is Mr. Molitor trying to get people to join Fox's efforts if he doesn't know what's going on? If he's, why is Mr. Molitor trying to get other people to join if he's not on board and in agreement with Mr. Fox? I mean, you know, what we do, our actions speak louder than words. You know, Fox's uh, response is, shit, let's stack that bread and bank for the boogaloo. Again, you know, Mr. Fox was plain spoken. It's not hard to figure out. Now, Mr. Molitor is asking a very important question. When? How soon before I need to be ready to fight? And, you know, Fox's words here are, are telling. Hoping. He's hoping within six months. I mean, he wants it to happen, okay? Um, you know, uh, take a look at uh, this video here. I'm going to work you through a couple of them, and then we'll talk more about them. This will not be a social club. This will not be a popularity contest. There will be no participation trophies. You'll be expected to commit criminal acts. There's no need to be afraid of being arrested. There's no need to be afraid of being arrested. There's no need to be afraid of being arrested. There's no need to be afraid of being arrested. Now, that being said, I am only looking for elite people. I want people to have hard people in it. 
you know, Fox, as I said, he wasn't shy about sharing his vision, okay? I mean, think about the first meeting he had with UC Mark um, on July 3rd, 2020 at the Back Shack. And, um, you know, I, I'm not going to show you the picture during my, my closing here, but, you know, take a look at the picture of the um, basement entrance down there and what, you know, Dan and Mark had to go down into to talk to Adam Fox, you know, who's a terrorist. And I want you to think a little bit about the bravery it took for those guys to do that, you know, to go down there with this guy that they didn't really know. And uh, when they get down there, they both have the, the same experience. Uh, you know, you see Mark, you know, he's down there only a matter of minutes, and um, Fox is telling him about his uh, vision to, you know, die a saint covered in blood, and that's, you know, that's an exhibits 86 and 87. I mean, Mr. Fox didn't wait very long before he was telling you about his plan. And, you know, Bill Null gets up here and tries to tell you, no, I didn't know what he was going to do, you know. I didn't know what it was all about. And, you know, here's what I'd offer to you. Remember Mr. Toff, uh, the blueberry farmer from Jackson County, worked at the Mug and Bops down there at the gas station. The guy from Jackson County that's uh, working at Mug, Mug and Bops, he knew what the plan was. He knew that they were going to blow it. That when Joe Morrison and Pete Musico, those are the Wolverine Watchmen, that, you know, the Wolverine Watchmen were the third threat stream that came together with Adam Fox. The blueberry farmer from Jackson County knew about the plan at least to the extent that it was going to be to blow up the bridge and get the governor, okay? And Bill Null gets up here and tells you that I trained. I went to uh, Dublin with Adam Fox. I went to Cambria with Adam Fox. I went to Luther with Adam Fox. And when I got in the car and I didn't, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, no, that doesn't make sense. He lied to you. And here's uh, Eric Mahler's, uh, uh, rather, Here's Cross' vision and him spewing his hatred. The second continental is a continuation of the first continental fall for the country in the first place. You know what I mean? Um, first continental army was assembled to, you know, serve under Washington, and you know it was a conception I came up with a long time ago and studied. And the only natural progression is that a second continental stand up for the republic. So regardless of what any other militia gets called, you know, eventually they're going to end up being called the Second Continental because they're all going to form alliances that make up an army that stands against these fucking red kids, you know what I mean? And I appreciate your dedication, but you will not be let down. Yeah, what Barry Croft's talking about there when he says stand against the red coats, he's talking about anybody who tells him what to do, he's talking about the police, he's talking about any elected official. I mean, here's, uh, um, okay, that's Fox, or, I'm sorry, that's Croft to Fox on June 4th, and then... We're calling ourselves Second Continental for a reason. George Washington's army was the first continent. Same day. We are now the Second Continental. We're going to take back what's ours, bro. We're going to take back what's ours. And, you know, here's Mr. Molitor's response. That is everything that I want to fucking do. Exactly the way I want to fucking do it. I am 110% on board with this idea, man. Okay, so uh, on June 20th, members of the Wolverine Watchmen meet with uh, Adam Fox in the back shack. And you heard, you know, some of the audio from that. And, um, again, Mr. Fox is very plain about what he wants to do. He wants to kill police officers and he wants to take the governor hostage. Okay, so during the meeting, uh, or after the meeting, rather, uh, this is between uh, Fox and Molitor. You know, Fox uh, uh, communicates, you know, we had a little meeting today. Molitor says, a meeting, you say? Yeah, a few guys from the Wolverine Watchmen and my buddy from MHG, that's Michigan Home Guard, another militia. Um, and uh, uh, he says, so what's up, Molitor does. And he says, Fox need, uh, need to talk in person. Uh, it's a tactical nightmare and a suicide mission. Now, what they're talking, what he's talking about here is this is while still while Fox is thinking about attacking the Capitol. Okay, the plan morphs from Fox's original plan of let's attack the Capitol, go in, take the legislature hostages, and trade them for the governor. And eventually he pivots off that idea. And he actually pivots to a much more dangerous plan, which is to attack the governor at her summer cottage here in Antrim County. Now, why would he do that? Because he's got a higher survival rate if he hits up here than if he hits at the Capitol in Lansing. 
I mean, if he hits up here, I mean, you kind of heard the plan, that little town, the little bridge in Elk Rapids. I mean, yeah, he knows that there's a lighter security detail up here, and he also knows there's fewer police officers up here, okay? So his idea is a refinement that actually benefits him and also makes his plan much more dangerous. Uh, Mr. Mahler goes to do encrypted communications with uh, uh, Mr. Fox on uh, June 23rd. Um, you know, that's more OPSEC, it's more evidence of his guilty knowledge. And this is a very telling uh, point of evidence. Uh, if you look at this, this is Exhibit 81. And in mid-July, uh, you know, Barry Croft posts, at this point, militia resources should not be allocated for rallies and flag-waving events, total waste of good training time, 3 percenter. And what he's talking about there, total waste of good training time to attack, okay? And, you know, and here's Mr. Molitor's response. Yeah, agreed. We tried, we tried it peacefully. We tried calling, writing, emailing. When our little protest didn't work, we all met up in Virginia. We all know how that went. No more rallies or protests. If it's time, it's time. And what he's talking about there, if it's time to boogaloo or if it's time to go to a battle, it's time to go. And we didn't make it this way, oh, right, you know, you're the victim. Uh, we were pushed and mocked, done. No, you know, Mr. Molitor's ready to go. Uh, you know, think about, um, you know, why uh, Molitor needs a ballistic helmet for his work at Menards. And uh, <clears throat> uh, And he tells uh, Adam Fox, you know, I'll do the best I can. Set on ammo and guns for now. Need a helmet, though. So goddamn expensive. It's crazy, man. Before I would uh, head out to work a full week to afford a helmet with this one fucking day, give or take a few hours. And, you know, when you look at what he's got there, and, and I know it's hard to see that the exhibit book uh, is a better resource here. But you can see his ballistic helmet, you know, and all his gear here. And... Uh, you know, think about, you know, he's got his rifle, his flex cuffs, uh, level three body armor, gas mask, his medical kit. He's not getting ready to go to Menards. He's not getting ready to go anywhere except to Adam Fox and help him out with his plan. The, um, uh, it begs the question, you know, is that really uh, what he was doing? And, you know, this, the ballistic armor that he ordered, um, one of the exhibits is uh, very clearly uh, indicates for you, you know, he ordered it July 19th, cost him $640. You know, that's a lot of money. You know, that's a lot of money for Eric Molitor to put out. And uh, the reason, you know, again, you know, kind of using your common sense, when you think about what we do in life, you know, we do things for a reason. You know, if we separate money from ourselves, we're, we're spending money and we do it because we see value in something. He saw value in having this kind of equipment. He saw value in spending his own money on it. The reason he does is because he's on board with Adam Fox. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Molitor being invited to recon. Uh, he says he thought he was coming to Bel Air to look for Antifa or Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, uh, people that were going to, you know, be uh, rioting and, and, you know, marauding through the streets of Bel Air and Antrim County. I'd suggest to you that was a ridiculous proposition. You should reject it. He lied to you and he said that. And very clearly the invitation is, hey, you want to go for a ride Saturday and do some recon? Uh, we're doing recon on a high-profile vacation house. Uh, okay, well, we may get pulled to Detroit. What he's talking about there is, you know, if there's, you know, riots in Detroit, we may go down there because it's more fertile ground. Uh, and then he goes on to explain where, you know, it's uh, <clears throat> OPSEC reasons, cash for food, low profile, no trail uh, uh, of our existence there. Uh, you know, what he's talking about there is he's talking about Elk Rapids, you know. Um, had the three locations. Um, if you recall, you know, the testimony is pretty clear. Um, they had a code. And location one was Lansing, the governor's official residence there. Uh, location two was the Birch Lake property. And location three was the official summer residence of our governor up on Mackinac Island. And he makes it very clear. It's all surveillance. What's, this, what's Mr. Uh, Mahler's response? Understood. Easy peasy. Um, <clears throat> But he wants to know more, Mr. Molitor does. And, um, you know, this is um, uh, June 11th. He says, I like your energy. I still need to be brief. And what he's talking about here is the, uh, what happened in Dublin, okay? And um, 
this all happens before uh, Eric Mahler gets in the vehicle with Fox for the daytime surveillance. He gets debriefed on Dublin. Big things happening. Uh, the Michigan 2nd Continental Regiment uh, message gets communicated to him by Adam Fox. Um, Molitor's preparing for civil war by the equipment that he bought. Uh, he needs to get prepped. He said that. Uh, <clears throat> he keeps asking for the attack timeline, which is a pretty smart thing for somebody who's going to be involved in an attack. Let me know when it's going to happen so I can be prepared. Molitor starts recruiting. Uh, he goes to his encrypted platform uh, with Adam Fox. Uh, he's invited to recon. And uh, they're going to do a high-profile vacation house, as we just saw. We just talked about OPSEC. And uh, this all happens in between June 6th and August 27th. Okay? This is before he sits down in the car with CHS Dan and Adam Fox. Uh, he does get attack details <clears throat> during the Rydale Rapids. Um, uh, this is some of the uh, conversation between them. Uh, right when he gets in the car, and this is after he's shown Adam Fox's RF detector um, uh, at his home uh, near Cadillac. Uh, Mr. You know, Fox says to him, we're going to do recon on the tyrant bitch's fucking vacation home, her boat today, okay? All right. I mean, and, you know, they, they use, <clears throat> if you look during the course of this case, and, you know, there's a misappropriation of words by, by the Null brothers and Mr. Molitor and Mr. Fox and Mr. Crock, and they call themselves patriots and, you know, new founding fathers, and they also use the word tyrant to describe anybody in elected office or police officers, you know. I mean, they don't like authority. Uh, Fox says to him, extraction, snatch and grab. I mean, the, the plan now is pivoted from Lansing attacking the Capitol to now he's focused on the governor's cabin on Birch Lake, and for him, tactically, that was probably a smart move. Uh, and Mahler says, all right, is this now? Obviously, there's a time frame on this. You know, Mahler keeps asking for the time frame because he wants to know when he has to be ready. Is this something you're going to uh, going to wait until after the election to see if she gets reelected, or is this something that's going to be preemptive? Uh, so we're going to be we're going to be uh, going to be done with her after the extraction. And, um, you know, the daytime surveillance, I mean, you know, this picture says it all. I mean, they got to the threshold of the governor's driveway you know, during the daytime surveillance, and they found it. And, uh, you know, the state troopers uh, that are on the governor's protection detail had to move the first gentleman that day, uh, get him out of the house. You know, uh, you heard, um, you know, Agent Impla, you know, required uh, CHS Dan to drive for two reasons. One, for his own safety, so he had some modicum of control. And number two, um, uh, you know, if they encountered law enforcement, like on a traffic stop or something like that, Dan would be capable or, you know, would try to de-escalate it in some way, you know, I mean, to not let, you know, Adam Fox do something rash. Um, you know, the, um, uh, or if even if Adam Fox wanted to attack that day, I mean, at least Dan would be there. Um, you know, the, uh, during the ride, this is an exchange between uh, Adam Fox and Eric Molitor, and again, you know, Eric says, I, I was so scared during the, the ride and I, I didn't, you know, know what to do. And yet, you know, he's, he's getting high with uh, with Fox all day long. I mean, you know, he's at, he's at the Red Bull and they're out there smoking pot. You know, it doesn't, he doesn't really seem to be behaving like somebody who's terrified for his life. And here's a very poignant statement that's made. He says, and they put their, her family at risk. I was like, really? And what he's talking about is there was a protest at the governor's house, and uh, and there were some people there with you know long guns all kitted up, and uh, Fox says, "Bitch, you put your family at risk." And Mater says, "Yeah, uh, you don't know what risk is." Referring to the governor there, okay? I mean, you know, Mater is not scared during this car ride. Uh, what else does he do during the car ride? Well, he makes you know six different you know Google searches trying to find the governor's address. And, um, you, know, that, you know, what's Governor Whitmer's cabin address? I mean, if he's not helping Adam Fox during the daytime surveillance, then why is he doing this? You know, he, he testified to you, I was just trying to, you know, I was, oh, I was terrified during the whole thing. Yet, you know, he's making conscious choices. He's moving, you know, in a, in a, you know, in a, in a way that just shows a goal-oriented, you know, pattern of behavior. Uh, he made six separate searches that day. And, you know, um, throughout the day, uh, Mr. Molitor is providing uh, himself as personnel, make no mistake about it. He's also helping with the surveillance, okay? 
And uh, the video he, he took, as I mentioned earlier, fits squarely within the idea of intangible property for Adam Fox's plan to attack the governor on Timberlake Drive. And, you know, I got to visit Mr. Null's testimony from yesterday a little bit. You know, he tried to convince you I didn't think Adam Fox was serious. You know, no, Adam Fox was serious. And you didn't have to be around him very long, as long as you had a set of ears, to know that he was serious about what he was doing. You know, what does Eric come out or do during the course of the uh, day? Hey, you know what, where's the nearest police department? You know, how far away is that? You know, let's talk about how many police officers are on the road at any given time. You know, I have my friend that's a, you know, a, a police officer down in Grand Rapids, you know. We should think about that. You know, he's offering plan refinements to Adam Fox. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is um, about doing the right thing. And, you know, CHS Dan, uh, you know, has portrayed to you that this was some money-making opportunity for him when he got paid $54,000 in this 17 weeks of work. Went down in that hole in uh, the back shack with Adam Fox, and uh, the idea was tried to portray to you that oh, he's just in it for the money. You can't trust him because of that. No, uh, he did the right thing. Within an hour of seeing what he saw on the Wolverine Watchman uh, platform, you know, uh, he called the police. And within a week, he was connected with Henrik Empola and the FBI. And thank God he was, because you know he did the right thing. And this is how Eric Molitor feels about Dan. What do you think about uh, Dan now? Uh, I don't know. I think he's a counselor. I think he's a piece of shit. Yeah, that's Eric Molitor. Um, let's talk a little bit about Mr. Molitor and uh, after the daytime surveillance. He, uh, in talking to uh, Adam Fox, he's talking about how shit boils his blood. You know, he's getting ready to go. Um, Fox uh, agrees, yeah, mine too, uh, uh, and he's talking about, you know, the, the governor's uh, decisions in uh, regards to COVID. That was a declaration of war, bro. You know, you, you notice how they call each other brothers and bros. I mean, you know, no, these guys, they, they're a team. They're operating in unison, and, uh, you know, Molitor agrees. Uh, you know, you know. Uh, think about you know what uh, Molitor uh, supplied in terms of the RF detector. Now, you know, I'm the only person on the planet that I'm aware of that has ever called it a toy is the attorney for Mr. Molitor, Mr. Barnett. He called it a toy. Think about Mark's perspective. You see, Mark. Okay, and again, you know what these guys do is unique. You know, guys like you see Mark and you see Tim. Um, they are about serious business on our behalf. You know, and when they're in that environment, just think about you see Mark at Luther and he sees Adam Fox wanding people and he sees uh, Eric Mahler holding the uh, RF detector up to see if he's picking up any signals from, you know, uh, listening devices. Think about, you know, from the perspective of UC Mark or UC Tim or, or, or CHS Dan. Um, no, he supplied something whether it's a toy or whether it's a device the CIA or NASA might use is of no moment. That's a distraction. The point is, Eric Mahler is providing equipment to uh, 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 Adam Fox to help with OPSEC. And, you know, we went through, a, you know, with Henrik Impla, he was, uh, was cross-examined strenuously uh, about, you know, well, um, uh, Eric Mahler never told him how to use it. And, well, yeah, he did, you know, and we didn't have that exhibit, okay? We didn't have that exhibit cut. And the next day, overnight, you know, we went back to the audio, found where uh, Eric Molitor uh, met Adam Fox in the Walmart on Saturday morning of Luther FTX, and you heard that exhibit, and it's Eric Molitor telling Fox how the RF detector works. At no point in time do you hear Eric Molitor say, yeah, it's just a toy. It doesn't really work very well. He's not underselling it. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, what it is is it shows Eric Molitor supports, is providing material support to Adam Fox, knowing that he's got an attack plan against our governor here in Antrim County. 
you know, uh, during the course of the FTX, Eric Molitor brings his medical kit, uh, acts as the medic uh, that goes to expert services, expert assistance. And, uh, you know, during that day on Sunday when they test the second explosive device, you know, he says he'll act as the medic. Um, he's helping the terrorists in their planning and facilitating their efforts. Remember those two words from the elements. Uh, this is an example of, you know, him providing his expert services. And remember what he said about the governor's family uh, uh, on daytime surveillance and how she put her family at risk. And this interview with Mr. Van Dusen is exactly what he was talking about during the daytime surveillance in the, the exhibit that I showed you a little while ago. And watch how Mr. Molitor changes his position in this exhibit from, yeah, she's a victim, but when at the end of it, he's like mad as heck, and, uh, and he's talking about, no, you know, she's not a victim. So what do you think, you know, I watched, and I read a little bit, of, but I watched a video presentation of uh, Governor Whitmer's um, victim impact statement, which was a video during the, the sun scene of the Warren Washburn on Jackson in the summer. And, you know, she explained how this whole situation really affected her life and her family. And do, do you think that she has some legitimate concerns? I think anybody who, who hears about something about what they plotted against them or whatever, yeah, of course that's going to be scary. Yeah, I'd be scared shitless too. You want to know more about this corpus where you die, that corpus where you die, is this person I'm talking to here to actually do the harm? Like, yes, that would be terrifying. You put yourself in a fucking spotlight. There are certain things that are going to come along with it. it I'm not saying that it's right. I'm not justifying bullshit better than that. But people have the right to talk. I don't need to agree with it. They have that right. I don't like it. So what? I don't make the fucking rules. Yes, she's scared, but isn't that weird? Because at first she's like, oh, I'm not scared. Nothing. Nothing's going to fucking stop me. She went right out afterwards. She's going to go to the door. Fucking campaigning for mine. She's so afraid of somebody just popping her out of the fucking room. She's going to go to the door and go to the happen. No, dude. She's not scared of where you are scared. Stop lying. Be a real human being. You know, it's okay to show vulnerability. Maybe people might appreciate that. You might be a more human instead of fucking a lying bitch. Yeah, Eric Molitor hated our governor. It goes to his motive. And then this is very telling. You know, uh, <clears throat> this is from Molitor's home computer um, during the search warrant authorized by a judge. Um, if he's not on board with helping Fox and Croft in their attack plan against the governor here in Antrim County, then why is he seeking, uh, you know, this is uh, after the Luther FTX, why is he trying to figure out who the lieutenant governor is? You know, again, you know, think of the lieutenant governor as a little bit like vice president. You know, if something were to happen to our governor, the lieutenant governor steps in and fills the role. Okay, he's looking for the next target, and this is September 16th, after Luther. Uh, you know, six days before his arrest, he's still offering, uh, you know, um, Mr. Uh, Fox ideas about, hey, you know, we should attack during the holidays, you know, uh, during high tourism season, during a time that will blend in with the tourists because we're out of towners, okay? And this uh, clip is actually from this trial here, and this is Mr. Molitor's testimony when he explains why he continued to help Fox refine his plan right up until six days before his arrest. Uh, you talk about, um, I know you're not looking at it, so I'll just read it for you. Um, you talked about on um, October 1st, this is six days before your arrest, right? Yeah. And uh, so a few weeks after the news for FTX, right? Uh, two weeks after, I believe, yes. Okay. You can talk about um, holidays are best for traveling because of out of area. Uh, slash state people are expected. And what you're talking about there is like that's a good time to go and do surveillance or the attack, right? Uh, yes. Okay. When you're, you're talking about this, you know, you can come up here and sit there and you can do a whole bunch of tours. I mean, we're out of town too, right? That would be my Okay. Okay, after Mr. Molitor learns of the kidnapping attack, uh, these are really the dirty dozen. Okay, these are the acts by Molitor after he learns Fox's plan to attack the governor in Anthony County. Searches for the governor's address during the daytime surveillance. He helps to identify the governor's home. He records the slow motion video. Uh, 
He suggests surveillance of the Elk Rapids Police Department. Uh, he brings the RF detector to Luther. Uh, he facilitates the, US, uh, the use of that RF detector by telling Adam Cox how to use it. <clears throat> um, he works as a medic for the Kill House. Uh, he uses the RF detector uh, during Luther. Uh, you heard you see Mark's testimony about that. Uh, Mr. Molitor serves as a medic for the bomb testing. Uh, he recommends using offline navigational maps uh, and additional training for the attack. Uh, he recommends a holiday attack and fake license plates. And uh, he advises the operators to use ammunition that can penetrate body armor. I mean, these are the things that show Eric Molitor's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And this all happens in between the daytime surveillance and the date of his arrest. Uh, <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about the Knoll brothers and uh, how they knew uh, Knox's uh, and Croft's plan for a terrorist attack and how they provided their material support. You know, this picture here is of them of Luther. And um, like I said before, um, the Knoll brothers are serious guys. Six foot two, 280 pounds, if you believe Mr. Knoll, Mr. Bill Knoll. And they are well armed, and well equipped, and they are ready to go. And, you know, a picture can be worth a thousand words. And... Just imagine them coming through the governor's door at her cabin, you know, all kitted up and ready to go in a surprise attack. I mean, that's how, you know, that's how cowardly they really are. Is, you know, they were going to do the surprise attack at night against some state troopers who weren't ready and weren't prepared. And they were going to die. They were going to kill those state troopers. And, you know, <clears throat> here's a, a Bill Null, you know, an encrypted uh, chat. Uh, set the time. The place should be in the woods. We talked about last meeting leave all electronics at home. I mean, they, pro they practice OPSEC. They knew the value of in-person meetings and limiting their electronic communications. I mean, Mike even took the additional step of deleting 80% of his messages from his phone. I mean, you heard that testimony from uh, Henrik Impola. Yeah, uh, Bill was playing, you know, he had plans, but he wasn't going to discuss it on the Fed book. He hated the government. I mean, if nothing else came out of Mr. Knoll's testimony, he hates our government. Uh, uh, if you guys want a real meeting with the phones in the truck and at home, let's set some real shit up. And, you know, this is back in April 2002, okay, uh, 2020. Uh, but I'm not discussing anything on here like what people want to talk about. What he's talking about there is people want to talk about, you know, how we're gonna how we're gonna attack. And it's a good idea, bro. They're always listening. Uh, you know. On June 6, 2020, Bill drives four and a half hours each way down to Dublin, Ohio, to attend Croft's New Founding Fathers meeting. And he tries to offer you, and he lied to you, I suggest, uh, when uh, he testified, about, I'm just going down there to network with other militias, because, you know, I'm just a networking kind of guy. Well, whose name did you come back with from Dublin? Mr. Null, you know, when you went down there to network. I mean, when we network, we go out, we meet people, uh, you know, we go to functions, uh, we learn their names. How can I contact you? Can I follow up in the future? Now, he's down there. He may be networking, but he's networking with the terrorists, okay? And he is not down there for innocent reasons. You know, so uh, uh, now you look at who's there uh, when uh, Mr. Null gets down there, and Barry Croft and Fox. You know, this is, again, uh, the threat streams are merging at this point. And, you know, when you listen to the audio clips from Dublin about Mr. Fox, and, and really all three of them, about Mr. Croft and what he has to say, and the reason they're down there is, again, to kick off a multi-state civil war. And you listen to what Fox has to say about taking hostages, because hostages have value. And you listen to Mr. Null. There's nothing else going on in that room except that conversation. I mean, Mr. Null's testimony to you that, oh, there's a lot going on. You know, I didn't, you know, no, I didn't even hear that. And he tries to use the same lame excuse as he does about, oh, that's why I didn't hear the car assignments at the AMVETS over in Elk Rapids because I'm over, you know, uh, relieving myself in the parking lot at 1130 on a car ride that I don't know why I'm on. His story didn't make sense. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Null, Null, Bill Null networking with the terrorists uh, while they're in uh, uh, Dublin. You know, this is uh, Barry Croft. I'm going to terrorize. You want to terrorize? 
you label me a terrorist. I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to go be what I am. I'm going to uh, go be what I am. I'm, you're all terrorists. Okay. There, there's no other conversation going on in that room. You need to hit them all at the same time. You need to take hostages. You need to have, uh, you need tyrants. What he's talking about is he's talking about our elected officials. Okay. And uh, his hostages. There you have value. Then human life is the value to it. Right. Hey, Mr. Null, you know, yeah, I agree with everybody here. That's Bill Null. So I completely agree with everything. I mean, and those are exhibits 58, 61, 62, and 63. Let me say something for a minute here, too, about the exhibits. A couple of things. Number one, um, uh, you're going to be given a computer that has uh, the exhibits uh, electronically. Um, if you want to call for the exhibit book um, that was uh, being used by the witnesses, you can do so. You're, there's no list about what the exhibits are, okay? So there's no index, if you will. And what I'm going to suggest to you is if you want to kind of reference what each exhibit is, you go to the uh, exhibit book, you, know, you can see what it is, you know, if you're thinking about a particular exhibit you want to talk about during deliberations, and then if you want to listen to it you, or, or view it on the computer, you can do that, or if it's a picture, you can obviously view it there in the exhibit book, okay? So the exhibit book is kind of going to become your index to what everything is. Okay, uh, Okay. this is again an encrypted wire. Fox tells Dan that he's meeting with the Nulls the following day, July 1, confirms that the Null brothers are on board. And, uh, you know, again, you know, actions speak louder than words. You know, uh, you know, and, you know, Mr. Null, during his testimony, Bill Null, went to great lengths to say, you know, I barely knew Adam Fox. Well, that wasn't the truth. I mean, and why is he lying to you about that? It's because he wants to distance himself from Adam Fox because he knows it's very clear that Adam Fox had a terroristic plan that he was on board with. Okay, so that's why Bill Null didn't want to admit to knowing Adam Fox. Um, they were invited to Cambria, both Mike and Bill were by Adam. And, uh, you know, the FTX included live fire weapons training, breaching, clearing, a mock kill house and combat medical care. And, you know, that medical care they're teaching at all these FTXs, it's not, um, you know, uh, kitchen cuts and uh, sunburn treatment. I mean, you know, it's all combat wound care, things that happen during a combat. Like when I, I think the testimony was, you know, like when you get shot or stabbed, okay? Um, it's, there's no coincidence that they're here, okay? Uh, this FTX is a cover for Adam Fox and Barry Croft to continue to recruit and train. That's what they were doing with uh, Bill Null and Mike Null there. This wasn't some family-friendly barbecue. I mean, they're preparing to get to attack together. I mean, the Nulls were going to be part of Fox's and Croft's kill squad is what Adam Fox talked about. And, you know, actions speak louder than words. And, you know, remember, you can use circumstantial evidence to prove the two elements of the crime charge brought providing material support. They're not there by accident, okay? Uh, you know, again, you know, uh, they're using these militia trainings as cover. Uh, you know, they're talking about uh, Governor Whitmer. There's bomb testing going on there. You saw those exhibits. Barry Croft tried to build an IED. It didn't work in uh, Cambria. It worked. He was getting better. It worked in Luther. Uh, combat, casualty care, kill house, movement under fire, you know, out-of-state travel, um, uh, and then they organize all this through encrypted communications. You know, think about why, you know, here's Bill and Mike Knoll with their wives, with their kids, they're in Menominee, and they're on their July summer vacation. Bill and Mike, along with uh, Bill's son, uh, William Jr., hop in the vehicle, and they travel two and a half hours to Cambria to train for a day, a day away from their families who are camping in Menominee, okay? This, you know, again, we don't do things by accident in life. We make choices. And, you know, the reason Bill and Mike take that day, drive two and a half down, two and a half back, train with those people uh, in Cambria is because they're dedicated to the cause. They're in with both feet. They're not there by mistake. And, you know, uh, there's Adam Fox in the background, there's Bill Null in the foreground, and, um, you know, again, you don't do things by mistake, ladies and gentlemen. And the other end of the firing line here were the state troopers that were on the uh, governor's protection detail. 
and any other officers like Dave Centella or any officers from his department or any deputies from the Antrim County Sheriff's Department that were going to get in their way. And this is what they were going to do. Hey, I'm not ready. This wasn't some family friendly barbecue, okay? They were going to slaughter anybody who got in their way. Consistent occurrence in, in this case is Bill Null gets information and Mike Null shows up. He did it in Cambria, he did it in Luther, and he did it during the nighttime surveillance. You know, again, we don't do very much uh, by mistake in life. And uh, this is a conversation uh, in uh, uh, Cambria after, uh, uh, between Dan and Fox and Amanda Keller. Uh, Dan says, you know, brothers, and Fox says, they're down, and Amanda Keller, remember, you heard her phone call. You know, she knew what the whole plan was, and yet, you know, Bill Null wants to claim he didn't. Eric Molitor wants to claim he didn't. Uh, yeah, she says, uh, he was at the very first meeting we had. So he knows what's going on. Fox says he's been in the loop since the beginning. Yeah, uh, this is uh, uh, Exhibit 105, and uh, again, we don't do much by mistake. You know, there's Barry Croft, Adam Fox, in the background there. There's Bill Noll and Mike Noll. I mean, this event in Luther had a galvanization effect. Okay, they're getting closer to doing what they want to do. Okay, I mean, there's a reason they're in Wisconsin training with two terrorists. It's not a mistake. Uh, you know, Croft wasn't shy about his vision. You know, wham, a quick, precise grab on that uh, fucking governor. And this is uh, this is after the Nulls have left. Okay, and the, the Nulls. I don't suggest the Nulls were present when Mr. Uh, Croft made this statement, but. You know, again, it's like uh, it's like it's like Adam Fox. I mean, you know, uh, Croft wasn't shy about sharing his vision with anybody with a set of ears. Okay, and you know, the suggestions been made to you. Well, you know, you you, you can't prove that Bill Null heard what uh, you know Barry Croft said. You know, at a certain moment in time. No, what we can prove is that he was with Barry Croft enough to absolutely know what Barry Croft's plan was. And Barry Croft, and just you know, look at this. All, you know, what is he, uh, you know, wham, a quick, precise grab on that fucking governor. And all you're going to fucking end up having to possibly take out is your armed guard. Yeah, you know, like three or four state troopers, you know. You heard Scott McManus, you know, the state troopers that guard our governor. Um, they will give their life to protect the governor, regardless of party, it doesn't matter, you know. And, uh, you know, they were going to kill the men and women that are state troopers that protect our governor. That was their plan. And just think about Dave Centella. You know, hey, Dave, uh, what would you have done if you had been in your house? He lives three doors down from the governor's cabin. You heard gunshots from the north coming from the governor's. I would have grabbed my gun and I would have run in the direction of the gunshots. He would have been killed, too. No doubt about it. He would have been slaughtered. Yeah, uh, what's the light bulb moment? Uh, you know, I was put to you during uh, Ms. Uh, Nunzio's opening on behalf of Mr. Bill Null. There's several of them. You know, June 6th, uh, you know, there, uh, Bill Null's at the New Founding uh, Fathers meeting. June 30th, there's a meeting between Bill Null and Adam Fox. July 11th, training in Cambria, another light bulb moment. Uh, Bill Null and uh, Adam Fox meet again in August. Uh, and Bill and Mike uh, Null are part of the coalition, Leaders Coalition chat. Yeah, there were several light bulb moments for both Null brothers. Um, 
you know, again, we don't do things by mistake. The Knolls are in Luther for a reason. Remember, uh, they are training with Fox and Croft and several members of the Wolverine Watchmen Shadow Group at this point you know, from Luther. Talking about Ty Garvin, Dan Harris, uh, Caleb Franks, and, uh, you know, Dan testified about this. These were the operators. These were going to be the guys in the business end of a gun. And, and uh, they were the doers, as Adam Fox talked about. I mean, they're hours from home, the Null brothers are uh, in the middle of the woods, and they're not there by mistake. I mean, they're there because they know of Adam Fox and Cross' plan to attack the governor, and they're providing material support. Um, think of how the Null's presence, and again, you know, I kind of get back to basic psychology. You know, there they are at Luther, and uh, during the training and the nighttime surveillance, and how that would have empowered Adam Fox and Barry Croft, okay? how that would have uh, made them feel so much better about what they were doing, more confident, more brave, okay? Because now they got two guys who are six foot two, 280 pounds, and well-equipped, ready to go in the nighttime surveillance. Okay. Uh, and think about what Bill said. Now he's in our capital rotunda uh, on April 30th, you know, and, and – let me suggest to you that was what was happening in April 30th of 2020 in our capital wasn't some band of merry men who were coming to see our government at work. I mean, there's Bill Null with a shotgun uh, in a sheath over his back. He's got a high-powered rifle slung on the shoulder, and he's got a sidearm. He's got full ballistic armor. Okay, and what did he say? Uh, he said, um, no, no, I... I you know, I'm not afraid. I, you know, I have my guns, and I'm not afraid to use them. Okay. Uh, take a look at Bill and Mike uh, in the kill house here, and it's not hard to see them in your mind's eye entering the governor's cabin in formation. No one's in Luther by mistake. The, the Wolverine Watchmen took months to prep the property. You, know, you saw a little bit about that creation of the shooting range, the tires, the tractor they rented so they could move some earth, and, you know, the uh, kill house they erected. Their training had a purpose. It wasn't some ad hoc thing that happened. Uh, and it had a purpose just like the surveillance did that night. So, you know, and I'd suggest to you that in Bill Null's testimony, his story changed about the knowledge of what he knew of Fox's in Croft's attack planning. You know, he started off with, um, uh, you know, questions from his attorney that he didn't really know what Fox, uh, didn't really know Fox, and he had no idea what Fox's plan was until Sunday, and that was his light bulb moment. And I think we've, through the evidence, uh, disproven that. The, um, uh, it was, uh, you know, his, his testimony went from, I didn't really, I didn't know what his plan was. I didn't know why I was in the car to, you know, something a little bit different when he was confronted. You know, when he was confronted with, you know, what he told the FBI after his arrest was vastly different than what he told you on direct. So that's evidence that he lied to you. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, what he told the FBI after his arrest is, uh, uh, likely closest to the truth, I would suggest to you, the evidence supports that idea. And, um, you know, he talks about continuously, his, his main excuse was, Adam Fox is always ranting, I didn't really take him seriously. Well, you know, you took him seriously in Dublin, and then, you know, you followed him to Cambria, and then you followed him to Luther, and then you followed him on the nighttime surveillance. So, you know, he, he's, he's acting with, you know, Mr. Null and Michael Null were acting uh, with purpose. They were acting with intent. It wasn't some mistake that they were in the car that night. And uh, you know, the, the nighttime surveillance, uh, they met up in Cadillac, the three cars did, and they staged uh, after they drove an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes up to Elk Rapids. 
Uh, they staged the AMVETs and Fox provided the team assignments there, the signal car, the spotter car, and the lookout car. Of course, Mr. Bill Null says he didn't hear any of that. Um, and, uh, I, you know, you've got uh, UC Tim told you how uh, Croft thought the attack was going to happen that night and he had to back him down. I mean, again, think about, you know, what would have happened if UC Tim hadn't been there to do that. Uh, you know, these guys were ready to go. And, uh, uh, and again, you know, Mr. Bill Null's story is, is that, um, you know, I didn't know why I was up there. Uh, this is from uh, uh, the uh, before, uh, this is Saturday when uh, Bill Null was brought into the recon uh, by Adam Fox. And this is Adam Fox, uh, you know, saying, you come with me. Okay, and during that meeting, he says, we already put eyes on our cottage up there. And Bill Null says, really? We're going to take another look tonight, get eyes on it at nighttime. We're going to uh, going to do two vehicles. If you guys are down, you want to roll. I mean, Mr. Null, Mike, and Bill Null knew what was going to happen that night. And that's the point of this exhibit. Um, and, uh, and again, you know, Bill gets information and Mike shows up too. Actions speak louder than words. Uh, this is, uh, there's Soul Luther, Bill's present. And this is, you know, Fox talking about, you know, it's fucking perfect, dude. There's a goddamn boat launch on the other side of the lake. It's literally concealed by fucking trees. And then it's like, it's just too fucking perfect, man. It really is. Take her out. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, Bill Null knows they're going to look at the governor's cabin on the recon. And he knows why they're doing it. It's not like they're going to go. It's not like voyeurism. Like, it's not like in Hollywood where, uh, you know, I've read about you can take these tours and go by Star's homes. This isn't some kind of, you know, creepy midnight voyeurism thing. No, they're, they're attack planning, and they're going on recon, to use Bill Null's exact word. Um, this, uh, again, is uh, it's not hard to tell what Bill Null's intentions are. You know, he's, the fact that he supports uh, 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 Adam Fox's plan. Um, uh, his explanation here is that he was going to tell Fox it was a mistake. You know, that, I mean, that's what he testified to you yesterday, okay? That, you know, yeah, he was, he was actually going to tell him here that it was a mistake, and I got a brother in prison, and uh, no, he, let me tell you, you know, Bill Null hates our government. The evidence clearly showed that, okay? And his brother in prison probably doesn't help his sentiment into any. And, you know, but at nowhere, at no other point in time do we see Bill Null saying, hey, wait, no, no, you, this is a bad idea. You should back, you know, you should back down. You know, you should stand down on this idea. No, and his story to you wasn't the truth. Um, uh, and let's take a look at the next slide that supports that premise. Um, yeah, then everybody barbecued. <coughs> this is whether or not Mike knew what he was going to do that night. And, um, uh, and here we are. He says, yeah, I knew we were going to go for a ride, so I fucking didn't want to drink too much. That's in the vehicle with Mark. Okay, while they're there uh, in Cadillac waiting at the Walmart, this is Fox talking to the Null brothers. This is Joe. They know what they were doing that night. And, uh, this would be about the old He was on the residence on the island. He was on the So, no, no, I just got very heavy security detail up there. With a lot of fucking friends that do not know on their stage, okay? To this potentially deal with the fucking post guard. Here, there's a little town right there. There's a little bridge that goes on. We can blow that fucking bridge, and there's like no way for the cops to get around there. They're close to the inside of that, like 20 plus miles on all directions. 
<clears throat> yeah, they were the out of towners, and they didn't care who got hurt. Uh, you know, you look for coordinated efforts, and you know, because again, there's not much that happens in life by mistake. And you know, you see, you know, the vehicles uh, rally at the M vets there, um, uh, and then what do they do from there? And uh, these are who's in the signal vehicle, spotter vehicle, lookout vehicle. And uh, Bill and Mike are with UC Mark. And uh, yeah, they're the counter surveillance vehicle. They're helping Adam Fox and Barry Croft that day. Uh, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, close to midnight, driving around uh, <laughs> virtually. Uh, again, you know, we don't do things by mistake. This is coordinated behavior, you know. And you see, Tim told you about, you know, uh, uh, everyone was told to stay in the area while Adam, uh, you know, went under the bridge and looked at it. Um, and Adam, you know, told everybody that he wanted to look under the bridge with uh, Tim. And, uh, you know, they, everyone knew what the surveillance was. Everybody knew about it. Um, this is the, the point in time when you see Mark's uh, vehicle drives by Timberlake Drive uh, going east on Williams Road. And uh, that's Exhibit 5 in the, um, uh, in the surveillance uh, animation. Uh, they drove by it two times. Uh, they're in the area, and they're there to support Adam Fox and Barry Croft, who were up at the boat launch trying to, as the spotter vehicle, trying to see uh, Brian, uh, or I mean Mr. Higgins' vehicle drive by, flashing the lights. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to get a line on from the boat launch to the governor's cabin what route uh, we would take from this boat launch to get to her place in the middle of the night. There's value in nighttime surveillance versus daytime surveillance. Things look different at night, you get a better perspective, and it helps you to become more educated on your attack plan. Afterwards, what do they do? This is more coordinated uh, evidence of coordination. You know, they all rally at the Red Bull. They do a little debrief, and then they're out of there. Uh, here the Nulls um, are at the Circle of Trust meeting on Sunday. And this is where, you know, Bill Knoll says, I got scared and I locked eyes with my brother. It's a very dramatic testimony, but it wasn't truthful. Um, and they're fully on board. They're ready to go. Um, you know, I uh, think about their, uh, again, you know, it, they didn't make it hard to understand what they were about. I mean, they wore the boogaloo patch. They wanted to overthrow our government. As crazy as that sounds, as crazy as that sounds, that's what they wanted. This is their ideology. They supported Adam Fox and they supported Barry Croft. This is, uh, you know, what their actions were after their light bulb moment. I mean, they traveled to the new founding fathers meeting. They uh, had encrypted communications. They had in-person meetings one-on-one -on -one with Adam Fox, Bill Null did. Uh, their planning meeting with Fox. Uh, they were in the Michigan Patriot Three Percenters uh, private chat group. They traveled to Cambria while they're on summer vacation. They trained with Croft and Fox there. Uh, they traveled to Luther with firearms. They trained with Croft and Fox and Luther. Uh, their surveillance team, uh, they were the lookout team during the recon of the Elk River Bridge. They were the lookout vehicle during the recon of the governor's uh, uh, cabin, and they were in the circle of trust. So let's talk about, you know, I, as I said before, and listen, you've been very patient, and I really appreciate it, okay? I mean, I know this is a lot. Okay, and I know we're, you know, this is, a, 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 there's a lot of volume here, but trying to get it down to an understandable thing, it really is a simple case. I mean, there's, you know, two things that have to be charged to show they're guilty of providing material support. Okay, one, you know, and that means any one of the following, you know, personnel, uh, uh, this is from Mr. Molitor, uh, you know, did he supply himself? He sure did. Uh, did he help with surveillance? Yes. Um, physical assets like the RF detector and his medical services, and also the video. Um, uh, did he do it knowing that Fox and or Croft would use it in whole or in part to do any of these things, plan, prepare, carry out, facilitate, or avoid apprehension for an act of terrorism? Yeah, uh, both those things uh, are proven beyond a reasonable doubt. With regards to the nulls, you know, yeah, I mean, they were... You know, they provided themselves as personnel and significant personnel, guys that were willing to be, again, on the business end of a rifle. And they were going to be part of the operators. And, uh, and they, the reason they were willing to be 
is because they knew what Fox's plan was to attack the governor here in Antrim County. Uh, so yeah, they're helping him to plan, they're helping him to prepare, they're helping, they're gonna help him carry it out, to facilitate and avoid apprehension. So yeah, both of those have been proven as well. Finally, you know, felony firearm, very straightforward. You know, did they possess a firearm? And uh, when we committed the underlying felony, and I'd suggest that the evidence supports that. And, and so at the end of the day, there's really four things that have to be proven. The two elements of the crime charge, material support, the two elements in the felony firearm count. And uh, both those have been, uh, I believe the evidence suggests to you that they've been proven. Now, um, you've been very kind and you've given me your attention, I can tell, and I thank you for that. Um, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to ask that you give the same kind of attention to uh, Mr. Nunzio and uh, to Mr. Cyber and to Mr. Barnett. Uh, when they're done, I'll have a second chance to rise and address you. Uh, it will not be as lengthy as what you've just gone through. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I, my comments then will be limited to rebuttal, you know, to what they may assert in terms of their arguments on behalf of their clients. You know, again, I, I want to say how much we appreciate your time, really. Thank you very much, Judge. Thank you. Um, I think given the time is going to take a short break before uh, your closing arguments, so I'll rise for the jury. Uh, the record can reflect the jury's outside the courtroom. Everybody can have a seat. We okay? Yeah. First time. Everything okay? She's making descriptions of the jurors. Who is? Okay, don't mind the observations. Uh, on the jurors themselves, right? Uh, yes, on the, the demographics of the jury. Okay, that would be prohibited under Michigan court rule, and it's prohibited by this court. No description of the jury in any way can be done. Is that clear? Yes. If anything's been posted about that, or any notes have been taken, I understand. I, I any notes have been taken, they need to be destroyed. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Thank you. We'll be on a short break, um, Mr. Bernardino. We need to reset some things, maybe five to ten minutes, give everyone a chance to address them. Thank you. Just concerned with the hour. Uh, we're going to twelve thirty, please. Probably, I'm guessing. That's fine. We'll start lunch at twelve thirty. Okay. Uh, if you want to give them the menu. Uh, and I didn't ask anything before we take a break. No, sir. No, thank you. <coughs> anything? Nope. Okay. We'll be on the break for about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.
If you take a photograph of them, nobody could record what they look like. The same rules that I just outlined that apply in this room apply for the ever during this trial, no matter where it exists in the world. Um, the example I would give is, I remember in the NFL, right, the, they said the goal line extended all the way around the world. So even if the, the running back dove, you know, presumably five yards outside of the actual end zone, they said that well, that was a touchdown. It's the same thing, right? Th those rules apply everywhere on the planet during uh, this trial. Nobody will be identified in terms of the jurors uh, in any way during this process. Um, and so just so that we avoid any misconceptions or uh, issues in the future. Okay, so I just want to cover that with everybody. Uh, so Mr. Barnett is next for closing. Um, it sounds like that will take us up until we break right for lunch. Uh, does that sound right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then obviously we'll take uh, the hour and a half that we have been taking for lunch uh, and then turn to Mr. Nunzio, Mr. Cyber, go back to the people. Uh, and in terms of where we are, breaks, obviously we'll determine uh, based on time. Okay. Thank you. Anything for anybody before we bring them? No, thank Thank you. you. Okay. Um, it's been brought to my attention that during closing argument, um, this individual right here was standing up and pointing and counting to the jurors and taking notes while doing so. That's very concerning to me. I don't know who she is. I don't know why she's doing that. I'd ask the court to instruct her to not uh, in any way try to intimidate this jury, remain seated, and just let everybody else in the gallery Behave. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we approach your honor. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. We will. Uh, what I will do is generally instruct everybody that they are to remain seated if they're viewing this process. Uh, if somebody needs to move to see an exhibit, that's perfectly appropriate. But uh, basically, if you're not the attorney talking, you are invisible. Okay? That's the rule. I'll see the attorneys up here, please. All rise right, for so the jury, please. Oh, Mr. Nunzio, Mr. Cyber, yes. uh, Mr. Barnett let me know that he's going to put things up on the easel here. He just wanted to make sure I was okay with I think, him putting it in front of me, which I am. If the two of you obviously need to move. Go right then. Okay. <clears throat> I'll display them actually to the council. Your ears work? <laughs> Where's your keys? Memory? <laughs> we'll get the uh, Jeopardy. Jeopardy. <laughs>
Okay, everyone can be seated. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're going to turn to the defense side for closing arguments. Mr. Barnett is going to go first. Mr. Barnett, go right ahead. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Today, I'd like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for all your hard work in this case so far at the high school during jury selection. We talked about logistics, and folks have made it through here. That's very commendable. Commendable, and I want to thank you for that. We are now at a turning point in the case where the facts and evidence have been presented, and you step into the role as the decision maker and the finder and, and facts. Eric Molitor is facing two counts of criminal activity. If he's found not guilty by you on count one, providing material support or resources for a terrorism act or organization, and he will be automatically not guilty for count two. Do you want to immediately address some things that were brought up? Let me go off my script a little bit uh, regarding the, the uh, closing uh, by Mr. Ralston. Uh, I want to talk to you about circumstantial evidence just a little bit. Let's say a person comes in with a wet raincoat. It's, it's raining. It's raining. That's what we're thinking. What if that person just pulled in their drive, they noticed their neighbor's sprinklers running across the walkway, they grabbed their raincoat from the back of the car from the previous day's rain and put it on. We've had a lot of rain actually lately, which is nice, but this example fits for what's been happening up here. Uh, the person appears at the doorway, what? In a raincoat, the lawn's dry, the sun's out. Things aren't always as they appear. That's circumstantial evidence. It's not direct evidence. I'm going to submit to you there's no direct evidence that Mr. Molitor had intent. The intent that's going to be required. Intent wasn't brought up, specific intent to do certain things, to intimidate, coerce, affect, influence. Those are the magic words. Did this guy who sat at that witness stand, which is now moved, did he have the intent? Did he have the intent to intimidate, to threaten, to influence, to affect government or government person? Did he have that to defend it? Not Mr. Croft, not Mr. Fox. Were they on trial? It sure seemed like they're on trial. But that's not who's on trial. Mr. Molitor is on trial. He is the defendant, the defendant. I want you to think about that because I'm going to take great pains in talking about a instruction, the big instruction in this case. I do want to touch on some things that were not right that we don't agree with. Mr. Ralston's entitled to his opinion. We're looking forward to your opinions, your uh, joint collective view on this case. I think it's going to be easy for you. Eric Molitor, as you could hear from him, his own words, his genuine, honest, sincere testimony, he didn't hate government. He didn't hate law enforcement. That's, that was not accurate. You, Eric did not unite for any common cause. It was mentioned that Barry Croft was the one that got Adam Fox going. I would submit to you that it was somebody or something else that got it going. But Barry Croft did not get Adam Fox going. That's what was said in the closing. There's a list of definitions. And even if you find all these definitions to be applicable, hey, they hit the mark, they fit beyond a reasonable doubt. Even if you find all those, there's a catch-all to this entire instruction, 38.38. It's written by judges, by attorneys, experienced people. They put this language in this instruction on purpose. And it turns out in this case, it's huge. 38.38. The uh, instructions do, call, do ask that you have to find an intent. This wasn't brought up. It was smoothed over. Mr. Ralston is an excellent attorney. He's done a nice job of explaining things from his side. And it, we would submit they are, it's from a skewed opinion, a skewed 
side and biased, and that's fine. But I want you to know there's more to it. There's a complete instruction that goes all the way to the bottom. And you're going to be having that placed in front of you, read to you by Judge Hamlin. And it's your rules of the road. We want you to embrace those rules. The company that Mr. Molitor keeps, this case has been built by association. We saw how many clips by Fox and Croft. Why? Killed by association. Look at the company he keeps. We saw his mother testify. His family's been here. Lane Lunsford testified. Eric lives with his mother and his children. He did back in 2020. Criticizing Eric's testimony flies in the face, face of the truth. You folks got to see him for what he is. He's a unique person, but he's an honest person. And his testimony was honest and forthright. Mr. Toth, just to point through, I'm going to run through a few things. I'm going to be jumping all over. This entire case is full of rabbit holes. I'm trying to put it in one order. It has for me been impossible. I think it was impossible for the prosecutor how they had this one agent for seven, eight days on the stand trying to keep this thing straight. It's too much to ask for him or his organization. But Mr. Toth came in. He talked about crazy Pete and crazy Joe. Uh, about Boog and all that. Uh, and, you know, that's their OPSEC. This is kind of representative of the OPSEC of what's going on here in this case. There's no OPSEC. These guys didn't have any operation security. It's just a catchword they use. It's a catchword. So there's no OPSEC here. There was no OPSEC with any of the things that happened throughout this case. That word will be thrown out there. And I want you to consider what OPSEC was going on. There was an, an implication that Eric lied on the stand. I take offense to that. I, I take, would ask you to use your judgment if that person was a liar or not. Or was he providing true testimony? He found out Adam Fox in June. He liked his ideology. He talked about it. There's no proof they're going behind the scenes. There's implications in the accusations, assumptions, all that circumstantial evidence. Guess what? It's, the sun's out. My lawn's dry. It's not raining. They have to prove their case. They have this high standard and they haven't hit it. I'll get to that. But Mr. Molitor was at one point behind Adam Fox. There's nothing that says he's talking anything crazy in June. He's 100% behind it. His ideology, his thinking, uh, that it's okay to, to be prepared, to be a prepper, to be organized in case something happens. Adam Fox was talking to other people about 200 people to attack the Capitol. Did this guy ever have 200 people? Did he have one behind him? They never trained, that little June Facebook page never trained for anything, never got together one time. So on June 6th, uh, when Eric says, hey, do you wanna, we are gonna get ready, know anything, what's going on? You know, they're going to riots, they're going to protests, they're, they're doing security. Cities are burning, police are overrun. Maybe it's not everyday thinking that we would not do this. With, there's a group of people, a group of Americans willing to stand up for others, protect others, protect and help police. This guy is not a police hater. Eric, Eric stuck around. He had his reasons. Uh, he was going to go to the police if this was serious. He's still trying to figure it out on October 1st. Well, not Adam. Dan was reaching out to him. I think Mr. Alston misspoke, but either way, Dan reached out to him and started to 
after 30 days after the ride, come back to him. Why would he come back to him? He didn't have enough evidence is what I would submit. He's trying to dig up more so he gets him into communication. Eric thinks, hey, this is my chance to find out. I'm going to play this guy. He testified about this. He gave you the answers. He answered your questions. He answered Mr. Ralston's questions perfectly. He didn't lay a glove on Eric Molitor. Didn't lay a finger on him. You saw him right here. He did a wonderful job. He even answered my confusing questions well. Think about that. How anyone could go through that process and do so very well. So on October 1st, Eric explained his communication with Dan. All these tapes have cut out. They're getting cutting them off. Some of this is what I'm going to say later, but they played them again in the opening. His gear was for training and competitions. He took the stand and put all the pictures that the police had up there in front of you so he could describe and explain everything. It's not raining outside. They put an M4 rifle up there today, or at least they called it an M4. That happens to be an illegal weapon, not, not a legal weapon. He didn't have an M4. Misrepresentation, a stretch, a reach. They put an M4 on there for you. That's not a legal weapon. That's not what he had. He had no illegal weapons. He had nothing illegal in his house. There's nothing charged there. He, he did things legally in his home to protect his family, his children. And, you know, they can play these shortcuts all they want about Dan's this and that. It's actually legal in America. We have a First Amendment right. Oh, my God, people talking about Donald Trump. Joe Biden, think about all the things people have said that aren't very nice. It's probably not right, but that's how people have become because of our political setting in this country. People have a right in, in America to say bad or mean things. That doesn't mean he provided material support or resources. It's, you know, it's just shown to you to inflame you, to upset you, put it aside. People are allowed to say those things. It's not a factor. It's not motive. There's no motive from that table in this chair that he sat at right there shown whatsoever. None. He bought a $600. You know, he's working. He just got done working that day. He puts in an order. He doesn't pay $600 and have it come the next day as if, hey, we're going to go uh, storm the Capitol. He makes four, I'm assuming, $150 payments. The thing shows up in September. Big hurry to get it. And just because the coincidence of he just worked, he made good money with Sam Riley. The guy orders his plate carriers, which he used. He never asked for any attack timeline. Everything is one-sided coming out of the state. And I would submit to you unfair. And I'll get to more of those things. Going to Bel Air, going to Detroit. The day before the ride, he's being told he's going to Detroit, maybe. You can imagine what's going on down there. Disruption, citizens out of control. That's when they were doing riot stuff. And even Adam was doing it. We, we will uh, go through our exhibits here in a second. Most of them, not all. Adam did, by the way, call this thing a toy. There was a person that called it a toy thing didn't work. He showed it to them on August 29th. He held it up to a phone. This thing doesn't work very well. He told them that. You have to hold it right there. Showed them how to do it that day. I don't know why he went back on that Saturday to show them again how it worked because he brought it himself to the training. He didn't give it to them. They didn't use it for the ride, for the meeting on the explosives, for the circle of trust. I think Adam said it was for Meetings. What meetings? Eric's never gone to a meeting. It never got used at a meeting. The thing was a piece of junk. You'll figure out that the FBI didn't test it, didn't bring in an expert and say, here's what it does. They have all those resources. You've seen the case here 
David versus Goliath. That's what this is. Government versus a defendant that is fighting for his life, his freedom, his innocence. They put up a couple of uh, out of context on the ride up. They put two little things right. One was set on the ride up, one set on the ride back. Looks like they happened again at the same time. We already went through that once. And they did it again in closing. So Eric has no motive. He had no intent. I'm going to settle down here and get back to where I was going to be. Uh, the statute is for count one is providing material support, requires intent. Facts have not been shown that Eric had any intent to harm, coerce, intimidate, influence. It came out clearly in his testimony. He's waited three years. He's lived with this over his head for three years. The false publicity. You saw who he is. Is that, a, is that an extremist? Is that an anti-governmental extremist? That, but he, he's made it. He got to present his case to you. I'd ask you to put a lot of weight on his testimony. It's a game changer in this case. This this uh, statute requires knowingly and knowing. I brought that up before at the beginning. Your ground rules are going to be a little different because it's, it's it's an instruction. I'm going to give you the bottom part of this instruction. I'm, I bolded some things. I've uh, put yellow on them. Those won't be there when you get them back, but I'm showing you where this is in the instruction because it applies to Eric and they put it in there on purpose. So if someone doesn't have a certain level of intent to do specific things, they're not guilty. It's like the eggs in the cake. Mr. Cyber brought up over and over. Got to have the elements. We talked about the elements. If one's not there, it's not guilty. That's what we have here. One, two, or three eggs are missing here. So it's the heart and crux of Eric's defense. There's basically two elements in count one. Again, count one is guilty. Count two is automatic. Eric admitted he had a gun on him, lives with the gun, sleeps with the gun, has it with him, had no plans to use it. Just his way of life, self-defense, ready to protect himself at any moment and or others. This is not a person who would harm others. I'm going to explain to you why the prosecution is not given su sufficient evidence to show these two elements. I'm going to start off with these definitions, which again, even if you find these definitions, it's not going to matter because at the bottom of that instruction, it clears Eric based on his testimony, his believable words. So let's, let's talk about whether Eric did anything in Antrim County with any intent and that whether there are any steps elsewhere to move something forward in Antrim County. We believe the state's case has serious weaknesses there. First question is, did he do anything material? Did you hear the mountain of evidence? Did you see the 200, 300, whatever they were, exhibits that just kept coming on in, mostly about, not about Mr. Molitor, it must have been enlightening. Finally, here comes Mr. Molitor after whatever, days of, oh my goodness, just an onslaught of outside evidence. Finally, okay, here it comes. We're gonna sit up. I saw you guys sitting up. Good, thank you for paying attention and putting up with the days that we've been here. But he's, he's a speck on a piece of paper in this thing. It's not material at all. So what did he do, his minimal actions? He took one video. I guess maybe now is a good time to go through my exhibits. If, uh, Harris would mind popping those up. I'm just starting with it. A, and I'll go quickly through these. And thanks for bearing with me. This is the Mackinac Island. There's 21 pictures. I want you to think about if we just pull one of those pictures out. Let's say we have 21 videos, which is almost what we have, or pictures. We don't really know how many Adam saw because they weren't found in his phone for some reason. 
I submit to you was in Dan's phone and it didn't get searched, but Adam looked for pictures. He had them. There's 21. You can just slide through quickly if you wouldn't mind. Agent Harris, uh, you say we took one of those out. Did they lose anything? These were the pictures handed over to Mr. <coughs> Mr. Dangerous, Mr. Adam Fox, who is an extremely dangerous person. The FBI used that as a investigative tool. You can go as fast as you need to. They're on my, they're in the computer. You've seen it before. They're very thorough, the front, back, walkways, padlocks. Not just a little drive-by picture with the video that's fleeting that was matched up by Adam's videos, Adam's picture, the still frame that they gave you, which by the way, had it been still framed a few seconds earlier, would have shown her side door. They made sure to not show that to you. There was more to that picture. We'll get to that. But here's Mackinac Island. This is the governor's residence. And for whatever reason, which is inconsistent with what they're accusing Eric of doing, they handed it right over to Adam Fox. Thank you. I think that's enough. I appreciate the work there, Adam, uh, Agent Harris. Maybe we could just see Adam Fox's B. So note that had that been stopped a little earlier, you would have seen And right there, that's your front door on the side. That was fleeting when Eric took the picture, but had that been stopped just a second earlier, you'd see that door. It's behind Dan's hand. So look, that's the, I believe, taken from a video, a still frame. That's what they had. That's all they needed. Look at that beautiful blue picture of the uh, with the blue side. And that's the cottage. So next, please. Um, yeah, those video clips, maybe just a couple of those. That's good enough. So any of those would show the side of the house that was blocked by Dan's hand and show what they needed, what I thought they needed until Agent Impla said, that picture's no good. You need this, that, and the other thing. He went through a long list of things you would actually need well beyond a picture. I'll get back to that. Fox, uh, uh, realtor.com, number D rather. Here's the pictures that Adam was looking at, come to find out. Just, uh, if you could flip through those. Inside out, front, there's the lakeside. Lake. Okay, that's that. Those are a slew of pictures as well. I'm not counting them, but I'm going to guess they're 10 to 15 or so that are available that we know of. F, which is a Facebook exchange that we put in here. Maybe just a quick close up of each. Yes. So you went to GR today. I'm, I'm about to come down and help protect ship. Next, thank you. 
and protected the entire Michigan Avenue. Good shit. This was going on. Let's see the date. Six one. Five days before that six six June clip that was shown. A lot of clips, by the way, are out of context, and I hope that these aren't. But I think that shows that these. If you look good shit, man, I don't know how physical shit got in Lansing, but just our presence, our presence, peaceful presence in Muskegon stopped the, you know what, from rioting. There's a good reason for people to do things like this. We might not understand it, but keep in mind 2020, what was going on in June, three months into COVID. Uh, let's go to the Molitor chat again, please. Uh, no, on E, quickly. Exhibit E. Okay, here he is going down to dro drop off his children. He's going to look at hotels and motels. We've heard this. This is the run-up. Maybe the next high-profile vacation house. Again, circumstantial evidence proving nothing. Next page. He's got another guy. He was going to bring another guy to help. Okay, we may get pulled to Detroit. Next, please. I mean, if they're going to a high profile vacation house, is it in Detroit? Okay from Eric, uh, security and OPSEC as far as watching out for the Antifa and the Black Lives Matter groups or whomever was protesting that summer was something he did and was happy to help his fellow citizen. Next would be a complete FAFO, FAFO chat. This is an exhibit I put in. The state put in one that was shortened. I put in the longer one so you'd see the context. There was more statements said. Air monitors on the on the chain, but he's working at Menards. His phone blew up. He said he had a hundred chats on it and didn't read it. That's page one, page two, please. Thank you very much. And there's just a little bit at the bottom. Okay, maybe kidnapping's the wrong word. Snatch and grab. It just ends with looks like Mark on it. Next is the audio clip. You do not need to play. It'll say August 29th, 2020. That's at Eric's house. He's getting picked up thinking he's going to scope out a high profile vacation home related to Antifa or Black Lives Matter. And that's, it's at five minutes to six, basically, when they show up and knock at the door. If you want to hear that part, you can hear it all two minutes. And it's 17 minutes. So at five minutes and 17 minutes, that's what we played to you. 17, he came out and said, oh, look at my new toy, my new device, my RF detector. Doesn't work very well. You got to hold it right over the phone. Hey, that would be really cool to bring to the FTX that was already scheduled that Eric knew, uh, never knew it was for this, any any untoward or illegal purpose, if it, if it were. So that audio clip's there. Um, I, we skipped J, but I, K, and L, these are the interview clips. So I do want you to play those again, to the extended versions. I'll get back to that, but they're in there. We also gave you the transcripts. So you can see the regular, here's what the state gave us. You guys went home on a Tuesday, I think it was, four o'clock. <coughs> the tapes were looked at and they were wholly out of context. Those are here, the real McCoy, you got to hear the next day, the difference of what they played you, the state, the FBI played you versus the entire clip and the false impression that would leave you with at least three of these tapes and how unfair that was to present that kind of evidence. So there's no exhibit M. August 23rd, I believe this is a chat with uh, N. Uh, okay, this is just more of going to do security at cities, trying to do the right thing. That's August 23rd. That's six days before the trip. There's still 
if you could hit the next page, Agent Harris. Thank you so much, by the way, again. If you want to go tomorrow, oops, sorry. Starting in Lansing, well, I want to go to Lansing. You can meet me there. The app offers to have them go to the VAC Shack. This is what they're talking about. What is the plan? I already do area sweeps at certain locations, as well as a local group who patrols. What's that have to do with some kind of thing with Adam Fox <coughs> and the implication that's being given here? That's six days before August 29th. My guy's working with his civil defense force that was taken over by a retired deputy. It's all being taken out of context. Fix Fox text communications. Oh, this is basically Sean Fix getting a hold uh, on the way up telling F Fox, hey, here's where the cottage is, I guess. They also sent the oath up, which my guy refused to take, wouldn't become a lieutenant, wouldn't want to patch in. They claimed that he was in a militia on June 6th. This is in August 29th, and they're still trying to get him to patch in. So I'm not sure how he's in a militia, but these things show just what Mr. Fix was saying to Mr. Fox. Um, you could zip through PQR. That's Mr. Molitor's gear. At least one of those, maybe two, were not his gear. They're Ethan Grossier's. Mr. Grossier's lost his gear out of this. And Eric, by the way, sat down with you and shared details of each and every one of these photos. There's, you're not going to see an M4 in this group of pictures. One with the Marine book. I think all of that was Ethan's, except that was Eric's defensive book. So, continues on. What are we on? That's kind of light. If the light's good, maybe we're almost done. Maybe we'll get through this. So, Okay, T, you're going to see V here. That's going to be Mark's drawing of the campsite. We actually have a have a big uh, piece of white paper that will be going back with you, but that's just for convenience to refer. Hey, that's V. Please remember that. W, X, Y, Z, those are the extended clips from his Michigan State Police interview. Mr. Ralston attempted to impeach Mr. Molitor by, hey, we're going to, pull out some of your tape clips and play them for the jury. They did it again. They cut them short. They gave the wrong impression to you of what he's saying. And he fully explained those clips, by the way, on cross-examination. As they're uh, driving up on the 29th, Eric gets picked up. He figures out Adam's kind of crazy. He's saying crazy things in the car. Eric doesn't know what to do. He goes along with him. He does exactly what the agents were trained to do. Don't give yourself up. Don't draw suspicion. Play along. Play a part. He did that. He explained that to you. But they drove up there, uh, and as they're driving up, uh, Adam's looking through his phone. It's interesting they don't have Adam's phone records for what he searched. Eric did a dead-end search. He looked for a few things. He looked up cabin, uh, governor's cabin, um, boat controversy. He was just looking things up to go along with it because they tasked him. He was tasked by Adam, help us look this up. So he did a few things. He didn't find anything. He didn't give them any information. He was hoping, as he testified, that it was in Mackinac Island, that they were way off. And I think that's what he found was at Mackinac Island, but they never went to the same things Eric went to to show you what he got. And when it came to let's look at uh, Adam's phone, no records. I would submit to you that was Dan's phone that he used. 
because it doesn't make sense. They found videos on Adam's phone. Why did they? Be, why could they extract the same little extractions, the search up, you know, history that they found in Eric's phone? So, if he opened it up at the restaurant, I think it would show that one of those search things at the restaurant. So they went by twice. Uh, the pictures were taken. Um, they went to a tavern. Eric puts his weapon in the trunk. He's doing what he thinks is the right thing. He goes in. He doesn't say a word. Did you hear one tape of them at the tavern? One tape where Eric was, they would, they would have played it for you if they had it. They go where he sat there and engaged them. Adam Fox is out with his phone. He's looking up Google. He looked up Google on the way up. He looked up Zillow, according to the agent's testimony. It turns out Dan says he was on Realtor.com, and he told Agent Impel of that. Why did that come out on direct testimony from Agent Impel? He said Zillow. He was Realtor with all these pictures, and Dan knew that. Dan had the app, so did Adam. They had the app. We don't get that from the state. There's holes in the state's case. We've tried actually to fill them. It's typically not the case. Usually there's a big picture put out. The defense attorneys are doing what we do, which is try to poke holes in, in the evidence. We've had to bring evidence in for you on this case. We want you to see the entire picture. Eric Molitor wants you to see that. He wanted you to hear him out. We don't want anything hidden. We sat over there and agreed to 99% until it, the out of context became so clear. Bring the evidence in. Eric's got an explanation to everything. I didn't ask him every single question. I think you got the gist of it. The guy's an honest person. and His testimony was honest. So Eric sees uh, Adam with his device out on the way back. So at the, at the, ca at the tavern, no, no discussion at all. They go back one more time down and back. Eric says, get the F out of here at one point. He doesn't want to be there. Get the F out of there. So, yeah, he took a video and he told you why. And you saw the emotion in his eyes when he said why he did it, to get home to his kids. He wanted to just get home. That's what's going through his head. He's not thinking, oh, my God, I'm intending to coerce, intimidate, threaten, a fat government. This guy's thinking, I'm getting out of here. Is, that, is Adam even sincere about this? He thought he was at that point. He was hoping he was joking. He had a high level of concern, and it got relaxed. Dan's rolling his eyes on the back way. He's starting to think, oh, maybe this isn't what it just happened. Mm -hmm. Well, he took that video. He doesn't have an intent to do that to any government or any governmental official. He's trying to get out of this mess. So he didn't say a word at the tavern. Sat there silently. They wrote it up with the police departments. Adam knew where the police departments were. It came out that Ty Garbin knew that Adam knew about the departments by his proffer. It came out that Amanda Fox, Adam's girlfriend, knew. Heck, the Wilfrey Watchman had a picture way back when. They had been looking at Elk Rapids for months, the Watchmen were. Eric's not a Wolverine Watchman. Not a bit. They been. They knew. They already knew. They must have. So Eric, Eric goes along, he's saying some things because he's trying to fit in, not draw suspicion to himself. He wants to get home. So he said things to go along with him. He said things on October 1st, 30 days later, when Dan gets a hold of him to, to try to find out what he wants. But he did say some things. Is that material support when they already knew about police departments? The guy wrote right on the map. It's two and a half, three minutes away, whatever. 20 minutes next police department. Adam had that information. He had it from several sources and anything Eric said that's been brought up was not material. So the other things, uh, the picture, I think cameras, security alarms, schematics, lighting, questions, scheduling, whatever. It's a lot of lists of things from uh, Agent Impala that he talked about that would be needed in a picture was not gonna be that big of a deal. These pictures, by the way, again, for the 10th time, were all over the darn internet and all over people's hands already that were involved. This was an amphibious plan. 
he never took a picture on the uh, lakeside. Speaking of lakeside, uh, by the time they got to the boat launch, Eric stayed back. Do you think they would have a tape with him to play that he's there listening, talking to these guys, hiding behind a sign or whatever he did? The guy stood back by a truck. Dan's testimony was not credible. I'll get into that. But his either his memory's bad or he, whatever, he's not a good witness. He claimed Eric was right by them. He would have been in pictures. Eric was not by him. There's no tape they've played to you that says that. And they, when they have tapes, boy, do they play them. <coughs> they don't have any tapes of Eric other than he's talking to Adam. Hey, man, that's great. I love what you're talking about. All random general stuff, nothing specific. We don't have any tapes on Eric. So uh, Adam found the address. He had the pictures. They went to the tavern. Nothing was said. They go down to the lodge. He stays back. <coughs> He's obviously not into this thing, and Adam's got to be picking this up by now. He used Adam's phone too. Adam turned around and gave him that phone, by the way. And it's important that you know, Eric didn't set it on slow motion. Adam did, and he put him in a very tight spot. That was not Eric's phone. Eric did not provide material support. Didn't provide it, it's not material. And we're looking at that first. So it's not personnel, it's not surveillance, it's not any of these assets or intangible or expert services because there's no intention. He's got to have the intention to move the needle on government. And you knew from watching him, the guy who was supposedly a medic who went to a medical class to try to help people is now being painted in very dark, false light by the state that he had none of those intentions. If he doesn't have that intention to provide material support, that element, it goes away. They can talk about persons being a person all they want, but he had no intent to help. Surveillance, he's stuck in the back seat of a car, told to take a video or Eric didn't know what, what would happen. He, he explained himself, related physical assets, if that's the RF device, it didn't do a bit of good. They didn't take it to those meetings. I told you all about that, but the RF device didn't do anything. Blew up on a kid's phone that was holding it right over it when they walked in, and apparently it went off on Jenny P, who had the device, not Eric. What you do, put her phone back in the car and stay all day long. And she was not outed as an informant, which she was. She went to the explosive meeting that day at five o'clock. Wow, the RF device really did a lot there. They told her to put the phone back. And that was it. And it wasn't Eric. When Eric brought it there, he doesn't know what they're doing at the FTX. They don't have the lick of proof. Again, no tapes, no meetings, no training for the governor. Nothing at that thing. It's routine. They've got a house of cards here that's going to fall. And the RF device is part of that. Exhibit H at his house. What did he say outside? Please check that out. That's at the 17 minute mark on that tape. Five days after. Five days after the ride. And Adam sent... Dan a text or a chat, and guess who doesn't remember? I don't remember. Dan doesn't remember anything on cross-examination. I don't remember. I don't remember. Five days after that, Adam's writing, okay, barricade, I don't think we'll be down for the more extreme shit. September 3rd, five days after August 29th, Adam's figured it out. And we, we know who Adam is. He's right telling the guy, barricade's not going to do anything. He's not part of this. Do not count on him. He will not be down for that. That was not an exhibit. That came out of Agent Impala. He admitted that and brought that testimony in. The next day, Dan's writing, this came in too, to Adam, hey, will he be the driver? Let's talk to him on the FTX day. Guess who didn't remember that either? How could you not remember that the guy was not down for any extreme shit? How could you not remember that, Mr. CHS Dan? My goodness, that counts him out. 
He knows why he got a hold of him a month later. This is important. This is just the starting point. It just, I guess we can call that circumstantial evidence as well. This is part of, and I don't want you to take it out of context because a lot of things happen. This is the back bottom part of the instruction. <laughs> It's what I've been talking about. It's what I'd ask you to look at. You can hang your hat on this thing. This is the, these are the rules. And it's in the last 48 words. You can start at the end and count backwards. It's in the 38.38. Uh, it's the second element. It's the one they don't have. Guaranteed. You'll find that after deliberating. Michigan Criminal Jury Instruction 38.38, last 48 words. I've highlighted, you won't see that, and there's actually nothing bolded, but I put highlights. You must decide whether the crime would have been dangerous to human life. And it's just about that. And this is not to take anything out of context. This thing is long, but they put it in there at the bottom for a reason. You must decide whether the crime would have been dangerous to human life, kidnapping and murder, are going to fall in that category. If that's what, well, let's just assume it is. And here's the key part. Because every place else, they're always providing something to somebody. The guy's giving them something. But here, when they give, if they did give, you have to decide whether the defendant, I should have put Eric Molitor right in there. He's the defendant. Each one of these defendants is separate. The court's going to instruct you to not consider any one case as to the other. They're all separately considered. This one I'd ask you to consider for Mr. Molitor. You must decide whether the defendant, Molitor, intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population or intended to influence or affect the conduct of government or a unit of government through intimidation or coercion by committing, committing this felony. I mean, you can commit this felony if you don't have that. Not guilty. <coughs> The egg is missing. That egg is out of there. Your cake's not working. Everything we talked about, element, element, element. This is part of the second element, and I would submit to you it's the most important part. We put it in there for a darn good reason. Because if somebody did give something, maybe they were forced, maybe they were pressured, maybe they wanted to get home and didn't know what the bleep to do when somebody take a video of the governor's cottage. What do you do? You, you heard what he did, the defendant. You go to Eric Molitor on this. You don't think Adam Fox or Croft. That's the names you're going to see in the instructions as they provided material support to Adam Fox or Croft. Even if he did, and if you find those definitions fit, so what? We're down to the bottom. You heard his testimony. You have to find, and there's a lot of stuff before this, and I'm not taking this out of context. I'm just trying to draw your attention to the bottom 48 the last 48 words of that instruction. They weren't talked to you about in Mr. Alston's book. He probably doesn't want emphasis on it. I want all of your attention to this because you heard Mr. Molitor talk. You heard him testify. You heard him answer questions about the ride, about the RF, about the training that he thought was routine. The kid, Call him a kid. Maybe he's got some arrested development. Maybe he smokes too much marijuana or did. That doesn't make him guilty of this crime. It's not a good thing to do probably for him, but he did also have something else and that was a sincere love of fellow citizens, citizenship, a peaceful nature. His mother testified. Lee Lunsford let you know what he knew about him. In all fairness, you shouldn't use him guilt by an innocence or guilt, guilt by association. That's not why we're here. We talked about that on day one in Bel Air High School in the auditorium. But Eric loved gear, loved training, wanted to lose weight. He stuck with Adam for a dumb reason, thinking, hey, I can be a bodybuilder like Adam. I can get better jobs. I can get training. <coughs> you know, like the guy got him a 
damn job, best job he's ever had, excuse my language, got him a job with a U.S. Marshal. He stuck around for a while and, and had almost zero contact. Yeah, he said, you don't tell anybody what happened. Did you hear about Toth? He waited four months. Amanda Keller waited four months to say anything. It's pretty obvious you want to stay the heck out of this. And Eric did. He disassociated himself as much as he could. He went to a training with 29 to 40 other people. He didn't go with Adam Fox. He did bring him the RF device. The guy had been bugging him, wrote him three times. He got him off his back. He was going to bring it anyway and show it off. These kids, they're kind of childlike. All these guys that I say play Army, nobody sees it that way from the state. But they get out. You know, Eric tried getting in the Army. He tried. He imagine that one day yesterday, it was September 11th. This guy went down and they tried to get in the military. We're all sitting here wondering what's going on in the world. This guy's going down to enlist to be in the military. He's too heavy. He doesn't make it. This is a guy with citizenship, with a family and uh, a love for government. He's been painted in the bad publicity and had to live under this. This is his chance. Trained with Lane 12 times. None of that came up. He was a very good witness, by the way. And, and can you imagine coming into this trial with this publicity and willing to do that for your friend? What kind of person does that? His mom took the stand. So Eric Molitor never went to one meeting, just Dublin, Cambria, all these things. Grand Rapids, Peeble, Peebles, Bellevue, New Muni, Fluther. No meetings through this entire, I'll call it umbrella because I want you to see how big this thing is. It went back to Crazy Joe and Pete at Mug and Box, which apparently is a convenience store down in Jackson area. But that's how far this umbrella reached. It's far reaching. It's a long landscape. We got as much evidence as we could to show you how big this was and how small one little video and an RF device at one random training that didn't do anything is being thrown in Eric's face. And you got to get back to this defendant. Did he intend? Coerce. Influence effect. They lose. This is a not guilty. That's a correct, accurate, fair, just verdict. And you can hang your hat on this thing. It's the last 48 words. 38.3 is the charge, material, support, or resources. It's got, it's very confusing because the two elements are two and three. And three's got kind of multiple things in it. So just the one says you're charged with blah, blah, blah. That's one. That's not an element. The elements start in two, and the elements have those de definitions. I would submit to you that none of these de definitions work because they've not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt that this kind of intent, they want to separate the intent out and just say, look at, the, look at, there's an asset, asset done. Is it an asset or is it a material asset or was it done with intention to move the needle on government, a governmental unit? So that is not a trick. Uh, that's not a trick like we saw in other things in this case. Those are the words, they're not highlighted. There's no yellow. But I'd ask you to take a moment and take a long time to look at this entire instruction. I did talk about OPSEC. OPSEC, I mean, the mics, the videos, all the pictures taken at these trainings. We get to see all this video. The OPSEC, Dan's moved up either two weeks or two months, depending on how you want to look at it. He's moved up to second in command. Didn't, didn't think it was appropriate to be a commander. He was a listening post. The picture they keep showing of Barry Croft, there's 29 to 40, 30 to 40 people at a training, and they do a stop action video, crop out the outside, and make Eric, oh, he bumped into this guy. Come on. How unfair is that to take a picture, guilt by association? 
camera trickery that's symbolic of what the state's doing here to you. There were important meetings on the training at five o'clock, explosive Saturday, Sunday, circle of trust, no Eric, no invite, no acknowledge of it, wasn't there. I mean, why would they bring him back the second week? He'd been there before, two weeks ago, in the daytime. These guys drove around the lake, they couldn't find it. They never found this place. You can hear them on the tape. We must have gone by it. They don't have them at the governor's place. They didn't even find it. It's so poorly organized. And, and Eric said, he did say on the way back, and you need to know this, it was not when Agent Impala said it was. He made a mistake, timestamp, typo. Oh my God, he's four and a half hours off. Eric said, yeah, yeah, I'm in, as long as you don't do stupid shit and it's professionally planned, something like that, okay? Five days later, we're back to this. Barricade, don't count on him for any stupid shit. They knew it was a no. This guy was non-committal. I'm gonna say yes or no. He did tell him no as to be a lieutenant though. But the other thing seemed a little more serious. He wanted no, no harm to himself. They knew where he lived, knows where his mom was. So keep in mind, five days later, Dan's writing that to Adam. And that Dan can't remember this. I wanted him to patch in as well. That actually happened on the way up. But it did, the comment about are you in or out in the mission didn't happen one minute after Adam said, blow up the boat. How after three years, the FBI couldn't have their evidence right. Day one, basically, they come in here. You know, I, I'm sorry, I had to interrupt. I didn't want this going into your head. And they doubled down under sworn testimony. That's when it happened. And it's not a typo. It's not a, a time stamp. It's a colossal mistake. They thought all this time, he, at one minute after getting in the car, that he said that. He said, I'll be in it as long as there's no, but no, he's four and a half hours later. This was after all this happened and Eric's freaking out and just getting his butt out of there. They're four and a half hours off. How can they be that far off? Part of it is this poor gentleman, Agent Impla, has been tasked to do all of this case in court, and, and he has a partner uh, and had help, but it's too much. They, they don't have a handle on the facts of this case. They have a handle on the accusations, the implications, the assertions, but they don't have the facts. And this guy, he felt right out coming out of the gate, right off the bat. Any other witness would give zero credibility to the man, do not trust. Yeah, I'm not gonna go that far. This guy worked hard on the case, but it's too much. He, he presented some things that was wrong. There's some other issues. So I, I question their knowledge and their presentation. When they come in and they're that far off and under sworn testimony, double down, come back after lunch. Mr. Barnett, Mr. Molitor's side was right. We made a big mistake. Not fair. So first week of, uh, I better jump around a little bit here, but first week in October, governor, I mean, Mr. Uh, Fox went down now. He just wants her arrested because the executive orders were set aside by the Supreme Court. Everything's calming down. The watchmen are breaking up. Mr. Barry Croft is out driving a truck in uh, New Jersey at a Wawa station. He's a truck driver, just like Dan was a truck driver. Good for them. Dan didn't work for the post office. He didn't take a loss on his house. He got paid $54,000. Claimed $5,000 for his income. Sold his house for 200,000, bought it for about 186 or so. Maybe he did have to pay closing costs. 
Look how much he got paid. And he went along with this to be a listening post to go on where he did in this case. He, he took that responsibility. And when my client first heard what Dan did, he, he, in an interview that wasn't shown to you, but he did testify about it, the Eric Van Dusen tapes, we'll call them. He said he had respect for Dan. Dan did the right thing. He had his reasons later. And he said them right on the stand. I'm not going to get into it right now, but you remember he didn't like Dan in the end. It's America. You can say bad things. You probably shouldn't. But he had his opinion. And he's honest about his opinion. He's honest about everything. Honest about steroids. He's honest to this jury. He was honest in that interview. So in October, that's when Dan came back. That's when they were arrested. Free gear for Eric Molitor. Wouldn't you think the guy would hop in a car with Adam again? Nope. Didn't do it. Said he was going to. Said he had no money for free gear. That sounds weird. Free beer, Buffalo Wild Wings. No, Eric. Actions speak louder than words. Eric was duped by Adam Fox. He duped on the ride. Used him for a job connection. This video meant nothing, folks. The RF device meant nothing. You didn't see Eric going to anything to do with the watchman. I guess they did come to one. One training, Caleb Franks, Ty Garvin, Brandon Caserta, those are just some names. Daniel Harris ran the medical tent. There's no expert services going on. Eric's walking around with his bag in case someone gets hurt. And we can look at what others did on both sides of the ledger. Uh, this, look at the evidence on Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Virginia, Delaware. All of these states got brought up in the last three to four weeks. A huge pile of evidence on unrelated individuals. Look at how big this allegedly was. Where do you put little Eric Molitor with no, he's innocent and he had no intent. He has been in transparent. Gave him the password to his phone when he was arrested. They showed up, pointed guns at kids and his family. Gave them the phone, password, let them search through his car. He's shocked he's arrested. Usually when you do a crime like a B and E or a drunk driving third offense, a larceny, you know you're doing the crime. He didn't know that. He doesn't think he didn't know he's doing a crime because this defendant didn't intend any of this. He got put in a tight spot. Wouldn't you know you're doing a crime? So he's he's giving multiple interviews, by the way. I think he said three or four. But they pull one interview out, give you the clips again. <sighs> one thing they didn't do, and this is another problem with this investigation, they never sat down and listened to Eric Molitor before they arrested him. They want to make a big splash, come with guns blazing. No interview. Don't you go ask the guy. What the bleep's going on here? You need to answer some questions. Hey, there's some, this looks a little fishy. Can we hear your side of it? Isn't this how an investigation should work? You go interview the accused. These guys didn't do that. They don't take his side of this ever once. They committed, they arrested, there's publicity, there's politics, it's a, it's a big deal. Do you think they're gonna walk it back all of a sudden? No, they're in here pulling everything they can, stretching, reaching, misrepresenting facts, and asking you to convict an innocent man. They made a huge mistake. You interview the accused. Agent and Paula, I mentioned he didn't bring up Realtor.com. Mark, Dan, and Red, they all had significant impeachment issues. They're the best of the best. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, the highest law enforcement, the backbone of our country with law enforcement. And that's what we've seen here. They did, either didn't know the case facts or they simply have forgotten them. Key oversights, 
This case was a puzzle. You tried to put those four witnesses, the agent's testimony together, didn't fit. There's no puzzle there. Mark, Mark had his issues. He couldn't remember what Eric was wearing. He testified a year before, conveniently or coincidentally, September 1st. He said he didn't remember what he's wearing. He said he saw him once. He comes in here, I saw him twice. Second time he's wearing uh, play carriers. Not credible, not believable. He struggled on cross. These guys did great on direct examination to get him into cross. They struggled, Eric didn't, the agents did. They didn't answer our questions, they evaded. They didn't know, they don't know. Compare that to Eric. Dan, Dan testified. Dan, I asked him about spearheading made a prior statement and testimony, said he wasn't spearheading the plan, whether he was or not, it's not really relevant right here. We're looking at Eric. I went over, got some prior testimony, showed it to him, voila. And I could have done that with a book that I had, but I did one thing just to show you. This guy doesn't remember what happened. He said, he, he looks at it, okay, I was spearheading. Okay, and he testified to that before. He gave different testimony. He was not credible. He had memory issues. The poor guy had a head injury. Bless his heart. But the, the uh, testimony of Dan was bad. We got into Red. Red was asked about leading the training at Luther. This because there was prior testimony. Took a little break. Sounded like he was not going to go that direction. Comes back, yes, he was leading. And actually, Dan was leading, and Red assisted him. I asked him if Dan was leading. We took a break. Came back, Dan was leading. And I don't think it was going to be the answer we were going to hear in the short little bit that he said before the break. So there's people that didn't testify here that. It's too bad they didn't. Adam Fox would have answered questions. Barry Croft would have. Uh, Jenny P. Steve. All those guys would have given some information here. To Chambers, who's the partner, didn't testify. They stuck with one agent, and uh, I would say he overworked the poor guy. And then he was not able to pull this off without a major, major problem or more. They put too much on his plate. Did you notice that he didn't do as well? He's a very good direct witness on cross-examination. Even their best professional couldn't answer the questions. Tried. Didn't tell us about things that happened that I believe he knew because Dan said he Dan said he told him. We heard about Mr. Toth, who came in five. On uh, a Friday, I'll call him the blueberry farmer. He's from Muggin. Muggin Bobs, nice guy, kind of a waste of our time. Other than, yeah, he's talking about Crazy Pete, these guys with no OPSEC, talking in the convenience store. <clears throat> this is how far this went. This is how small Mr. Molitor and his little device, toy, contraption, and a short video that's been duplicated 10 to 15 times over is in this big picture. And this nice guy who didn't provide anything as to material support or resources, again, indicated he didn't come forward. They have a story, I say that about ghost guns. Ghost guns are homemade weapons. You would think if somebody starts, like Ty Garvin starts ordering ghost guns one after another, these are do-it-yourself guns at home. That's not why they arrested them right then. That's not why. It's an October reason to splash, and they wanted to splash. That's why they didn't interview anybody. They put publicity over someone's rights in a fair investigation. So a manufacturer on ghost guns, I would submit to you, would come forward. Ty Garvin ordered 20 weapons and was trying to raise money 
by putting them all together and selling them. Selling them to who? Not, that's just not believable. You have three very nice, heroic people. All these officers are. Trooper Darren Green, MSB Houghton Lake Post Commander Scott McManus, El Cravis Chief of Police, great people. Did one of them give you any information about any of these defendants? I have to stick with Eric, but Eric Molitor, did they say anything about here's material support or resources? I get it. Both attorneys let each other play, put their case up. They put a face on some people. I happen to know Mr. McManus, my best friend trained in, in Cadillac 22 years ago. They're great people. All of them were. They don't provide material resources or support. My best, one of my best friends is a retired state trooper, trained the guy. They're good people. But they didn't really add anything to the case about material resource or support. Should they answer this thing? That comes out of Eric's mouth, his witness, his testimony, his body language, his emotion. That was, I would submit, not necessary to have in this trial that went for more than it should. We're working on four weeks. But I commend the uh, the people that did testify. And, and the clock did kind of run out of honest at the end. Something really bad happened in this case, not in the facts, not before the arrest, in the trial. There's a guy back there, his name's Eric Van Dusen. He's a freelance journalist. I told my client, don't you dare say a word to anybody. We wait till the trial, and that's when we testify. That didn't happen. He went through two years of a living hell and said, I'm speaking up for myself. He's done. And he went and did an interview for three and a half hours with the guy, got released the day before the jury pick, just for context, two and a half hours of it, two hours and whatever. So we're all getting ready for the trial. I'm waiting, watching my client's statement for the first time. It's fine. I didn't go, I wasn't there, but he got interviewed. And mid-trial, here comes five clips or so out of the blue. We played, they were played, they were entered as exhibits. And you folks need to know those tapes were purposefully edited, edited to mislead you. Pull the wool over your eyes. They were short, abbreviated, out of context, video clips, cutting off Eric Molitor in mid-sentence, giving you false impressions as to his statements. And somehow the defense team, which you're looking at, went back and listened. Oh my God, got longer, expanded tapes, brought them in the next day. Why would the government do this? Why are they putting on a tape that's shortened with Eric's mouth wide open? I could put a picture on the screen up there if you needed to to show his mouth wide open, cut off mid-sentence. And that's the evidence they're presenting to you. Why would they go to that level? Why? Because their case is weak. They got a great lawyer who's presenting it, making it, man, this sounds great, this is believable. And then a tactic like this is done in a trial. In this trial, kind of, a national thing, kind of a big spectacle, and you guys have worked through this and kept it within the four walls, and I commend you for that. Nobody knows what's going on here if they're not following it on whatever. You followed it. You heard those tapes. You went home thinking, man, I mean, I'm sure you had thoughts that weren't good. But you got here the next morning by 11 o'clock, and we're playing the expanded tapes. We're matching them back and forth. Stunning that this kind of out of context evidence, it throws into question all of the te testimony, all of the exhibits they have. Were they out of context? Were they out of order? Were they put out to mislead? This was to mislead you, why? It kills their credibility in the case and deserves the merits in the trial where we're thinking this you might think defense attorneys pull this crap excuse my language 
as we're sitting in Bel Air, hey, we're going to have a good trial. Everybody's fair and impartial. We're going to see evidence. It's going to be the big picture. And then the defense attorneys will come in and try to poke holes, make it Swiss cheese, and make it look funny. No, coming from the state. Thank goodness rules of evidence allow expanded tapes, and someone had the ability to at least bring back audio. This didn't happen once. It actually, it happened today again. I thought it was tripling down three times, three strikes. They used the Michigan State Police. They've used these clips over and over and don't get it. Why? Why do they need to give a false impression if they have such a strong case? Something is not right there. And you were witnesses to that. And I appreciate the looks on some of your faces because I was there too with you. It's, uh, I want you heard the answers. Yeah, I knew what they were doing. I, I knew what I was doing. I'm taking a video. I'm not stupid. I just wanted to get home to be with my kids. I just wanted to get home. They cut that part off. I gave you the exhibits. I, L, K. All three of them were cut off to mislead. We want straightforward evidence. Three strikes, I think. We're on four now as of today. You get three strikes, you're out. They should be throwing fastballs right down the middle. They should have hard evidence. These are curveballs, sinkers, change-ups, knuckleballs. Why are we getting evidence from that, of that nature from the state? Purposefully putting Eric in a false light. And then they, he says bad words. Let's cut those off, too. Let's just throw that in the mix. How unfair was that? Trials are supposed to be a search for the truth. Did we get there? How did we get there? The truth is Eric showed powerful emotions when he testified. He made his case for you. He makes this easy. You add that up, his testimony. You look at this. Is there an attention? You got to look at the word defendant because it's a little weird there. And it even says at the bottom, you can flip it, commit the felony. Can you imagine that? You commit the felony, but as long as you didn't intend to influence or affect the conduct of government or a unit of government through intimidation or coercion, while you're committing this felony, you're not guilty. You must decide whether the crime would have been bad to human life. We've already gone through that whether the defendant intended to intimidate or coerce the civilian population. No, not on the RF device, not in any statements, not on the ride, but he intended to influence. He didn't get that far. Barricade is not to be counted on. Nor is Dan's testimony. Look at KT, K L T I T. Those are the transcripts to see how rotten it was to put that kind of thing in this trial. Of all trials, we had a lot of out of context evidence, a lot of things. I mean, we showed you the Mackinac Island, the video clips, the realtor. We emphasized Eric's <coughs> thoughts about ELM and Antifa. We uh, told you about him protecting cities, told him about, about working for a marshal, not for the Pinkerton security. Why does this keep coming up? They don't want to have a connection to the U.S. Marshal. We gave you a complete exhibit. We've got some exhibit. We brought things in to fill holes. So you know what the picture is as much as possible. Think of that. And thank God he took that video with Eric Van Dusen and blew off my advice. Look how it was used as a tool here. I say tool in the nicest way. Eric is uh, presumed innocent. We talked about that. Until they have the burden to prove him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. We feel the missteps are bad. We feel that the intent here with all that language, can everybody see that? That's not an exhibit. Nor was my other one. This is for 
I'll call it monster purposes, demonstrative purposes. I just throw these out so you'll see something. This is our budget, by the way. And uh, the other one is the barricade. It's not down for any extreme shit. Just two things to look at, to think about. This thing is the killer of the case. It ends it. If you trusted Eric Molitor's sworn testimony. So keep an eye on this and the strangest thing at the bottom, which is committing this felony. So even if you did, again, find the definitions. I just, I don't, I've not seen anything like that before in any case, but that's in the instruction that is written by judges and lawyers and the committee that makes these things. And it's something you cannot cut off. It won't be bolded, it won't have yellow on it. You just have to go look at the bottom. You can look at the whole thing. You, should, you have to look at every instruction and follow them. There's the court rules. So, did the prosecution, prosecution prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Eric Molitor intended to do all those things on that list? The high standard of proof. It's the second element. Again, it's the cake that Mr. Cyber, I know he brought it up several times here. He's the one that Mr. Lindsay always did all the shades. Kept putting his hands behind Mike. This man's innocent. We got all those principles out right off the bat that every element has to be there. It's been, this case has been a loser for the state since the day this arrest happened because they didn't interview Mr. Molitor. They didn't take his side. They were shocked probably to see him testify the way he did. And they're putting the guns on him as far as uh, the, the heat at the end. And I think it should be looked at in a very dim light what the state's done here. They didn't complete an investigation. Then we get in this trial and we get one-sided stuff, just to say a nice word. But the last 48 words, you can count them back. They all have importance. That whole instruction has importance. Again, when count one is not guilty, count two is automatically not guilty because no felony. It's not guilty of that first felony. It's a necessary part of the recipe. And who would have thought Mr. Cypher's comments at the beginning would fit so well? Because that's what it comes down to. There's short one egg or two eggs or three. The cake's not working. There are two unsupported, unsupported charges. Eric is, well, I need to stop for just one second. Tell you and acknowledge the gravity of these offenses Eric was accused of and the importance of preventing terrorism. We all agree on the importance of ensuring safety for all citizens, but convicting an innocent man, an innocent person or woman based on insufficient evidence does not make us safer. The evidence is insufficient. Mr. Molitor is a human being. He's likable, a son, father, a hard worker. He's a peaceful, nonviolent person. He has great citizenship qualities. This all weighs heavily also for reasonable doubt. We brought character in. We bring character in. They can throw arrows. There were no arrows to throw. He actually voted. He votes. You know who he voted for. Took an EMT class. But couldn't pass it. So imagine how he must have been feeling on that ride when he's getting pulled in by Adam, citizen Adam, getting duped, that he wanted to get home to his children, his mother. Imagine the impact of Eric, for Eric and on Eric, of a potential wrongful conviction on Eric's life and that of his two children. He's waited three years to this day. He's waited three years to tell the FBI. There's been some comments about a statement that Agent Impor said. So I'll kind of incorporate it, but he has waited to tell you, tell the FBI, the prosecution, the court, everybody in the public, the facts do matter and that they do get in the way of a good story. This thing just became a good story. They couldn't back out of, they're here pulling these shortcuts to try to get somebody convicted, an innocent person. And the impact of that needs to be 
considered. There was an interview made in Wisconsin by Agent Impala, supposed to be for somebody wanting to kill Dan. Turns out it was for way more for weapons, 501c3, whatever. I don't know that they've been straightforward with this case either. They're not forthcoming on everything. Why am I putting evidence in? Evident, you know, lawyers like to hide in the corner with the client and hope something doesn't come in. Eric has known he's been innocent. He's innocent in his heart. So don't get distracted by the definitions and that they're the be all, do all. Eric did nothing material. It doesn't fit in any of the categories you've just seen on the screen. You'll see him again. And the bottom line, he did had none, absolutely no uh, intent. You can circle that part when you get in there. I want you to. And think about these words. The defendant. It's not anyone else but Eric Molitor. you got to look at his intent. Usually, well, I do want to talk about venue real quickly. Venue. What do you do here? He took a duplicate video, not material, not intended for this. We're not even in Antrim County. We shouldn't be here. Lake County is where Luther is. Cadillac, we did smoke some marijuana that apparently didn't smell to Mark when he got back in the car. Didn't do anything in Wexford. And at Luther, he went to a routine training, let his buddy, who probably is half nuts, use his RF device. For what? Nothing. Not material. So these are the reasons you will be required, I believe, after you evaluate the facts under the laws and rules of the state of Michigan, including this instruction to find Eric Molitor not guilty. There's no intent, there's no venue, not material. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence presented does not meet the high standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We ask that you uphold the principles of our justice system and find Eric Molitor not guilty on count one, reach that verdict, be proud of that because it matches the evidence and count two, which is just a follow up as a felony. If he's guilty, he is not guilty of this. He's an innocent man. He's proven that to you from that chair that's now hiding behind that table. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Barnett, would you mind taking that down? Just yes. Thank you. Just the, you can leave the uh, easel up just that down. Thank you. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're obviously bringing lunch in for you today. Given the nature of where we are in the case, uh, I know I've let you go out for walks and things like that before at lunch. Uh, that today, um, given that that's a change in what we've been doing, if somebody had uh, an errand that they were planning on running or something like that, uh, I understand why you would have been planning that. Just send out a note, uh, and we can certainly make a case by case basis if it's important enough, kind of thing. Um, and so, you would be required to stay in the jury room during your lunch, uh, which I said will be provided to you. Uh, also, I, I think it was just a word slippage, but I, I did want to clear up one thing. Uh, it was indicated to you relative to an M4. Uh, you've heard um, AR-15, AR-style weapons, M4, M16. Those are all phrasings that you have heard. There's nothing inherently illegal about uh, possessing or owning an M16, an M4, as I would call it. I, I think the civilian designation is an AR-15. Uh, the M4 just has different barrel length than uh, what would be the M16, uh, but there's nothing inherently uh, illegal about owning that firearm. I think there was just a, a word mix up on that one. Okay, uh, I did want to cover those, uh, but other than that, uh, if you could be ready to go uh, at two o'clock, okay, hour and a half, um, we'll come back at two o'clock, okay? All rise for the jury. <laughs> Uh, the door is closed. The record can reflect the jury is outside the courtroom. Uh, we will be back at 2 o'clock. Like I said, um, I'll go around the room in just a second. Just a couple of things that I uh, am going to cover. Um, I, I would ask the attorneys in any future closings to avoid phrasing like fighting for their freedom or fighting for his freedom uh, in the court's mind. That implicates possible penalty. Uh, so I would ask uh, that that be avoided. Uh, please also don't reference that uh, if somebody is not convicted of count one, 
that they are automatically not guilty of count two. The instruction includes uh, language to the contrary for that. Uh, additionally, um, I am going to amend the media order uh, that I've given and the instructions that I've given. Um, while certainly in the building, um, official proceedings can be uh, recorded and uh, displayed both by video and audio as we've been doing. Uh, what I am going to prohibit is uh, any video recording uh, or still photography of the outside of the building uh, or the parking lot area. Um, and so uh, that may not be recorded or photographed. Uh, I'll lift the order once we're concluded for the day uh, and everybody has departed because I know obviously the news has been broadcasting from on campus. Uh, so that'll be lifted, but that's just during the duration while the jurors are present in the building. Okay. Um, that was all I had. Anything else for anybody? Mr. Ralston, let me start with you. No, sir. Mr. Nunzio? Uh, we have nothing further. We have no objection to the court's instruction. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sider? I'm ready to go with nothing. I'm good. Oh, okay. Uh, Mr. Barnett? Nothing. No, okay. Uh, we'll be in recess then until 2 o'clock.
Okay, everyone can be seated. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everyone had a nice lunch. Uh, if you recall, we're uh, in the process of closing arguments. Mr. Nunzio is next on behalf of uh, William Null. Mr. Nunzio. Thank you, Your Honor. Counsel, uh, agents, Mr. Rolston, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for listening and thank you for your uh, undivided and committed attention to this matter. Um, you know, in the beginning of the case, co-counsel had gotten up here and we were talking about the period of time between 2015 and 2020. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, that was a, it was a sad time in our American history. It really was. You know, there were riots, police shootings. I mean, cities were burning. I mean, think about that in our lifetime. There were police stand downs. And those stand downs, ladies and gentlemen, were because if the police did anything, there'd be more rioting, there'd be more problems. And so police departments, city officials, politicians, they had to make decisions, tough decisions regarding what to do. Uh, you know, and then the onset of George Floyd, Kenosha, you know, it, it just sent the country in this kind of goofy spiral. It, it was just, it was crazy. People were afraid to come out of their homes. Cities were clearing out. People were moving. They're still moving out of cities right now as we speak. Police departments, there was the demand to defund the police departments. Um... Bail reform was hitting the, the country. People were getting arrested and going back out on the streets. Then COVID hits. This virus comes into town. You know, we're back to restrictions. Loved ones are separated. Businesses are shutting down. Barbers are getting arrested because they're, 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 they're wearing masks and they're running their businesses. In fact, some of them were even being jailed. People who weren't wearing masks were being accused of killing people. Healthy and unhealthy people were dying in mass numbers. And if you recall, alcoholism, suicide, drug use going right through the roof. People were hoarding food, toilet paper, water. We waited and waited. We were told it was just going to be a short time. But because we didn't know how to deal with this since 1918, more than 100 years ago, we were just getting bits and pieces of when this tragedy, this nightmare was going to be over in our country. No one really knew how to deal with COVID. It's an experience, hopefully, that we'll never have to relive again. And if you recall, people were purchasing guns and ammo like it was going out of sight. But as American people, we have a terrific resilience to respond, to repair, to forget, and move on. It's our spirit. That's what makes us the people we are today. But unfortunately, our country is divided. People get canceled for expressing their views. In fact, it's still going on today that PTA moms and dads are getting thrown out of meetings, school meetings, being placed on domestic terrorists, because they disagree with school officials and teachers. We are at the advent of a new time and unfortunately began during this period of time. Can you imagine moms and dads just going to school meetings because they disagree with officials about what's going on in the schools? 
You know, but as a uh, civilized society, we are governed by the rule of law. Make no mistake. And let me be perfectly clear about this. We cannot support, permit, allow, or tolerate our public officials being terrorized. Absolutely not. This also implies to law enforcement. It's criminal. It can never be tolerated. And those who commit these acts have to be held accountable. That's just how it has to work. Because if we're going to maintain a free and democracy-driven constitutional republic, our laws need to be supported or else we will fall apart. You know, reasonable people can agree to disagree. The defense obviously disagrees with the theories and the case by the state of Michigan. My learned colleague, Mr. Ralston and the FBI agents sitting here today. These are good people, but we agree to disagree. We don't get canceled for it. We go through the legal process and we try to do it in a civilized manner. And we do. That's why you're here. That's why the judge is here. That's why this process is protected the way it is, so that you, the people, can make the decision. Because even though we can agree to disagree, you have to agree on a verdict. That's where the rubber meets the road. You have to agree on a verdict. It has to be unanimous. The judge is going to instruct you on that. Twelve of you will have to come up with a verdict. And let me be perfectly clear about this, so that there is no misunderstanding. The FBI and law enforcement is not on trial. They are not on trial. Agents Red, Mark, the informants, they were embedded in these events to uncover the plan, a plan that was discovered, discovered to go after the governor. They were rightly embedded, or none. When I mention their names, I mention, I'm going to mention their names in the course of how events took place. Because those are the facts. We learn those facts, the testimony of the witnesses, the evidence that came through on the witness stand. But make no mistake, the agents, the informants, and the FBI is not on trial. Because this case has got to be about the facts. Today, it's your job, or when you decide, whether or not the state has proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. It's as simple as that. Now, I say simple. We're going to unpack things here because sometimes it's not so simple, especially when you have complicated cases with lots of information, hundreds of exhibits, and obviously disagreements that the defense has with the state, the prosecution. Now, in the beginning of the case, we, you know, we heard two things. That you are judged by the company you keep. I think Mr. Rolson had said that. Simply meaning you are guilty by merely associating with bad characters, not by your conduct. You are judged by the company you keep. And we also heard actions speak louder than words. Except there's kind of been a reversal of fortune on that phrase in Mr. Ralston's closing statement. Now, words speak louder than actions. And we'll address that. We'll address that. 
Because when actions speak louder than words, I want you to examine, look, to see how Bill Null acted. What did he do? What did he say? As opposed to some of the words he used. Now, when you go through cases like this, you have to be wary of distractions. You have to be wary of misdirections. Okay? And the uh, concept behind this is simply just keeping your eyes on the ball. Now, what do I mean by distraction? Something that draws your attention away from something you're looking at. Kind of gets confusing, but it draws your attention away. A misdirection is an attempt for you to subconsciously accept something as true that is not true. A sign that has been misplaced directing you to go left instead of going right. In fact, the misdirection as applied to the facts can you lead you to the wrong conclusion, and that's what we don't want happening here today. Let me give you some examples so you understand what I'm talking about in regards to misdirections. Prosecutor said that Bill and Mike had a gun on the car ride up north on the early morning hours or the late hours of the 12th and the 13th of September. He said it up here a little while ago. They had a gun. These guys always carry guns. There was no proof from anyone that Bill and Mike Null had a gun. None of the undercover agents or the informants testified that they saw these two gentlemen with the gun on the car right up. Nothing. Zero. No evidence. It was a statement, and because the state said it, you're supposed to accept that it's true. No evidence. They have to prove each and every element. And the guns are important, because we have a felony firearm charge attached to this case. Not to mention the plan to further what Adam Fox and Barry Croft were doing to terrorize the Michigan governor. In fact, the evidence was to the contrary because Mike uh, Bill got up on the stand and he said, I didn't have a gun. When I drink, I, I put it in my glove box. And he wasn't in his car, he was in Mark's car. Another misdirection by way of example. The Null brothers were committed to Adam Fox. They bring value, their muscle. Well, muscle's meaningless when you have a gun. Because a small person who's light has just as much power as a big person with the same gun. It takes out people regardless of how big you are. Don't get distracted about this whole muscle thing because they're big guys. That's, that's a distraction and that's a misdirection. The Knoll brothers, as Mr. Ralston told us a little while ago, were Adam Fox's operators. That's a misdirection, and I'm going to go into that like peeling an onion in a little while. He said that Bill and Mike Knoll were Adam Fox's operators. He used that word, operators. He warned you. Mr. Rolson did. The defense is going to get up here and they're going to say, if there are no recordings, recordings, then they're going to tell you that it doesn't exist, the conversation doesn't exist, and the best evidence is the agents or informants testifying as to what happened. Well, you know how much audio and video we've seen. But the testimony was, from Agent Impala, is that there were... 150 hours of audio and video. 
150 hours. I think our total clips, if I'm not mistaken, maybe, what, an hour at best, maybe? You know, with the advent of cell phones and recording devices, it has changed our criminal justice system. It removes the bias of the testimony from the witness stand. And what I mean by that is, it's on video, you can't change it. It's on audio, you can't change it. But if the audio isn't presented, well, it's always subject to interpretation, right? As you know, misdirections take you off path, and they are time consuming. We are in week four. And in order to get back on path, it takes more time. And if you don't get on the right path, you get lost. So it's absolutely critical to the case today to put you back on the right path. You saw pictures of Bill Knoll's guns at the house when they conducted the search warrant. Lots of weapons. You're thinking to yourself, wow, who has that many weapons? What are those weapons for? Because subconsciously you are being told that those weapons were to be used in the furtherance of Adam Fox and Barry Cross plan to terrorize the governor. That's why those weapons were placed up there. To get into your minds, these are bad people. Bad people have guns. And if you're a bad person, by association, you must be guilty of something, because why would you need all those guns? The number of guns had nothing to do with the elements in this case. Zero. Don't be distracted, don't be misdirected. Think about some of the pictures that were shown by the state in this case. They, they cropped the Knowles next to Fox, next to Molitor, because they told you, and they were trying to convince you, that Bill Knoll is best friends with Adam Fox. Well, if you see a picture of them up there next to each other, they've got to be best friends. They're in a picture together. Again, a misdirection. It's a clever way of crafting exhibits, that's all. But if I didn't bring it out, maybe some of you would subconsciously think, well, I remember seeing the picture of these guys together at Rosa Parks. So they must know each other, and if they know each other, they must be working together, and if they must be working together, Bill, Bill Lowe must know the plan. That's how that works. It is strategic. It is not done by mistake. And so the misdirection that I point out is this theme by the prosecution, and I say pushed theme, pushed on you. Best friends of Adam Fox, he knew the plan from Dublin. He's one of uh, Adam Fox's operators, and they were on board with what was going on this whole time during the summer of 2020, whole time. They were on board with the plan to attack, to kidnap, to kill the Michigan governor. And that Bill Knoll knew about the plan, was committed up until Luther, 9 12, 2020. Before we begin, let's, let's just take a look at the charges. Let's unpack that just for a moment. Now, Bill, charged, uh, Bill Knoll was charged with the crime of providing material support for an act of terrorism. 
and let me make a special note about this right now. Providing material support is not the same as participating material support. Let me give you an example. Someone could be participating in eating lunch, and it's not the same as a person providing lunch for others to eat. Participation is different than providing. And we've already heard testimony that participating by them, participating in an FTX in a, by itself with weapons, legal weapons, is not illegal. Being in a car, doing nothing, mere presence, you'll get an instruction on mere presence, not enough, not a crime. The operative word, ladies and gentlemen, is provide. First bill no provided material support in the form of personnel and or surveillance to Adam Fox and or Barry Croft. Now, we have to look at some of the words to help us decide what, the, what that means, what would actually happen. Now, we've talked about provided. Let's talk about material support in the form of personnel and or surveillance. So the material support component of this is personnel or surveillance. Judge will instruct you on the definition of personnel. It will be in the jury instructions. And it can include providing oneself. But there is no instruction on surveillance. Second, that when Bill Null provided material support to Adam Fox and or Barry Croft, he, Bill Null, knew that Adam Fox and or Barry Croft would use the support or those resources, at least in part, to plan, prepare, carry out, facilitate, or avoid apprehension for committing an act of terrorism. There's a whole lot in there. Well, there's a whole lot. And, of course, the group of people that are classified in committing an act of terrorism are United States, its citizens, Michigan, <laughs> Uh, Michigan citizens, political subdivisions, agencies of, Mich of Michigan, and local units of government. Now, an act of terrorism is committing or attempting to commit the violent felony of, in our case, murder, assault, murder, kidnapping. And its intended form is to coerce or intimidate or to influence or affect the conduct of government. Left there. So essentially, the prosecution has to prove that Bill Null knew Fox and or Croft would use the material support, that being personnel or surveillance, or those resources, at least in part, to prepare, plan, carry out, facilitate, avoid apprehension for committing an act of terrorism. So now looking at the charge instructions, applying the facts to this case, the prosecutor ha has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Bill Null provided personnel and or surveillance to Adam Croft or Barry Croft, knowing that Fox or Croft were planning and preparing to kidnap and kill the Michigan governor with the in intent to affect government, coerce or intimidate public officials. I'm asking you to use your common sense when you're analyzing this case to determine what fits and what doesn't fit with the evidence. Let's talk about reasonable doubt for a minute. The court's going to instruct you on this concept. The burden is on the prosecution to prove each and every element beyond a reasonable doubt. If they don't prove, you must find Bill Null not guilty. A reasonable doubt is a fair and honest doubt growing out of the evidence or lack of evidence. You know, you think to yourself, well, what, what does that mean? Growing out of the evidence. There's a common misconception about growing out of the evidence. 
The defense doesn't create reasonable doubt. When you look at the evidence, it's either there or not there. I don't have to create it. I can't create it because it's either there or not there. I don't produce it. That is your finding and your finding collectively. Grows out of the evidence or grows out of the lack of evidence. So let me give you some examples of growing out of the evidence. Where reasonable doubt exists, where a not guilty verdict would be appropriate. A says that B hit him, causing a bruise on his head. B says that he did not hit A. There's an additional factor. C, a witness says that B did not hit A, but rather A fell down in his head, causing a bruise. C does not know either A or B. Well, the evidence causes reasonable doubt because C, who is an unbiased third party, sees what happened and says B didn't hit A. That's reasonable doubt. Lack of evidence. Same scenario, but you don't have C. So it's A's word against B's word. Except it's been discovered that there are two videos of the incident, but for some reason, they're not brought to court. And there's really no explanation why they're not brought to court, but there are two good active videos about the incident. And a jury knows that these videos exist. So a jury's saying to itself, wait a minute, A is saying one thing, B is saying one thing, who do I believe, A or B? And someone says, wait a minute, there's some videos here. How come we didn't see the videos? I can't convict A. I mean, I can't convict B on A's word if there's video. Because without the videos, it would be reasonable to conclude that this lack of evidence creates reasonable doubt. Because you think to yourself, well, I'm not going to do anything unless I get a video. So it's reasonable to find B not guilty because reasonable doubt exists because of lack of evidence. Now, the judge is also going to give you an instruction that mere presence is not enough to convict Bill Nolan in this case. Just being there, mere presence, it's not a crime. Let's talk about the personalities relative to material support charge and their credibility or lack of credibility. Adam Fox and Barry Croft. We saw video after audio after video after audio. In fact, Mr. Olson got up here today and very nice display. These guys are terrorists. Okay. You figured that out, what, after the first time? First down? You heard their crazy rants. You saw their crazy rants and their ramblings. This is clearly undeniable. They have been labeled as dangerous, crazy, unsafe terrorists. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, you've seen more of the rants and the statements of Barry Crawford and Adam Fox than my client has. There's no proof he saw all this. You've seen more than he has. <clears throat> That's not what I'm getting at. Here's what I'm getting at. You know, prosecutors call witnesses to the stand. They put exhibits up. They put documents up. We've heard from Barry Croft and Adam Fox. And now the prosecution is telling you that these guys are terrorists, but, he, but, but they're also telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that you need to believe these two guys as credible, reliable witnesses, that they're truth tellers. Mr. Olson left that out in his closing statement. 
He wants the 12 of you to believe 100% to terrorists about what they represent, what they say. Can you imagine being told you got to believe these two terrorists? So my question to you is, how many audio clips or video clips does it take to convince you all that anybody who associates with Adam Fox or Barry Croft must be guilty? That's what they've been doing for the last three and a half weeks. Just by mere association. Why do you think we saw it just over and over and over again? Okay. To get into your minds, bad people, association, this must be guilty. Well, you know the answer to the question. Did you find Adam Fox and Barry Crow credible and reliable and trustworthy? You know, people like Adam Fox and Barry Crow, we know this throughout history. Terrorists, people who have an agenda, they use the media or media personalities to advance their agenda, to gain credibility, to simply puff up their image and to get what they want. History tells us that. This, this is not a surprise. Who became popular in the media? Who became popular to the extent that it attracted the attention of Barry Trump and Adam Fox? I mean, yeah. Don't know. So, when we talk about motive why people may lie or misrepresent things. Fox gravitated to the Knowles' popularity to make himself credible to push his agenda. That's why he was falsely bragging throughout the summer. The Knowles were on board, they're full in, they're coming to the FTX. You'd think by these messages we've seen for the last three and a half weeks, they were best friends, they met every day. And in the words of the prosecution, Bill and Mike are Fox's operators. You know, the reality is this. Fox and Croft, they never really trusted the Nulls. And we'll go over this in a minute, but they literally excluded the Nulls from a lot of activity over the summer. They kept them on the fringe. But... Fox needed some credibility with the Wolverine Watchmen. Because why would the Wolverine Watchmen deal with Adam Fox if he couldn't even bring on the Knoll Brothers, the popular media Knoll Brothers? In fact, in one of those messages, I've got the Knoll Brothers. Woo! I've got the Knoll Brothers. Prosecution told you today, and the theme's been for the last couple of weeks, especially Bill, knew about the plan from the beginning, from Dublin, June 6, 2020. Let's talk about Dublin. Many people talking there. He went down the network. You saw the text messages. Adam Fox, Barry Croft were ranting. Bill Nolan was talking about communications. He testified that he was mainly talking with Brian Henna. and remembers the rants, but not all of it. If Bill Nolan was agreeing to the violence, he would have stated so, and the prosecution would have marched him clip after clip after clip. There were no clips. And there were people there with listening devices. Bill Null testified that the meeting was two hours long. And he agreed to the communications portion because he told you, he testified. And we all know this. 
that Facebook was canceling people because of their views. This is, this is something that everybody knows. And it was happening to him in particular. Because at the time, remember, the riots, the, the interruption of free speech, the interruption of the Internet, it was tilting in a direction we had never seen before. If Bill Null were on board and in completely, as the prosecution wants you to believe, then why wouldn't he be at all of these key meetings over the summer? Either demanding to go, inviting to go. Why, why wouldn't he be at these key meetings? If he's on board, if he's an operator, why isn't he there? 618, 2020, 12 days after Dublin. Meeting between Adam Fox and the Wolverine Watchman at the Capitol. 620, 2020, meeting between Adam Fox and Wolverine Watchman. Remember, you heard audio clips from this meeting. 618, 620, Bill no, not there. 628-2020, the attack planning meeting and the FTX with the old ring watchman. Not there. July 3rd, 2020, back check meeting with undercover federal agent Mark and Adam Fox. Bill no, not there. July 7th, 2020, meeting with Wolverine Watchman at Paul Beller's house. Bill no, not there. July 11th. 2020, and I'm making specific reference to the meeting at Dino's Diner that evening. Through testimony, we learned that there was a planning meeting at Dino's Diner at night. Fox, Croft, Bellar, Garvin, Franks, Harris, Concerta, and C.H. Dan. Bill Null, Mike Null, not there. 718 2020 People's Ohio meeting. The intended purpose for this meeting, as I understood it, was to finalize plans for the mission. Fox, Harris, Barry Croft, no Bill Null. 727 2020 Meeting between Adam Fox and the Wolverine Watchman. Remember, Adam Fox is desperately wanting the Wolverine Watchman. He's desperate. And he just he just can't get them on board yet. And he, he uses the nulls. Hey, listen, I got the nulls. That's why he keeps having these meetings with these guys, because they're not, I don't think they're taking them seriously at this point in time. You know, guy who lives in the basement, a small commercial building, that you have to get down there by way of a trap door, no bathroom, he's got to go across the street. Why would the Wolverine Watchman take these guys seriously? Think about it. August 1st, 2020, the Sean Fix Roundtable meeting in Bell Bellevue. This was an important meeting. Bill Null was not there. Because the meeting discussed narrowing down the three targets. Remember, we had the island, Lansing, Birch Lake. This was narrowing them down. And this comes after one of the agents sent Fox those photos that you saw during Mr. Barnett's clothes, not the island, those surveillance photos. So they're narrowing it down. They're talking about the feasibility of the attack plan of the three targets. And this is where Sean Fix offers Black Hawk helicopter and a conics box, you know, one of those big shipping containers of weapons. I mean, this was serious meeting. Fox, Fix, you see Mark, Keller, and Fix's wife were at this meeting. 912, the Luther, and I'm talking about the explosives meeting, I think it was put on by UC Red, where he showed videos. Bill Null, Michael, not there. Okay, so you say to yourself, okay, so 
They didn't go to all these meetings. What does that mean? Well, they were never informed about what took place on those meetings or else you would have seen it up on the wall. Never commented, never inquired, never brought in, verbally, nothing, zero. And he'd have you believe, all on board, full-time operator. And they have been pushing, and I, I just don't get it. That a meeting took place on June 30th of 2020. They just keep pushing because they have nothing else. Remember, this terrorist, they want you to believe, made some contact with Bill Mo. No proof, not a shred of evidence that a meeting took place on 630. Nothing. Zero. And again, Adam Fox was, his motivation to lie about the Nulls. He just started talking with Wolverine Watchmen, and he definitely wanted to be this big-time pound-on-the-chest leader. Exhibit 78, Dan, CHS Dan told Fox, how many people the Wolverine Watchmen had, and Dan is pressuring Fox on how many people Fox can bring. And he's just getting pressure, you know, to get more people. Fox responds that he has the Michigan Liberty Militia on board. Well, this is eight. This is what? Eight one? Oh, this is 630. Not even close to Bill Mo being on board. Never on board. And what do we know about the Michigan Liberty Militia? They had a large media following. And here's a... The Wolverine Washington, too, were popular. They were pretty well-known, too. So Adam Fox is trying to get both sides to bolst, you know, bolster him up so that he can do what he wants to do. You heard him. You know, at that point in time, I think Adam Fox was playing, you know, whose horse is bigger? He had to make good on his promise to Dan about bringing MLM on board. So he lied about the meeting of Bill Moore. Bill testified that he was not there, and he was certain that he was not there. There is no evidence contradicting that, other than the paper case that the prosecutor has put up on the board from a terrorist that you're supposed to accept, hands down. Okay, so we have these meetings. He didn't go. There's no information. 829, the daytime surveillance. Bill Null's not there. If Bill Null knew about the plan and was fully on board, why did Fox invite him? If he's an operator and he is such muscle with this other guy, Michael, why wasn't the big man in daytime invited? Because I think he kept him at a distance. Why did he keep him at a distance? He kept on associating with cops, politicians, and even at one point in time, sent Adam Fox phone numbers to sheriffs. This is the last thing that Adam Fox wanted. He didn't trust this guy. He didn't trust Mike Nall. He was using them. Terrorists use people. Bill Knoll ever communicated about what happened during the daytime surveillance? Zero. Remember? The operator? The muscle? You have to tell your muscle operator what happened? No. Because he wasn't an operator. And he wasn't his muscle. What does common sense tell you about the term personnel? Well, the jury instruction we know says one thing. It doesn't say participate. And therefore, a person who's merely participating is not guilty. It only makes sense that in order to be personnel, you'd have to be working, in my opinion, under 
and for somebody at the direction, control of Adam Fox or Barry Crown. So, Bill Null would have had to have provided himself to Adam Fox or Bill Null in a subservient employee management style activity. Now you think to yourself, well, where's, where, where's Mr. Nunzio getting this from? I'll explain it in a moment. Now, obviously it means more than just showing up. Bill no, Mike no, they weren't XOs. They weren't commanding officers. They ran their own Michigan militia. Adam Fox and or Barry Croft. Well, let's look at what we know about this management style that Adam Fox and Barry Croft had done. Sean Fix. He was Adam Fox's XL, and he swore an oath to Adam Fox. He was actively participating in and planning. He hosted meetings and discussed the feasibility of the plan at the Fix Roundtable. Fix told people that he specialized in military expertise, Air Gova, Black Hawk helicopter, Conex box of weapons. He did all this all the while, knowing Adam Fox's plan with the intent for Adam, Fox, Adam Fox's plan to go through. Now, to compare and contrast Sean Fix, Sean Fix certainly would be guilty, right, of material support by providing himself as Adam Fox XO as personnel in a leadership style employer supervisory role to Adam Fox. Let's talk about the operators. Adam Fox's operators, Special Agent Impala, referred to the faithful chat as the operator's chat. He ID'd the very people who were on the faithful chat. He identified, and we learned that, Daniel Harris was on the chat, CHS Dan, Adam Fox, Caleb Franks, Paul Bellar, UC Mark, and Sean Fix. Not Bill Noll, not Mike Noll. Let me repeat those names, and there's a reason I'm repeating them, not to waste any more time. Daniel Harris, CHS Dan, Adam Fox, Caleb Franks, Paul Bellar, UC Mark, and Sean Fix. And again, remember, the federal agents, the undercovers, were embedded to disclose and uncover what was going on, okay? <coughs> Adam Fox's operators are his personnel. How do we know this? Let's look at what these individuals did to make them Adam Fox's personnel. Well, Ty Garvin, he hosted the Luther, the Luther FTX. What were Ty Garvin and Caleb Franks doing the Luther FTX? They were posting on the FAFO chat. And let's look at this, 163, Ty Garvin was posting on FAFO wire of the shoot house he and himself put up. He he himself put up. Exhibit 164 from Dan Harris of completing the shooting range, which was posted on FAFA. Exhibit 165, the video of Caleb Franks. Uh, I think it was taken of Ty Garvin setting up the property for the Luther FTX. 166, <laughs> Ty Garvin posted the FTX training schedule. Now this is important. They posted the training schedule on Faithful Chat. All of Adam Fox's operators, the ones I mentioned, the ones I repeated twice, knew the Luther FTX schedule before him. But that'll be important in just a moment. It was no coincidence, and let me repeat myself, it was no coincidence that Adam Fox's operators led the Luther FTX trainings and stations. The medical station, Dan Harris ran the medical station. 
the shoot house. CHS Dan ran the shoot house station. Weapons manipulation ran by Caleb Franks. That was the weapons manipulation station. It should be no shock that the operators, Adam Fox's operators, ran the stations with Luther FTX. Why? Because they were Adam Fox's personnel. They were in Fayfall, they were at the meetings. But yet, prosecution wants you to believe the team, the team, the operators, and they were his personnel. Let's compare and contrast Ty Garman. He'd be guilty of material support because he was providing himself as an employee to Adam Fox because he knew the plan, set up his property for the trainings, set up the sh shoot house, and are you ready? He used a bright light device for the signal car on their surveillance ride. This is important because now we have people, we have personnel, we have the operators running stations, and now they're on a surveillance and they're bringing items with them. For bright light. We know that was, we do know now what that was used for. Ty Garvin's actions demonstrated that he was under the direction and control of Adam Fox, which is the key to being personnel. Let's talk about Dan Harris. He too would be guilty of support, material support to Adam Fox and or Barry Crock because he acted as and in an employee-like fashion because he knew Adam Fox's plan and assisted Ty Garvin in setting up the Luther property for the FTX. He taught and ran the medical training at the Luther FTX, and he helped Barry Croft, remember the picture? He helped Barry Croft make the explosives in Cambria at the FTX. Caleb Franks. He's guilty of material support as personnel to Adam Fox in an employee-like fashion because he knew Adam Fox's plan and ran the weapons manipulation at the Luther FTX. He helped Ty Garvin set up the Luther property for the FTX. You also heard testimony produced by the prosecution where CHS Dan said that Adam Fox had the infamous kill squad and identified who in the kill squad, who was in the kill squad. CHS Dan testified that the kill squad was himself, remember, federal agent doing his job, or informant rather, Dan Harris, Caleb Franks, Ty Garbin, Adam Fox, <coughs> Brandon Caserta, Sean Fix. That was the kill squad. Bill Noll, Mike Noll, not part of the kill squad. Now, these are, <coughs> by common sense dictates, were the very people involved in the planning, preparation, carrying out, and facilitating and avoiding apprehension of Adam Fox's plan to kidnap and kill the governor. Now, let me make a special note. Even up until now, the, the embedded, you see Mark read, I think uh, Mr. Olson calls him 10. I think in the diagrams, he's Red and Tim are the same person, okay? I don't want you to be confused about that. I don't think Mr. Ralston meant to confuse you. I think he was just being courteous to Tim, if that's his first real name. Um, but it, they're embedded. They have recording devices, and they're doing their jobs. But to compare and contrast why Bill Moll did not provide himself as personnel, there was no testimony or evidence that Bill Null availed himself in an employee-like employee fashion to Adam Fox and Baron Croft. Bill Null was not an XO, a commander of Adam Fox or Barry Croft. Bill Null did not manage or supervise under the direction or control of Adam Fox or Barry Croft. He wasn't on faithful chat. He wasn't at all these meetings. He didn't run any of the stations. So let's talk about why Bill Null is not guilty of material support, providing himself with personnel. 
Now, there are some misdirections concerning Bill Null at the Cambria FTX. The Cambria, of course, the prosecution wants you to believe that Bill Null knew Adam Fox's plan, participated in the FTX in order to plan, carry out, prepare Adam Fox's plan to kidnap and harm the government. <coughs> the evidence does not support this theory, and here's why. There was no evidence or testimony presented that Bill Null knew Adam Fox's plan at the Cambria FTX. Remember, even the prosecution witness said that participating in an FTX is not a crime. Now, we've learned from their witnesses and ours, for example, that there were many people participating at the Cambria and the Luther FTX. This is critical. There were people actually running through participating in the stations at Cambria and Luther. Participating. There were a lot of people not arrested. So where is the plan being disclosed to these folks during these FTXs? So, as we've talked about earlier, for Bill Mo, no light bulb moment, no criminal act, no crime. Remember, Bill Mo, Mike Mo left before the planning meeting at Dino's Diner that night. Now, moving on to the Luther FTX. Now, testimony showed that Bill no, and he told you he didn't take Adam seriously. He didn't take any plan, any ranting seriously. He heard about the plan. But in order to be guilty of material support, not only do you have to know about the plan, but you have to move forward with that plan. You have to have the intent for the end product to take place. You have to have that. You have to. No intent, no material support, no charge, no crime. Circle of trust meeting. This is where everybody gets together. I'm 913. This is the light bulb moment, remember? Steve Robertson, the old property, come down. Jenny Plunk got the nulls. They walk down. There's this meeting. I think it's the circle of trust, I'm not sure who came up with that. It doesn't matter. But Bill Null testified that that was the moment when they started talking about explosives. And what was the game changer there? He said, Steve Robinson, the guy he trusted, the guy who said he worked with law enforcement, the guy he said was serious, was credible, started talking about Explosives. He locked eyes with Mike. <laughs> they kind of looked at each other. I'm sure it's a twin thing. I have a set of twins. I know about those twin things. But he locked eyes with his brother like, we got to get the hell out of here. This is crazy. And that's exactly what they did. After the meeting, not drawing any attention to themselves, get the kids with the young men. And Fox says, hey, where are you going? What does he tell them? Oh, my kids are hungry. I gotta, we got to get out of here. He didn't tell Adam Fox they'll be right back. I'm going to McDonald's. I'm, on, I'm all in, brother. Don't you worry about it. You keep working on those explosives. and You let me know when you're going to blow up that bridge. And we'll take out the governor's home. I'm in. None of that ever happened. Nothing. That's the light bulb moment. So we've talked about the summit, the meetings he didn't go to, <coughs> nor he was an invited, we talked about that, never went, and there was no follow-up what the meetings were about. He was never communicated with anybody, including Adam Fox and Barry Croft, 
hey, you missed this meeting, but we want to fill you in, either on some type of encrypted chat or by any other means. So there was some testimony that Bill Null was invited to go on a recon. And at one point agreed, however, Bill testified that, you know, Fox was upset about the restrictions and was just rambling and ranting, and he didn't take it seriously. In fact, I think Bill Null testified he too was upset. In fact, in one of the messages, he's agreeing to stuff and he's saying stuff, but then he's talking about, you know, you know fighting his government, you know, fighting his local city council, the city hall with ordinances. He's not going down to city hall in Berry County with guns ablazing. He's using a legal process. A legal process that he tried to get Adam Fox to join in. Hey, listen, you got some problems. Here's some uh, numbers of sheriffs. That must have scared the hell out of Adam Fox. He's like, who is this guy? I'm not going to bring him in on any of this. Special known in uh, defendants, no, 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 exhibit A, A, B, B, and C, C. If you decide to listen to it, who brings up recon in that meeting, in that interview, voluntary interview with Bill Nolan? FBI does. If you listen carefully, and I know you requested it because the sound wasn't very good, he says, car ride. That's what he said on the witness stand. So car ride was stated the day he got arrested by the FBI. That must have been a great day, huh? And almost three years later, he's saying the same thing. There's no change in testimony. They want you to believe, oh, he changed everything. No, he didn't. And if he had provided surveillance, ladies and gentlemen, you would have seen clip after clip after clip. We saw all the Molitor clips. You know, sometimes you have to give the benefit of the doubt to what people say sometimes, but then other times you say to yourself, but this just doesn't make any sense. You heard testimony that government agents and their informants were wearing recording devices. Well, who do we know were government agents and informants? Like I said, I'm just identifying them. The FBI is not on trial. Well, Roberson, right, was there. Plunk, talking about the Luther FTX. Roberson, Plunk, Dan, Red, and Mark. And on the car ride and the surveillances. By my count, that's fine. But yet, we have no evidence, nothing came in here by way of recorded evidence from at least one of five people that Adam Fox tests. With the surveillance, the lookout, not one recording. I mean, you've got all these recording devices running around. So you have to say to yourself, mysteriously, there's no recording of this event at all. Despite Mark, Reds, and C.H. Dan's hearing, but they can hear it. Why didn't the recording pick it up? And here's what the prosecution failed to show when they were up here earlier, is that there was no testimony that these devices failed, failed to pick up the recordings, or that they were not in operation at the time. Yeah, they just didn't pick them up. Again, a misdirection.
you have to ask yourselves, what's more likely? Did Adam Fox actually test Bill and Mike, or was the plan to surveil discussed earlier without the most present? Now, this would explain why there are no recordings from either CHS Dan, Mark, or Red. You know, the plan to surveil was discussed earlier without the knowledge. I mean, that's, that's the simplest explanation I can come up with. They weren't there because they weren't the operators. Let me talk about this for a moment. Well, before I get that, on August 25th of 2020, Ty Garvin created the Luther training schedule, one of the operators. And if you look closely, the training schedule has on it small game adult hide and seek. That was the surveillance. But you have to ask yourself, where was that posted? Small game, let me read, let me read that again. Small game adult hide and seek. That was the surveillance. That was code. This was posted, are you ready? On the faithful operators chat. Bill no, Mike no, not on faithful. So the surveillance had to have been discussed earlier. Because again, Brian Higgins brought a dash camera. Why would he bring a dash camera? He was on faithful, he knew about it. People are bringing devices for the surveillances. We got bright lights, we've got dash cameras. Even CHS Dan brought red, an individual, to evaluate the bridge for, expo for explosives. This was all discussed without the presence of Bill and Mike. What did the Knoll brothers bring to the surveillance? Nothing, zero. Again, no direction from Adam Fox, Barry Croft about the surveillance. <clears throat> now let's talk about the surveillance or the task of surveillance. Red ultimately, excuse, yeah, is it Mark ultimately did it? Excuse me. This plan was only designed for two cars. With all these people, two cars. The third car was an add on. So what did people do? They scrambled to get that radio to Mark's car. Mark drove. There was no direction given by either Mike or Bill. Where to go, how to go, when to go. Nothing. Even Mark told Bill how to respond on the radio. It didn't even work. He said, yeah, was, I didn't know how to work this thing. And he had back to him. But he was communicating all night long, at least for that 30 or 40 minutes, where they were driving. And ask yourselves. Where were they driving? Mark goes, I don't know, I was just driving all around. Even Red when he testified. This is this is how discombobulated this third car add-on was. Is Red described the third car? That's the spotter car. Mm -mm. No way. Messed it up. It was the signal in the spotter car driven by the other two cars. So even Red testified. Well, yeah, it was the spotter car. No, it wasn't. No, got it wrong. Let's talk about it. Okay, so they're in the car. They're driving around. Mark tells you, well, what were they doing? There's some of you folks even asked this question. Well, they were looking around. He didn't say they were looking for law enforcement. They spotted people. They were debriefed. And here's where it gets really interesting. The prosecution from the get-go has said that Adam Fox had asked him to go on the surveillance of the governor's residence. Are there any recordings or any testimony that Bill and Mike know demanded to go by the church residence? No. No inquiry? Hey, what are we doing? What's going on? What's going on with the other two cars? In fact, he testified, and there was no evidence 
what the lookout car was doing in relation to the other two cars. If this is a surveillance car, the lookout car is going to know what the other two cars are doing for purposes of looking out to warn them if suspicious law enforcement or anybody else is going to interrupt or intercept their plan. Bill, where, where are the other two? I don't know where the other two cars were. I didn't see them. How in God's name could that be a lookout car if they don't even know where the other two cars for purposes of warning them about what? And where are they in relation to the other two cars? Even the lookout guy at the bank in the car waiting for his buddy to come out after to rob the bank is outside the bank waiting for other people or police to show up so you can get, get in there and radio them and get them out of the bank. That's the classic lookout situation. They don't know where they are. He doesn't know where they are. And just of interest, <clears throat> Mr. Ralston didn't even cross-examine my client regarding the surveillance, did he? Uh -uh. Why not? In his opinion, if he's lying, I'll just get some more lies out. Convince you all he's lying. He didn't touch it because he couldn't. Because we already exposed it with their witnesses. That's why he didn't go there. Remember, when lawyers make decisions, 90% of the time, maybe 99% of the time, it is 100% strategic. If Adam Fox had tasked Bill Mueller with this lookout job, the surveillance job, as one of his operators, as one of his muscle men, no recordings, no tape, no testimony from Adam Fox to him. Hey, how's you know how the surveillance go last night? What'd you guys see? Is it a good plan? Did you see any lights? We're going to be able to make the uh, amphibious assault from uh, the North Boat Launch. Zero, ladies and gentlemen, zero. No debriefing. Even when they got back to the Red Bull, nobody comes up to him. There's no recording. There's nothing. Hey, how go? What you guys see? We need to know. You know? We're advancing this plan. Kill and kidnap the governor. We need to know if this is good. Zero, nothing. By design. I don't know whose design, but that was by design. Not to question him or Mike. There were no further requests, requests for recon. There was even no follow-up back in camp. Okay, it's a long night. Everybody gets back. Maybe you want to have a couple beers. But certainly, a circle of trust. You would have heard someone say, hey, Bill, let that recon thing go last night. We need to know. Because at this point in time, Bill Ball, Mike Ball, they don't know that federal agents and federal informants are there. Zero clue. Especially at the circle of trust. He trusted Steve Robinson. Now it turned out he was an informant. We get it. He would have done the same thing because at the time he didn't know he was an informant. He trusted this guy. He said he worked with law enforcement. He was serious. He's a credible guy. So he so if you say you're going to do something, but you don't do it, or it doesn't come about, in the words of my learned colleague, Mr. Ralston, actions speak louder than words. He said it. And as uh, Mike, excuse me, Bill Null test, uh, testified, and what he said to uh, FBI agents almost three years ago, it was just a car ride, exactly what it told the FBI. Yeah, they, they popped it on me. They said, you want to go for a ride? In order to provide surveillance, you must do surveillance. Mere presence is not enough. It's in the jury instructions. It's not a crime.
when Mr. Olson got up here and tried to convince you without any evidence or any proof of evidence or any testimony of evidence that Mike and Bill Moll had guns on them on the car ride, that would be having a weapon, a firearm, on your person. Okay. Which would constitute, if you believe it was, personnel or surveillance, pursuant to what we've unpacked, constitute felony crime. He didn't have the gun on him. And he certainly didn't discuss in close okay, the guns that were used at the APX in furtherance of the plan. He left that out. I imagine we're going to hear a whole lot in this final clip, which is classic. You, you, you get this much in prosecution in closing, and then in rebuttal, you get this much because they want to hear what we have to say. That's just how it worked. I probably did the same thing. But to respond to us instead of giving it to you first, they have the burden of proof, the burden of production. Participating in an FTX is not a crime. Going on what is described as surveillance when there is no surveillance ac activity is not a crime. Going on car rides are not crimes. I call it sift and separate. Sift through, or excuse me, separate and then sift through what's going on here. You know what happened, you know what's going on. I've unpacked it for you. Someone had to, because for the last three and a half weeks, holy cow, one more video? No, thank you. Somebody had to explain what was going on here, that you understand the full import of what happened. On behalf of my client, William Grant Knoll, we respectfully ask you to find him not guilty of all the charges in this case because he is not guilty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nunzio. Uh, I think given the time, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll allow Mr. Sider to Great. All right. Thank you. Great. Uh, the record can reflect the jury's out of the courtroom. Uh, let's come back at 3.30 and then we'll be going with Mr. Cypress closing.
ladies and gentlemen. Uh, take more time to talk, so that's perfect. Um, we'll continue with the opening uh, arguments this evening. Uh, Mr. Sack. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, uh, Brother Council and Social Councils. Ladies and gentlemen, you haven't heard much out of me today, maybe this last three weeks, four weeks. But uh, let's talk real for a minute. We've all got two similarities. Everybody in this room has two similarities with everybody else. Number one, we're all Americans. The second, we've all spent four weeks in this trial. It's been long. I'm exhausted. My brain hurts. Let me take a deep breath. I've written a whole bunch of notes here, but uh, there's not much to say when your client hasn't done anything wrong. Might not look like a uh, like I've done a whole lot in four weeks. I haven't crossed any witnesses. I haven't put my client Mike Nall on the stand. But no evidence or testimony uh, has gone against my client. I've had no reason to talk. I've had no reason to put Mike up here. Now, draw your attention to something real quick. You've heard the prosecution use the word lie or liar at least four times during his closing arguments. I've always found that whenever you're losing a fight or when you're losing a case, you begin to cuss or you begin to point fingers or you begin to call people names. Those are all signs that you're losing. The red, the red herrings. They're meant to make you cringe. They're a terrorist. What's your instant gut say? Oh my God. What I've found in my experience over 18 years is that good attorneys focus on the elements and they place the evidence in line with the elements of what has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. We take the set of elements, the set of cake batter, and we match the elements, the eggs, the milk, the flour, we match it to the case. And we do it beyond a reasonable doubt. That hasn't been done. You've spent four weeks, just like me, sitting in a chair listening to how Adam Fox and Captain Crunch, Barry, sit there and how awful they are. We all agree they're awful, right? But what we haven't heard is how any of the elements of the alleged crimes match any of the facts that point to Mike Knoll. Nothing. So how can you have a cake if you don't have eggs? How can you have a cake if you don't have the facts? How can you have a crime if you don't have the facts? Now, there's a few things. I'm not here to prove that Mike Knoll is innocent. Remember, Vordier? The way he sits here today, he's innocent. I don't have to prove that he's innocent. The only thing I have to prove to you or show to you or point out to you is that the state, the prosecution, has not put facts to elements. That's all I, my job is. My job is simply to show you that we have a set of elements and the state, God bless them, they haven't matched any facts, testimony, or evidence that Mike Nall is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That's my job. Simply show you. You're not being asked to find Mike guilty, Mike Nall, innocent. You're not being asked that. You're not being asked to find him innocent. Once again, the way he sits here, he's innocent. So I'm going to do a lot of comparing and contrasting here in the next 
five, 10 minutes. And my goal is, is that while you're focusing on me, we're going to be done here in 20. Okay. That's my goal. So let's start a little bit about this case. Mike Nall is presumed to be innocent. We start with that presumption for each one of these three defendants. They're all innocent. They're presumed, the presumption continues throughout the trial. It continues until the judge gives you jury instructions and gives you a charge. Mike Nall is entitled to a verdict of not guilty unless you are satisfied and can point to evidence and testimony and facts that state differently. Once again, my job, not to prove he's innocent, my job is to show you they haven't put any facts in front of you that make him guilty. Prosecution has drawn your attention to evidence and testimony, which actually proves beyond a reasonable doubt that Mike Nall basically is innocent. He hasn't engaged in any of the elements necessary to support the prosecution's story or case. The facts are so important in this matter. Now, one thing that the judge is going to do is he's going to give you a set of jury instructions that's about a quarter inch thick. The first is a jury, jury verdict form. And then he's going to give you two pages that are the counts. And we're going to go over those here in a few, but I want to draw your attention to the special jury instruction that the court up here on the stand is going to give you. He's going to say, even if the defendant knew the alleged crime was planned or was being committed, the mere fact that he was present, sitting in the car, when the crime was committed, is not enough to prove that he assisted in committing it. That is huge for defendant Mike Knoll. That is huge for my client. You haven't heard anything about what he has done because he hasn't done anything. He sat in the back of his car. So let's go through it and talk about it. Let's talk about the charges. You're going to get, as part of the packet, a whole one-page sheet that's going to tell you what the charges are. And they're going to say, first, Mike Nall provided material support in the form of personnel. The definition of the word personnel is found in the jury instructions for providing material support for an act of terrorism. Second, Mike Nall has provided material support to Adam Fox or Barry Croft, also known as Captain Crunch in my world. Okay. He knew. He had to know. that the person would use the support or the resources for at least or in part to plan, prepare, carry out, facilitate, or avoid apprehension from committing an act of terrorism. He had to know it. I've heard zero evidence, no testimony at all. We've got this big book floating around. I don't know where it's at, but let me tell you, you're going to have the big book and you're going to have a computer with it, but you're not going to find anywhere in there that Mike Nall knew about Adam Fox's plan. On the bottom, you're going to see count one and two, and then you're going to see a big paragraph. And it says an act of terrorism is committing or attempting to commit the violent felony of murder, assault. Here's the, the, the you have to know with intent. Intent is also you knew about it. To commit murder, uh, assault with intent to commit great bodily harm. And it goes through a whole litany of things. But the big things are knowledge and intentionally. I'm telling you, I listened to four weeks and I can't see where they said Mike Nall knew anything. He was asked to go on a car ride. There's been absolutely no evidence of either that Mike Nall knew or acted intentionally to provide material support to Adam Fox or Barry Croft. 
Mike Nall did not even know about Adam Fox's alleged plan to kidnap the governor of the state of Michigan or to harm law enforcement. Our time was wasted with a blueberry farmer. Great. We had other people come in. None of their information mattered when it came to Mike Knoll. We didn't have any knowledge. If you don't have any knowledge, part of the crime, it's out. All right, so I want you to focus your attention on the special jury instructions about the mere presence is insufficient, okay? Because as we go through the elements, that's gonna be huge. Just because you're present and because you didn't know about it, you can't be found guilty. So the second, the second count is possession of a firearm at the time of the commission or attempted commission of a felony. I've heard absolutely zero testimony in four weeks that Mike Nall had any type of firearm on this car ride. I did hear Bill Nall sit here and tell you we were drinking before the car ride. And as responsible gun owners, they weren't carrying their guns. That's the only testimony I've heard about a gun. We, wouldn't, we weren't carrying. We drank, we got in a car ride, we didn't have guns on us. Let's talk about Mike Knoll. Remember, every crime is made up of uh, elements and parts that make those that, that element. That element makes a crime. The cake recipe, right? You got milk, we got eggs, you don't have four eggs, you got three eggs, you're not gonna have a great cake. Prosecutor has to prove each of those elements of the crimes beyond a reasonable doubt, which means there's no doubt X, Y, Z happened. And these two counts that we have before us, we spent four weeks and there is so many conflicting stories. We're getting ready to compare and contrast. And let me tell you, when you step back and you realize it, wow. Remember, Mike, Mike Nall is not required to do anything. Mike is not guilty, and the prosecution has, to, has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Mike Nall would be guilty. And yes, He's not guilty of anything. He hasn't done anything. If he did something, we could talk about it, but there's nothing to talk about. Once again, that's why I didn't cross. I didn't cross all their witnesses. Why? They didn't hurt my client. They didn't say anything that pointed to him fulfilling any element. If they did, I would have crossed. If they did, I would have considered putting Mike Nall on the stand. Remember, you're going to be receiving a packet of instructions, which is so important for uh, my client. Even if the defendant, even if Mike Nall knew of the alleged crime that it was being planned or was being committed, the mere fact that he was present when it was committed is not enough to prove that Mike Nall assisted in committing it. You're going to get that instruction. Here in this situation, Mike Nall did not know and never was informed of any type of plan to kidnap the governor of the state of Michigan or to harm law enforcement. Just because Mike went on a car ride does not make him guilty of assisting or committing the crimes as alleged. Without proving each element beyond a reasonable doubt, Mike Nall is entitled to a uh, not guilty verdict at this time. Reasonable doubt is a fair, honest doubt growing out of the evidence or lack of evidence or testimony. All the testimony and exhibits do not support any of the necessary elements against Mike Nall. We look at count two, a gun. Nobody has said he had a gun. His brother said we were drinking. 
We didn't have any guns. And count one, providing material support, nobody can show that he knew what the purpose of the car ride was. Nobody, none of the evidence, none of the witnesses, nothing points to him having yet any kind of knowledge. Number two, he sat in the back of the car and he was quiet. He didn't provide any support. He didn't provide any material. He didn't provide any information. Now, we've talked about there's absolutely no evidence that's been admitted or demonstrated or testified to about Mike Knoll having any knowledge or providing Adam Fox or Barry Croft with anything. I apologize, I lost my place. There's been absolutely zero evidence admitted or demonstrating that Mike Knoll provided any type of material support in the form of surveillance or personnel to provide uh, material support for an act of terrorism. There's been absolutely zero evidence admitting or admitted or demonstrating that Mike Knoll knew Adam Fox or Barry Croft wanted to kidnap the governor or harm law enforcement. There's been zero evidence admitted or demonstrated other than Bill stating, we drink, we block our guns up. There's no evidence that they had a gun. There's no evidence they provided anything. There's no evidence that Mike Knoll provided Adam Fox or Barry Croft with any kind of information while on this car ride. If there were any facts, recordings, or testimony, the state would have, would have thrown it at you. They did it for four weeks. They would have given it to you. There isn't anything. I've struggled for four weeks to try to find anything I can put on Mike Knoll. There's no audio of Mike Knoll uh, having any knowledge of any alleged plan or evidence that Mike Knoll had given any evidence to Adam Fox or to Barry Croft. There's nothing. And the next morning after the car ride, when Mike heard about explosives, Mike and Bill locked eyes. They're twins. Twins have this weird relationship. I, I don't get it, but they can sense each other, and it, it's just really odd. But let me tell you, when they locked eyes, they immediately, as soon as that meeting was over, immediately went and packed up uh, their camps and got out of Luther. They didn't want anything to do with these people. Mike and Bill wanted nothing to do with Adam Fox or Barry Croft or the group from the Luther FTX. What happened here is pretty clear. Remember, the judge is going to tell you just because you were present, that doesn't make you guilty. That just says you were present. Mike and all never worked for Adam Fox. Couldn't even tell you who Barry Croft was. You heard from Bill that Barry Croft went to talk to Mike and Bill said, I'm over here. And all of a sudden, Mike was, was gone. Barry Croft didn't have anything to say to him. Let's talk about Mike Nall and what communications he had. Mike Nall never had wire. Testified extensively that a lot of communications happened on wire. Mike Nall never had FEMA. I think that or FREMA. And what's really significant about those two types of uh, apps is that the prosecution never produced a single piece of evidence demonstrating Mike, Mike Nall ever was on either one of them simply because Mike Nall never was on those platforms. They never produced any information that Mike Nall was on the uh, FAFO uh, chat. That was supposed to be the operator's chat. This is the dude that didn't even know. Let me back up. This is Mike Nall, who never knew 
what Adam Fox was really all about. Never knew what Barry Croft was all about. He had no knowledge. He, he, he's out in the, the dark. He doesn't know. But FAFO, that was supposed to be the operator's chat. Hard to be an operator if you're not even in, included in the uh, communications forum, isn't it? All right. Where was Mike Nall not? This is like, where's Waldo? Ready? Let's go through a few things. And instead of repeating the, the lines that I've written down, I'm going to repeat it once, and then we're going to go through each one. Mike Nall was absolutely not invited and did not attend or know about the events or what happened at the following events. The June 6th Founding Fathers meeting in Dublin, Ohio. Mike didn't know about it, didn't go to it, wasn't invited. June 18th, there was a meeting at the Capitol to meet with the Wolverine Watchmen. Mike didn't know and didn't meet with anybody. June 20th at the Vac Shack, there was a meeting with Adam Fox. That's real funny because uh, Mike didn't get invited. Mike didn't go. And Mike had no clue what, what the heck they were talking about there or what they were discussing. June 28th, there's an FTX with Wolverine Watchmen. Guess what? Mike wasn't invited. Mike didn't go. And Mike didn't know anything that they did there. And you didn't hear any testimony. You didn't hear any recordings. And you didn't have any evidence presented to you. No facts about any of those five events. June 30th, there was a meeting with Adam Fox. Guess what? Adam Fox did a lot of bolstering. All right? I do this in, in football season. I'm, I'm all about my, my fantasy team. I bolster all about them. Oh, I got Barry Sanders. You're going to be in trouble. Guess what? It's the same thing Adam Fox was doing. I got the Doll Brothers. <laughs> Did you ever meet with them, Adam? Nope. Did you ever hear any evidence that he met with them? Nope. Do you hear any testimony that he met with them? Nope. Do you ever see any audio about him meeting with them? Nope. You just have a lot of Adam Top, Adam Fox running his lips. Let's go to July 3rd, the Back Shack meeting with Adam Fox. Once again, did Mike know about it? Nope. I can tell you the significance of July 3rd is Mike's 13th, is his daughter's 13th uh, birthday. Mike McNall was absolutely not invited, did not attend, and didn't know about anything that happened with Adam Fox. On July 7th, there was a Wolverine Watchman meeting at Paul Beller's house. Number one, I think Paul, Paul Beller was one of the Jackson folks. Mike Nall's never been to Jackson. So, of course, he couldn't tell you what that meeting was about because he wasn't invited and he didn't go. So July 18th. Prosecution brings up Peebles, Ohio. Once again, he's not invited to go. He didn't voluntarily attend. He had no clue what happened there. First time he learned about it was at the prelim. July 27th, meeting between the Wolverine Watchman and Adam Fox. Do I need to tell you? He didn't go. He didn't voluntarily show up, and he didn't know about it. August 1st, there was a meeting in Bellevue. We've heard that it was also known, it was at Sean Fix's house. It's also known as the Fix Roundtable. Well, guess what? It's hard to be a part of a group if you're not even invited to the XO and whatever you want to call Adam Fox to their meeting. He didn't know about it. He couldn't tell you about it today, and he couldn't tell you what they discussed. He doesn't care. The 11th place, Munith, Ohio. There's absolutely no information that Mike was ever there. None. Didn't even know about the thing. Didn't even know what they did there. I don't even know where Munith, Ohio is, to be honest with you. And the 12th one, the daytime surveillance. There was an initial surveillance. 
And then there was one that turned around, I believe it was August uh, 29th. Mike was so important to Adam's operation. Why didn't we hear evidence that he had been invited? Or why didn't we hear evidence that he went? Or why didn't we hear evidence that, you know, he knew what the, the daytime was about? The reason we didn't is because it didn't occur. It didn't include Mike Nall. It may have occurred, but not with this guy. He was so important, he was left out. And I don't mean to offend him by saying he's left out, but he was left out. He was left out of 12 major events that you heard Agent Empla uh, testify about. Mike Nall was absolutely never invited to, attended, or knew about what happened at any of these 12 uh, events. Mike Nall, simply put, never had any knowledge or intent to provide Adam Fox or Barry Croft with any type of material support, and he wasn't included in any meetings or knew what happened at those meetings. Mike Nall simply went on a car ride, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is not enough to support the conviction of a crime. Once again, the judge is going to give you that instruction uh, that even if he knew about what was being planned, just because he was there doesn't make him guilty. All right. You heard a lot of information about Cambria, Wisconsin. And you heard a lot of information about Luther. But there's been absolutely zero evidence admitting or admitted or demonstrated that Mike Nall ever participated in any of the stations at Cambria, Wisconsin. Nothing. So, like Bill testified, Mike was injured that day. Yeah, he showed up there. You know why he went there? Like Bill said, they met a guy named Steve Robeson, and Steve Robeson had bragged about how they helped local law enforcement stop sex, sex trafficking. You remember I told you Mike's got a daughter. I've got a daughter. Those are big things when you have a daughter, believe it or not. You become a parent, you got a little boy. I grew up with five brothers. It's a little different when you got a little girl. All of a sudden, the things that you thought were all right in college and high school, you look back on and you're like, hmm. You struggle with that. And you're like, oh, that's not good. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. That was somebody's kid. That was somebody's daughter. But you know what? These two guys are big about wanting to stop sex trafficking. They're big about wanting to help the community. And Steve Robeson was that guy. He was in charge of a large militia, and he was in, in that was his big, that was his big shtick. I help local law enforcement stop sex trafficking. So yeah, Mike Nall went to Cambria, Wisconsin. Now, here comes the comparison and contrasts, or the credibility and inconsistencies. In opening statements, we heard the prosecution play a video and identify Mike Nall as performing bounce house exercises while at the Cambria FTX. <coughs> he showed the video and he said, this is Mike Nall. As a matter of fact, you heard testimony that Mike Nall had an injured foot and was unable to participate in any of the stations. Mike never engaged in any of the stations. Mike was just there as an observer and to, to be around uh, Mr. Robeson to see if he could gain a glimpse into how he was stopping sex trafficking. But he never performed any of the, uh, the activities. So that's a big inconsistency. You heard FBI uh, undercover Mark and the prosecution have a dialogue about discussions and plans being uh, discussed at Dino's Diner. However, you heard testimony that Mike didn't go to Dino's Diner. You heard testimony that uh, he's never been to Dino's Diner. 
You heard Bill Nall testify. Once him and his brother, Mike, determined the shoot house being run at Cambria, uh, Wisconsin's FTX was unsafe, they decided to leave. You heard Bill Nall testify that the Nalls did not go to uh, Dino's Diner, but instead they drove uh, back to join their families on vacation in the uh, Michigan Upper Peninsula. You heard Agent Empla tell you FTXs are not illegal. Going to an FTX is not illegal. It's not illegal to train. It's not illegal to go and participate in these uh, activities. I'm a huge football guy. If you offered me a football camp as a kid, I'm there. These are not athletes, but what they like to do, God bless them, they get to do what they want to do. We're all Americans, right? They like to train. They like to go to FDXs. They like to network. They like to be learning things. When the Nulls determined that the shoot house was unsafe, you heard them say that they wanted to leave. You also heard that uh, FBI informant Steve Robeson wanted to take a group photo prior to the Nulls leaving Cambria, Wisconsin, the FTX. And you heard FBI informant Jenny Plunk, Jenny P, I'm sorry, that she wanted to take the picture of the group. But what you never heard was that either of the Nulls went to Dino's Diner to discuss kidnapping plans or plans to harm law enforcement. You never heard that. They can't point to any testimony. They can't point to anything, any exhibit in that big book. They have no audio of it. And yeah, you heard Mr. Ralston say, oh, just because the audio doesn't exist doesn't mean it didn't happen. But you know what? You heard testimony that they didn't go to Dino's Diner. You heard it from Mike or from Bill Nall, and you heard it from the FBI that they didn't go. So guess what? They weren't there. If the plans were being discussed, my guy can't be held accountable to a conversation that he wasn't even there for. And if you remember the special jury instruction about the mere presence, even if the defendant knew the alleged crime was planned or was being committed. The mere fact that he was present when it was committed is not enough to prove that he assisted in committing it. Neither one of them were there. So any discussions there, you can't attribute them to them. All right, let's move on to the Luther FTX. Come on time. There's absolutely zero evidence admitted or demonstrating that Mike Knoll ever knew of any plan to kidnap the governor of the state of Michigan or to harm law enforcement. Once again, let's go into the credibility and inconsistencies. Let's look at the credibility uh, from the uh, Luther FTX. One, you heard UC Red testify about statements being made at the shoot house. However, we saw video with audio that wasn't consistent with what uh, UC Red said. You heard credible uh, testimony from Bill Nall that there was no reference to the shoot house being set up like the governor's vacation house. The audio, it confirmed it, never heard it. That was not a truthful statement. But you can look and you can compare to what the federal Bureau of Investigations, FBI, Undercover Red said, also known as Tim, compared to what the video actually showed and what Bill Nall's testimony was, which gave him a huge amount of credibility. Hard to fight the video. Second, you heard FBI Undercover Mark testify. Uh, he asked if the Nalls wanted to go back. However, you heard Bill testify FBI undercover Mark never asked the Nulls if they wanted to go back. Instead, when undercover Mark asked the Nulls if they uh, were all right riding with him uh, and the car ride, 
went from two cars to three. So originally it's two cars. Now all of a sudden the FBI's undercover Mark says, hey, you guys all right riding with me? We heard that audio. Guess what? Mike didn't say a word. Hard to be held responsible if you're not talking or acting. The third inconsistency. As a matter of fact, we all heard as it was getting late in the car ride, Bill made the statement he hoped the FBI, the FBI's undercover mark was not taking them to Grand Rapids. However, Mike was in the back of the avalanche. Remember, undercover Mark said he had an avalanche? That's important. Let's go and talk about that here in a minute. He's back in the avalanche playing his games on his phone, and you didn't hear any testimony Mike ever engaged in small talk with uh, the FBI's undercover Mark or Bill while they were on that car ride. Now, let me tell you. The avalanche came out in 2003. I was in my third year of law school. One of the things I always told my, told my father, who was my senior attorney, I want to drive an avalanche. Why? Because when I was a kid, I knew what an El Camino was. And let me tell you, that truck, just like they testified, the avalanche is like a modern day El Camino. It is amazing. General Motors hit it out of the park with that car. Anybody that knows the Avalanche knows that the back two passenger windows are smoked and tinted. They also know the back door, the back window that goes down, it's tinted. But you can lay that thing down and it goes from a six foot foot bed to over an eight foot bed. But the windows are tinted. So why is that important? You heard from Bill and the FBI's undercover Mark that it was raining on the night of the car ride. Right? And you heard and you saw video that it was raining and that it was super dark. I can't tell you, but up here in Traverse City area, it gets dark. Let me tell you, you can't see much up here. It gets super dark. My client, you heard from Bill Nall, was sitting in the back of the avalanche. He's playing on his phone. Anybody ever played on a phone when you got tinted windows? What do you get? You get glare. You can't see out. So that little element of providing surveillance or whatever you want to call it, guess what? It couldn't happen. It was an impossibility. He was playing on his phone and he got the glare. I believe Bill Nall and Agent Mark were asked, you ever roll down the windows? Nope. It was dark out and it was raining. So if it's dark out and it's raining and you're playing on your phone and you're in the back seat of a car that has tinted windows and you haven't said Jack on this, this car ride, how are you to have given Adam Fox or Barry Croft any kind of support? Think about that. It's raining out. You don't roll the windows down. The windows are tinted. You're playing on your phone. And just because you're standing there, you're sitting there, you can't be held accountable for the actions of others. You can't be held accountable for not doing anything you're going to get the special instruction from judge that says, just because you're there doesn't mean you did anything. All right, trying to stay on time. Second day of Luther. We all heard that they got back and 
We didn't hear much about anything else after that. <coughs> On the second day of Luther FTX, I told you that Barry Croft tried to talk with uh, Mike Nall. However, Barry didn't know who the uh, who he was uh, ranting uh, to. Bill spoke up and said, Barry, I'm over here. The next thing you, you hear is Mike and Bill lock eyes. And after the little group meeting was over, the Nalls quickly and immediately left the Luther FTX. You heard Bill testify that Adam tried to stop him. And Bill said, my kids got are hungry. We got to go. And they left. You next heard when the Nalls left the Luther FTX, neither one of the Nalls wanted to have anything else to do with Barry Croft or Adam Fox or anyone else at the Luther FTX. They were gone. All right, we're in the home stretch. We're almost done. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, let's be extremely honest. break this thing down. You heard Agent Empla state to you in his office, they've got a great saying, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. The prosecution has put together what I would consider a jib jab story. We took little pieces here, little pieces there, little pieces down here. We put little black boxes around them and we brought them together and we tried to make you feel like you were seeing a different narrative or a different story than what was actually being presented to you. When I see those on Jib Jab, I get a little upset at them. In this case, for example, remember uh, prosecution through FBI agent Empla attempted to bring one of those Facebook messages up with little black boxes around him. And he wanted to read just the little black box because that said something about civil war. But then, rare to form, you saw me get up, object, and say, read it incomplete. Give us the full context. Don't just give us the black boxes because you saw there was a lot on that page and Agent Empla sat here, turned, and read you the whole story. We went from Mike Nall wanting to start a civil war to, oh, my God, he's talking about Kenosha, Wisconsin, and what's going on in Kenosha, and how, wow, that's, that's, that's people rioting. That's people upset. It had nothing to do with Mike Nall wanting to start a civil war. It had to do with Kenosha. We all saw that. I've always said the facts were so important in this case. The facts are now getting in the way of the prosecution's uh, narrative and story. The facts are telling a true narrative and the story of Mike Nall and it's are substantially in the way of the prosecution's story. Much like Jib Jab, we make, we make famous people. I've seen Barack Obama, I've seen George W. Bush, I've seen all kinds of Jib Jab stories that come out with some weird, crazy off the wall narrative. Don't let this be a jib jab. They had a good story. Guess what? Too bad it didn't have the facts in it. When we showed you the facts, we saw that Mike Nall didn't engage in anything. We showed you he didn't have the intent to ever kidnap this, the governor of the state of Michigan or to harm law enforcement. Wow. Adam Fox could have never gotten to the point he did without the FBI's involvement. You heard me go through the 12 events Mike Nall never went to, never participated in, never even had any knowledge of what was discussed or went on there. Mike Nall never participated in the uh, Cambria, Wisconsin FTX run by Steve Robeson and for two reasons. He had an, a foot injury and didn't participate in any of the events. 
And two, Mike and Bill felt the Cambria, Wisconsin shoot house was dangerous and they decided to leave. At the Luther, Michigan FTX, yes, Mike Nall was training. Yes, Mike Nall was asked to go on a car ride without any knowledge of any of the particulars. We have no audio. We have no testimony. We have no exhibit proving or showing or demonstrating or anything that Mike Nall knew about it. Remember, that judge is going to give you, that judge, judge is going to give you that limiting instruction about uh, the mere fact that you're there doesn't make you guilty. The car ride, simply put, Mike Nall never had any knowledge or intent to provide Adam Fox or Barry Croft with any type of material support. Matter of fact, it was impossible, wasn't it? He's in the back of an avalanche with tinted windows playing on his phone in a dark, rainy night. The glare would have prevented it. Mike Nall simply went on a car ride. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is not enough to support a conviction of a crime. What's ironic is late in the game, we brought in, because the uh, prosecution brought in exhibits 288, 289, and I believe 290. In there, you see uh, Bill Nall say, Mike had no clue about anything. Go listen to those. If you didn't know anything, you can't hold him accountable for it. Special jury instruction says just because you were there doesn't mean you're, you're guilty. Simply put, ne Mike never uh, contributed to any of the conversations on the car ride with FBI undercover Mark and never provided any material support or engaged in any type of surveillance on the night of the car ride with FBI agent Mark. FBI undercover Mark uh, may have driven. However, FBI undercover Mark drove a Chevy Avalanche and we all know that the back windows are uh, tinted. I had that down, sorry, I lost my place. Finally, we heard testimony from Bill and others. Bill and Mike uh, had been drinking that night and that they uh, weren't armed on the night of the car ride. Simply put, Mike Nall went for a ride and once again, you can't be held accountable just for being present. Mike Nall never had any knowledge or intention to provide any type of support to Adam Fox or Barry Croft, and Mike Nall did not even have any knowledge of any type of plan to kidnap the governor of the state of Michigan or to kill or to harm law enforcement ever. The evidence or lack thereof, testimony and audio, does not support a conviction against Mike Nall for either providing material support or felony firearms as charged. The prosecution has not demonstrated how any of the elements of the crime, as alleged, have been fulfilled beyond a reasonable doubt with evidence or testimony against defendant Mike Nall. The facts have gotten in the way of the prosecution's story. Please go back and examine the facts, the evidence, and the testimony with detail. Read the transcripts and their context completely, not just the black box portions. Please remember, just because you're present doesn't make Mike Nall guilty of the crimes as alleged. Mike Nall lacks the knowledge and pre prerequisite intent in this matter. The facts do not fulfill the elements in this matter beyond a reasonable doubt. Mike Nall did not provide any material support at all to Adam Fox or Barry Croft. Mike Nall did not have a gun on the car ride. Finally, Mike Nall did not act intentionally, and just like judge is going to instruct you, which is so important for my client, even if the defendant, even if Mike Nall knew the alleged crime was planned or was being committed, the mere fact Mike Nall was present when it was uh, allegedly committed is not enough to prove Mike Nall assisted in committing the crime. Here we are, I'm right on time. Finally, we're gonna ask Mike Nall respectfully at, uh, request you to find him not guilty on all of the charges as the elements have not been fulfilled. Thank you for your time, thank you for your focus. Thank you. Great, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the closing arguments for the defense side. As I told you at the beginning, because the prosecution bears the burden of proof in this case, 
Uh, Mr. Ralston gets a chance to speak with you. We call it rebuttal uh, to answer any of the issues raised, perhaps, in the defense closing arguments. Uh, everybody doing okay? So far, I know it's about an hour. Okay, Mr. Ralston, let me go back to you. Thank you, Judge. <coughs> Is that on, Adam? Okay, can you turn it on for me? No problem. Well, let's warm it up. Um, let me start off with, you know, kind of the first uh, <clears throat> thought that I have, and I'm going to begin with the last, and that is, um, you know, Mr. Cyber's closing argument to there to you was not evidence, okay? And he talked about a lot of things in there that were not in evidence, okay? For instance, he talked about Munich, Ohio. Well, no, it's not Munich, Ohio. It's Munich, Michigan, and that's where the Wolverine Jackson, uh, Wolverine Watchman trained in Jackson County. He talked about how Croft was ranting at the Circle of Trust meeting, and that's what caused the Nulls to leave, Luther. That's not what happened. It was, uh, according to Bill Null, it was Fox that scared him so much because he was talking about explosives, and that's what caused him to leave. Um, Bill is not UC Bill, like Mr. Cyber just referred to him as. Um, it's Bill Null, the defendant. And he talked about during the interview with uh, the FBI after he was arrested, how he told Mike about uh, the recon and what it was about, and they went together. We'll play that for you in a little bit here. So I, the, the point I try to make is, is that when lawyers make mistakes like that, I mean, what we say is not evidence to you, okay? I mean, what we say is our viewpoint of the evidence and what we think it means and how you might interpret it, okay? So with that kind of as a starting point, and if I were sitting where you are right now, I'd be wondering, you know, how long is Mr. Ralston going to talk? And, uh, I'll try to be as efficient as possible. I understand the day is, the hour is late. We've been here all day, and you've been very good, and I thank you. Um, try to <clears throat> kind of summarize it here a little bit for you, and, and this goes both to, you know, the opening statement made by Mr. I – and mean, the closing argument made by Mr. Barnett on behalf of his client, Eric Molitor, <clears throat> um, that made by Mr. Nunzio, um, uh, and uh, on behalf of Bill Null and um, on behalf of, you know, Mr. Cyber on his client with Michael Null. And really, you know, I, and this is why I bore dear on this issue. I mean, you know, there's a proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It's nothing more, nothing less. And really what each closing argument tried to do is add elements to the charges. And I'll just give you a, a, a good example, I think, all three attorneys on behalf of their clients offered you is unless the individual is at every meeting that occurred, then you must find them not guilty. And that simply is not the law. I mean, it's the elements that have to be proven. And, and what they're doing is subtly trying to add things in that, you know, if that, if, if the individual wasn't at all the meetings that occurred during the course of the investigation, then that person cannot be guilty of the crime charge. And that's flawed logic, and it's, uh, it's flawed, you know, when you think about the law that Judge um, Hamlin is going to give to you. I kind of want to start with Mr. Molitor a little bit here and uh, talk about uh, him a little bit. You know, when you get right down to this case, there's only two defenses. OK, and the defenses are, number one, I didn't know Fox and Cross planned to attack people. In other words, commit a terroristic act. OK, if you don't know what their what, if you don't know what the terrorist plan is, then you obviously when whatever you do, you're doing, you're not doing it to provide material support for a terroristic act. OK, 
Okay, so number one is uh, they didn't know what Fox's and Croft's plan was, and we endeavored mightily to convey that information to you during the course of the trial. The second defense is, even if I did know the plan, and this is the mere presence instruction that you're going to get, uh, even if I did know the plan, um, I didn't do anything to help Fox and Croft. I mean, these are the two defenses in logic to this offense, providing material support for a terroristic act, okay? So, it, you know, by adding these requirements that, you know, and, and I mentioned it in my initial uh, opening, or uh, closing rather, and that was, hey, you know, I mean, no, microphones don't pick up everything. And sometimes you're going to hear things that, uh, you know, don't get picked up on the recording, you know, and that's just the nature of the beast. But to require that if it's, uh, if it's, if you don't have it in recorded fashion, then uh, uh, you can't believe that it happened is wrong, and it, it ignores the instruction that I talked about in my initial closing. The evidence comes from the witness stand, any exhibits, and anything else that Judge Hamlin tells you to consider as evidence, okay? So to say that if it's not recorded, then it didn't happen would be suggesting to you, you ignore the spoken word, which is, ex which is evidence, okay? Sworn testimony is evidence. Um, the... You know, I would characterize Mr. Molitor's position through his attorney, Mr. Barnett, as um, I'm a victim. I've been victimized, you know, that this is all taken out of context. And you heard that from Mr. Cyber very heavily. I don't really think you heard that from Mr. Nunzio very much. And, you know, remember, in this whole process that we're engaged in, is designed to protect their constitutional rights. I mean, that's why you are here, is because this process is all designed to make sure that their rights are protected. Okay, I mean, that's part of, you know, as Judge Hamlin told you during the course of the trial, you know, it's a deliberate process. And as I mentioned in Bourdier, it's one question at a time, one answer at a time. So, I mean, that's the process of a trial, and it's all designed to protect the constitutional rights of the Null brothers and Eric Molitor. And, no, I disagree with Mr. Barnett that, you know, Eric Molitor isn't some poor victim in this case. I mean, you know, he talked a lot about, hey, things are taken out of context. Okay. He has, all the attorneys have on behalf of the defendants, the same information that we have. It is all turned over to them. Well, I think we dealt with this in openings. Um, the court doesn't consider that to be burden shifting. Uh, the jury has been instructed uh, multiple times, and they'll be instructed again as uh, at least one of the defense has indicated. They don't have the burden to produce anything, uh, and they don't have the burden to put on a case for you. Uh, I think it was told. I think the phrasing used, and forgive me, this is wrong, is that they didn't. Have, they don't have the obligation to prove the innocence of their client. I think was the phrase used. And that is absolutely correct. Uh, you'll be instructed again uh, in that fashion. So I'll overrule to that extent. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. And you know, you heard Judge Hamlin talk about uh, during the course of the trial, MRE, Michigan Rule of Evidence 106. Hey, if they think that we've taken something out of context, you can go ahead and put in an extended clip, or you can put in more content. You know, I mean. Thousands and thousands of pages. I mean, really, kind of what that is suggesting is if we don't give you, you know, all the thousands of pages of documents to go through, which is just a ridiculous proposition, obviously, when you'd be here for months, that in some way there's something that, you know, we're taking things out of context or we're hiding things from you. And that is not the case. I mean, Michigan Rule of 106 is, you know, lets them put something in if they think we've done something out of context, okay? And Mr. Barnett has done that on a couple of occasions. And you know what? Listen to the audio that he put in and the transcripts, and then listen to the audio that we put in. And, you know, I mean, to, tell, to be quite frank, I mean, when you look at the two, some of the content that Mr. Barnett puts in is more damning to his client than what we actually put in. And when you listen to the audio that uh, Mr. Bill Null put in, you know, we put in those are the three exhibits from the interview after Mr. Uh, Bill Null was arrested and, and, and he talked to the FBI. When you listen to their clips that are a little bit longer, again, I mean, they're a little bit more damning. I mean, feel free to put them next to each other and ask yourself, you know, were we hiding anything from you? And I think you're going to come to the conclusion that we were not, okay? So the point is, they have what we have, and no, nobody hid anything from you. 
If they want to put something in and they think we're, we're being, you know, disingenuous, you know, you know, look at what they did and what they put in, and you'll see very plainly that, no, that no one was hiding the ball, okay? So, um, you know, again, you know, Mr. Molitor's not a victim here. I mean, he put himself where he's sitting, okay? He made the choices. You know, he was 38 years old, and, uh, you know, so, no, he, he's not a victim. Okay, um, you know, primarily his defense kind of rests on, you know, some different theories here. So let's, you know, just go through a couple of them. You know, it's kind of like the blame game. You know, Mr. Molitor is, you know, it's, a, it's always somebody else's fault, and I've got an excuse for everything. I mean, that was Eric Molitor in a nutshell. You know, Adam Fox, well, Fox has nothing to do with me. You know, I was just, you know, along for the ride, kind of like the Bill Null story. Um, you know, Dan made it all happen, and we just rode along. Uh, you know, UC Mark got it all wrong, and we were, you know, just along for the, we just rode along. That's, that also applies to the, Mr. Bill Null and, and uh, Michael Null. Um, you know, Agent Impla didn't give context. We just talked about that. Uh, you know, this is uh, Eric Molitor. You know, Governor Whitmer, you know, she did this to herself. Um, and, you know, this is a big part of uh, Mr. Molitor's defense is, you know, it's just not fair what's happening to me. You know, well, no, Mr. Molitor, you're being held to the standards of the state of Michigan's law, and you've been given a lot of due process here, so you're not a victim. You know, um, uh, he, you know, he told you that he doesn't read his messages, and we find, you know, we put it in Exhibit 267. You can take a look at that. That's the one uh, that um, he talks about. Uh, you know, he didn't uh, read all his messages. I'll show you that in a second here. Uh, you know, Mr. Molitor's defenses are I didn't help a terrorist. Well, um, Adam Fox recruited me. Uh, you know, it wasn't my fault. Uh, he, Adam Fox gave uh, plans to me. Uh, you know, CHS Dan made it all happen. Uh, and the reality is, is that Eric Molitor helped Adam Fox when he conducted the daytime surveillance. And he was there at Lutheran, and we've already covered that in detail, so I won't bore you with any more of that. <laughs> Um, and then it kind of moves to, well, if I did do anything, my contributions weren't that bad. Or, Mr. Mahler, my contributions weren't hard to do. Or, my contributions uh, could have been accomplished by Fox without me. I mean, the reality is, and all we have to prove is that, you know, he knew Fox's plan and that he helped him. And Eric Mahler's contributions helped uh, Adam Fox, you know, when he took the video, when he was providing his medical services, when he suggested, hey, you know, we ought to scope out the Elk Rapids Police Department. Um, you know, it's a little bit like a house of cards, if you will. I mean, you know, Mr. Molitor starts off with, oh, you know, I was going to go to law enforcement. Well, that's, you know, you had months to go to law enforcement. You didn't do it. But uh, if he didn't go to law enforcement, he still didn't really mean to help Adam Fox. But if he did help Adam Fox, he didn't know that he was actually helping him. And the short version is, and I'll, I'll use the word, fine, he lied. I mean, he lied about his intentions. You know, not everybody that sat on that witness stand in the, in the history of man has told the truth. And Eric Molitor is one of them. Okay, he did not tell you the truth. And when you think about it, who's got more to lose in this case than him? You know, you know between the, I mean, within the defendant's realm, you know, they have a lot to lose. They have a very high motive to not tell the truth if they testify. So, um, you know, part of Mr. Molitor was, you know, I never read my chats. You know, and he, he said that. And then when we, when we confronted him, he's, you know, I was not on the chats. Well, you know, you see from Exhibit 267, you know, no. You know, he says to Adam Fox, you know, I don't, you know, I keep in you know, I read everything. I just don't say very much. Okay. Um, let's look at a few things that, you know, he did say. Um, you know, I'm not friends with Adam. Well, you know, you saw it. We went to great lengths to show you their you know, relationship and kind of where it began and how it went through and, you know, the different communications they had. He planned to call law enforcement. Uh, no, I, I, I think that's a disingenuous uh, statement. Didn't know about the violence. No, uh, you know, there's lots of uh, messages in there about, you know, they're getting ready for the boogaloo. Um, he's, he that he came here to Bel Air because he's fighting against Antifa. No, I, I don't think that uh, makes sense. Uh, sacred, uh, rather, he's scared for his life when he's in the car with Adam Fox, even though he's sitting in the back seat. He's got a gun on him, and you know, and Adam Fox is unarmed at that point in time. 
uh, didn't take Fox seriously. It's kind of like the Bill Null uh, defense. Uh, didn't know about the plot. No, he knew about the plot. We laid that out in our initial closing. Uh, so, you know, none of that kind of makes sense. Uh, in fact, I'd ask you to reject it and, you know, adopt the evidence that was given to you that shows his intent, how much about the plan and what he did. Okay. Let's talk about, um, uh, uh, you know, one, one of the things I want to talk about with, with Mr. Molitor was, you know, the, the searches. You know, Mr. Barnett, on behalf of his client, offers to you, oh, yeah, well, he's, he's doing these searches so that he can kind of fit in with the crew. You know, he's in the back seat of the car and he's doing these searches, right? So if you're in the back seat of a vehicle, um, the people in the front seat don't really know, obviously, what you're doing on your phone. I mean, you could say to them, oh, I'm searching, but I'm not finding anything. I mean, he actually did search. I mean, that's the point of those searches that we showed you. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, this is the Null Brothers defense. I mean, they're kind of like we were luggage, you know, we were just long for the ride and we didn't know about, you know, where we were going on this hour and a half trip in the middle of the night and, you know, in the middle of September. Um, they're the people that had the most, you know, of all the subjects in the investigation, they had the most contact with Fox and Croft of any of the subjects. I mean, and, and there's a list of them. I mean, April 30th, May 18th, May 31st, and these are all the exhibits. I mean, this is the evidence that was put, you know, forward to you. June 30th, June 11th, June 9th, September 12th and 13th. So, um, uh, you know, okay, so getting to, uh, uh, this is, um, uh, this explains the plan, you know, the conduct of the nighttime surveillance uh, this is, you know, Fox going around, you come with me, you come with me. And that's exhibit 181. And, you know, and this is where, you know, I mean, Bill Null, before he leaves Luther, knows what's going on. I mean, you know, he's, you know, uh, we already put eyes on our cottage up there. We're going to take another look tonight, get eyes on it at nighttime. I mean, he's pretty plain right there. Okay. And it's not, you know, it's not hard to figure out what he's talking about. And, you know, Bill Null sat here and told you, at least on direct examination with Mr. Nunzio, um, yeah, no, I didn't know where we were going. I don't well, know. No, you did. And, uh, and we'll get to his FBI interview in a second here. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, Exhibit 181 makes it clear, you know, what's going on. And then, you know, uh, later on, uh, Exhibit 193, this Bill Null again, this is before they've left camp. Uh, yeah, I'm down to do a little recon and shit. I mean, you know, and, and I don't, you know, so one of you asked a very poignant question. It's like, you know, if if you didn't know what you were doing, then why would you call it recon? And whoever asked that question was right on top of it. Uh, you know, as far as Mike Null goes, you know, this is while they're in the vehicle with uh, UC Mark. You know, uh, Mike Null divulges that they knew that he knew that they were going to go for a ride. I mean, he he's calling it a ride there. But again, we don't do things by mistake. He didn't. He's not a piece of luggage who just got put into the truck. I mean, you know, again, the information, you know, it's consistent from the, you know, from the Dublin on is Bill gets information, Mike shows up. Bill gets information, Mike shows up at Cambria. Bill gets information, Mike shows up at Luther. So, I mean, it's very consistent in terms of how they operate together. They're very close. Uh, he's not there by mistake. In terms of the Wisconsin FTX, I mean, you know, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, there's Mike and there's Bill, and you can tell me he's got a broken toe until the end of time. But at the end of the day, you know, this is he's at a place. Now he's at a very important meeting, and then they want to be dismissive of it. And, you know, no, Cambria was an important time. You know, that's where Barry Croft and Adam Fox are there. You know, they're sharpening up their plan of what they're going to do in Michigan, you know. And... You know, there's Mike Knoll and Bill Knoll. Uh, they're not there by mistake. They didn't wind up in the middle of Wisconsin in, in July by accident. Um, you know, part of the defense is, you know, well, we just sat there. Well, no, you didn't. I mean, you're there for a reason. You're part of the personnel. And, you know, this is one of the things that Mr. Nunzio did in his opening statement. And, again, it was very clever. And, and you know, he, he is also a learned and possibly learned by a couple more years than me, but um, uh,
contributions weren't that bad. Uh, they weren't hard to do. Uh, we didn't know Fox and Croft's plan, and then the reality is um, the evidence, you know, dispels that. They, they did, and your contributions helped Fox. I mean, by having them on the team, whether they were on the team at every meeting is a no moment. I mean, when they're in Luther, and, and this is, uh, you know, important, and while they're in Luther, they're, in, they're empowering, they're emboldening um, uh, Adam Fox and Jerry Spock. And, you know, they don't, you don't have to find that they had a gun in Andrew County, okay, to find them guilty of felony firearm. Uh, you know, here's the instruction that Judge Hamlin's going to give you. Um, this is a special venue instruction. When things happen in more than one county, you can charge it anywhere, okay? And then what Judge Hamlin is going to tell you is that the alleged crime in this case is made up of several acts. Felony firearm is where I'm focusing now, Okay. And uh, the prosecutor only has to prove that one of these acts took place in Antrim County. He does not have to prove that all of them took place here. Yeah, they committed uh, material support here in Antrim County, and they trained with guns down in Luther. And when they were training down there in Luther, they were also providing material support to Adam Fox and Barry Croft. So that's how you get to the felony firearm conviction. You know, that's how you return a guilty verdict there. They don't have, you don't have to find that they had a gun here in Antrim County. What they did down there was part of the crime, too. Okay, so when you have a crime that has multiple acts, you know, any act that occurs here gives you venue. If they also had guns down in, uh, in Lake County, that's fine. You can use that to convict them of a felony firearm. Okay, um, you know, this is part of the, the Knowles House of Cards. They didn't know the attack plan. But if they did know the plan, they didn't intend to help with surveillance. But if they did help with surveillance, they didn't drive by the governor's house. There's no requirement that they drive by the governor's house. I mean, at the end, Knowles knew what Fox and Croft's intentions were and they helped out. Uh, you know, the misappropriation of words is consistent through this case. You know, the patriots fight against the tyrants. And, you know, Valhall Valhalla waits its warriors targeting of the red coats, you know, watering the tree of liberty. That was part of the propaganda that um, Bill Null had on his phone. You know, hunting politicians, uh, you know, the civil war is upon us. These are all statements made by the Null brothers. And, uh, you know, it's, it's okay if you're in a militia. Well, it depends. Depends why you, what you're doing. And it's like, is it okay to go to an FTX? Absolutely. You know, but if you're going to an FTX to train for a terrorist attack or a terrorist attack, you know, if you're there to help the terrorists, then no, you're committing a criminal event. I mean, it's like a gun, you know. I mean, guns aren't bad. I mean, I, I you know, one, one opinion. You know, I mean, what's bad is how people use them. I mean, whether, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, the gun didn't kill the person. I mean, somebody picked up the gun and used it. So, you know, um, uh, you know, and then, you know, if, uh, if I, don't, I don't believe in anything, I'm here for the violence. That was Bill Nall, you know, fuck correction, the boogaloo patches. No, these guys were ready to go. Um, you know, talk about defensive training uh, uh, involves attacking. You know, and they, you know, you heard Dan talk about L-shaped ambushes, vehicle takeovers. You know, this is all stuff that you know. You know, okay, you know, I guess in and of itself, it's not illegal, but it does give you insight as to the intent of the people that are practicing these things and what they may use them for. I mean, that's why it was offered to you. And you know, I want to get back to something else too. You know, Mr. Um, Barnett, you know, went to great lengths to talk about how unfair this process was to his client, okay, poor Mr. Mahler, you know, and it really kind of ignores the fact that Judge Hamlin uh, sits at the process and makes sure that it's fair, okay, Call, you know, he calls the balls and strikes, if you will, and, you know, his commentary that in some way this process was unfair, you know, kind of leaves out, you know, the, you know, we're the executive branch, you know, and that's, 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 you know, where the prosecution comes from. The judiciary is separate from us. I mean, that's why this process is fair is because the two branches of government aren't connected. And, you know, uh, we run by the rules of evidence. We run by court rules, uh, you know, and, and to suggest that in some way Mr. Molitor was victimized during the last four plus weeks is it's wrong is what it is. So, um, you know, Bill Null and Mike Null, you know, the police or the actual terrorists would be a summary of their mentality. You know, the thin blue liners can't be trusted. I don't trust felon. I trust felons over cops to have my back. 
the cops are the real enemies of freedom, uh, a duty to make the U.S. safer for their children. That was a big part of their motive. You know, they were talking about, you know, I'm willing to die, you know, just to make it right for my kids. Um, well, the Null brothers weren't in the chats. That was, you know, part of what you heard today. Well, no, except for they were in the New Founding Fathers encrypted chat. They were in the MLM roundtable chat. Uh, uh, they were in the Mission Leaders 2.0 encrypted chat, and they were in the Leaders Coalition encrypted chat. So, you know, when Mr. Cyber gets up here and says that Mr. Uh, uh, Michael Null wasn't in any encrypted platform, no, that was wrong. You know, we don't give you evidence. You know, the evidence comes from the witness stand, and the, and the testimony was from Agent Impala. These were the chats they were involved in. You know, legal and constitutional, this is kind of uh, one of the things that, you know, uh, has been played with a little bit. It's kind of like, a, you know, a gun isn't illegal and it's okay to go to an FTX. Well, again, it depends. You know, they had guns, body armor, ammunition, gas masks, flex cuffs, helmet, radios, and they used OPSEC. Yeah, those are all in and of themselves legal. But um, if they're used and, if, you know, if they're being, you know, if you've got them because you want to do a terrorist attack, then no, I mean, they're, you know, then they become tools of a, you know, the criminal act. Uh, you know, the Nulls claim is, you know, uh, we didn't really know Adam or Barry. Uh, we were just doing some networking, just acting as a well-regulated militia. We heard some tough talk from others. We didn't take it seriously uh, while protecting the citizens of Michigan from tyrants. Uh, we didn't take Fox seriously. You know, we accidentally supported a terrorist you know uh, the standard is proof beyond a reasonable doubt and there's two elements to each crime the evidence that's been given to you is sufficient to meet that burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt is both elements uh, we're going to respectfully uh, um, you know, ask you to follow your oath and your oath is to return a true and just verdict based on the evidence Nothing more, nothing less. Uh, and we ask that verdict to be guilty on both counts as to all three uh, defendants. And uh, last but not least, we're deeply thankful for your time. Thank you, Judge. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my clock shows 4.58 p.m. Uh, we've generally been ending around 5 o'clock. Uh, the next step in the process, uh, there are two things that need to happen. Uh, instructions about the law. You've heard a lot of talk about the final set of instructions. Uh, those need to be read to you. Uh, and then uh, six of you need to be excused so that we can get down to a jury of 12. Uh, I will tell you, um, my normal process would be to read the instructions to everybody and then to excuse uh, the jurors. Excuse me, excuse the alternate jurors to get down to the jury of 12. Uh, it is five o'clock and it has been a long day. Uh, I'm not going to sit here for another 15 or 20 minutes and instruct you on the law you are to follow in this case when it follows a long day of closing arguments that you've listened to. Uh, I want you to be able to focus on that. I want you to be able to absorb what you've heard, but I also don't want to bring six people back tomorrow morning that don't need to be here because they're going to be the audience. So this is what we're going to do. Um, I'm not going to read the instructions to all of you. I'm going to excuse the alternates at this time, okay, and we'll go through the process in just a minute of how that's going to happen. Um, and then what will happen is if, unfortunately, we do have to bring in one of the alternates, I'll simply read the instructions to the entire group again because you would have to begin deliberations anew. Okay? Uh, so you've heard me say that we're going to get down to a jury of 12. Some of the attorneys have mentioned that. Uh, we are, in fact, going to do that at this time. There will be six alternates. So what will happen is the clerk is going to use the uh, big old roller. Go ball roller, uh, just as she did when she pulled uh, your cards to actually have you come up and sit in the jury box. Uh, she's going to do that one at a time. Now, I think I already told you, uh, do we have the folders over there? Yeah, okay. Um, so there are six folders. Uh, we're obviously going to go in order alternate number one, two, three, all the way through six. Uh, so the first person called will be alternate number one. Uh, you can put your notes uh, and everything in the folder. Uh, they won't be seen by anybody. Uh, and then there is a sticky note on there for you to write down your juror seat number, your full name, and your phone number. Uh, the reason the phone number is important is because I think I told you yesterday, even though the six of you are excused this afternoon, uh, you are still on duty, so to speak. So all of the restrictions uh, apply to you, uh, and for uh, everybody else, all of the protections that have been provided, meaning that your identity can't be revealed, there's no photos or anything along those lines, that all still applies to you as well, and so all of those protections are in place. 
Uh, and so that's why the phone number is important, is because uh, once the jury of 12 uh, has reached a unanimous verdict, um, and uh, six decisions basically make up that verdict, uh, you refer to, refer to it as singular and both plural. Uh, it's two decisions uh, per defendant, actually, that will be made by the jury. Uh, once those decisions have been made uh, and have been announced in court, uh, court staff or the clerk's office will contact the six individuals for two reasons. Number one, to let uh, them know what the decisions were. Uh, and secondly, to release you from uh, jury service, meaning that all of the restrictions are then gone and you can speak to whomever you wish and all of the people who have wanted to ask you questions for the last month uh, can now do that and you can't hide behind the fact that the judge told you you can't answer those questions. So my apologies for that part, okay? Uh, any questions for anybody on uh, what we're gonna do yet this afternoon? Nope, okay. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, and if you, we'll do two, because I only had two pens to give <laughs> to the staff. Uh, so if you could uh, call the first alternate juror, please. And uh, you can also leave uh, your juror on your uh, staff on the way out. And we're just going to identify uh, the jurors that are called by their seat numbers, not by their name. Seat six. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you could uh, leave the uh, lanyard with staff, all of the notes will go in the folder uh, and then fill out the information on the card. You would be then free to leave back. And given the process, I will ask everyone in the courtroom to remain uh, until all of the alternates have come. Seat 11. That's alternate juror number two. Okay, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, you make up the final 12 that will be the jury in this case. Uh, as I uh, told you, what we'll give them is just a couple of minutes to get that information written down. Uh, and then you'll be excused for the evening. Obviously, all the restrictions that have been in place up until now are still in place. Uh, if you could be back here ready to go at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, uh, what will happen is I'll provide you the uh, final instructions, and then you will be released to begin deliberations. Uh, so very importantly, just because you're down to the 12th doesn't mean you can discuss the case yet, okay, because that would be deliberations. So those protections are still in place. Do not discuss the case until you are released tomorrow morning for that. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, then they should be uh, almost all set, so what we'll do is excuse you at this time. Again, everybody will remain in the courtroom. All rise for the The door is closed and the jury is outside the courtroom. Um, normally, I discuss any procedural changes from what we had talked about previously with the council, but um, given that it's five o'clock and it's been a long day, the court just sort of made an executive decision there. So, uh, before we break for the day, Mr. Ralston, anything for you? Nothing to add. Mr. Nunzi? No. Mr. Sacco? No, thank you. Mr. Barnett? No, oh, you're right. Okay. Uh, we'll get started back at 9 o'clock in the morning tomorrow, so if everyone can be back ready to go down, I appreciate it. Uh, the jurors are still leaving, so I would ask folks to remain in the courtroom uh, for approximately at least five more minutes until they're all gone. Uh, Sergeant Knight will let me know once they've all left, uh, and you can leave. Uh, and once
once they are all gone and have been dispersed from the property, the courts restrict.